Lakeside Lighthouse, Romantic Women's Fiction, Cliffside Point, Book Six, written by Ellen Joy, narrated by Jennifer March. Chapter One Sonia dabbed her eyes with a tissue as Evelyn and Charlie said their vows. Sonia loved a wedding, and her new friend's intimate ceremony in her beautiful seaside home had turned out perfect. She didn't mean to get so emotional, but when she heard Evelyn's story about her first husband dying of a heart attack and finding a second chance with Charlie Moran, she couldn't help but think of her own marriage. Sonia had found very little happiness in hers. She stood beside her son Andrew, who hadn't kept his eyes off his girlfriend Harper, who stood at the altar as a bridesmaid in a gorgeous burgundy dress. Sonia had to admit, the young woman looked stunning. The feisty rider had turned out to be perfect for Andrew. Sonia had been wary of their relationship, but the young woman had grown on her. Her daughter had been another story. Lila stood hand in hand with her new boyfriend, Drake, and his son DJ, who hooted and hollered as Charlie and Evelyn kissed. Sonia would never have believed the two would become a couple. They couldn't be more opposite. Drake was a country boy from Oklahoma, and Lila lived a life of luxury on Martha's Vineyard. But Sonia had to admit, something wonderful had formed between them, and they were truly in love. She wondered if her husband Jeff had ever hooted in his life. Jeff, whose idea of excitement was crushing his opponent, tried to never show any emotion, unless it was anger. His success depended on his even temper, even though it was always simmering. Her father Randy, or Pops, beamed as he announced as the officiant, Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to announce for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Moran. The whole room erupted in cheers and applause. Biddy even whistled. The newlyweds beamed as they made their way through the room, thanking and hugging everyone in attendance. Evelyn looked amazing in her cream satin dress. As the couple made their way toward the group, Sonia looked around the room. Most of the faces she vaguely recognized from the island. She peeked over at Tommy, who stood beside Biddy. She had been able to avoid him, besides polite pleasantries. Evelyn's house, Seaview, had been decorated throughout. Christmas lights hung around windows, along railings, and above mantles. Even outside, the porches, the deck, and the path to the ocean were all lit up. Christmas ornaments hung on the tree. Sprigs of evergreen and poinsettias were placed in decorative pots. And even a tiny Christmas replica of the harbor town sat on the shelves. It was beautiful and warm and inviting. I'm so glad you could all make it. Evelyn said as she reached Sonia and her family. Evelyn hugged Sonia before she had a chance to offer her hand. She stiffened, even as she felt Evelyn's joy coming through her. You look beautiful, Sonia said to Evelyn. Evelyn moved to Andrew, and Sonia watched jealously as the two embraced easily and comfortably. When was the last time Sonia and her son had hugged that warmly? When was the last time she had been embraced, period? She played with her ring, twisting the large diamond so it sat correctly on her finger, wondering if Jeff's absence looked like what it was. The twins didn't seem to miss their father. Lila didn't even ask if he was coming. Though it wasn't unusual for Sonia to attend a wedding or funeral or social event without her husband. In fact, that would be more normal than not. Jeff always worked. But tonight, on New Year's Eve, who would really believe that excuse? So she made none. But like Evelyn and the twins, no one asked. Luckily, she didn't see anyone at the wedding who would care enough about her or her marriage. In the dining room, a celloist and violinist played music as waitstaff moved around the room with trays of hors d'oeuvres. Mmm. Drake mumbled loudly next to her after trying a bacon-wrapped scallop. Her scallops are delicious. Have you never had a scallop before? 
she asked, surprised. He shook his head, and in his thick Oklahoma drawl said, Not too many scallops in my neck of the woods. Sonia tried not to watch her daughter interact with this gentleman in cowboy boots. Biddy's son was very attractive, in that rugged, rough, and tough manner of an actual cowboy. But how much in common could her daughter have with him? What would the lady say about Lila dating the manager of a bakery? Lila didn't seem to care about what people might be saying. Her beautiful daughter's focus was entirely on Drake and DJ. She looked so happy. Even in her best times with Jeff, Sonia had never felt that kind of happy. The elated, lost-in-their-own-world love bubble. She spent her first years doing whatever it took to make Jeff love her. When he had asked her to marry him, she thought her worries of him leaving or changing his mind would vanish. But the anxiety only increased the more he worked, the more he had to travel, the more he stayed away. Outside, the last remains of sunlight disappeared behind the ocean's horizon. It's a beautiful house, isn't it? Pops asked. She nodded but stayed quiet. What did she have to say? Jeff didn't want to join you tonight, Pop said, knowing full well Jeff wouldn't come to something like this. She thought about telling the truth. She hadn't talked to Jeff in weeks, not since their argument about Christmas. Beef Wellington bite? A young server asked, holding out a silver platter. Pops grabbed two. Thank you. The server moved on to the next person. She decided against telling Randy anything about Jeff and her problems. I'm going to grab more of those, Pop said, scooting off with his new cane toward the server. That's when a couple pointed at Sonia and started making their way toward her. The man and woman waded through the crowd, and she realized she recognized them from the Christmas party. Wanda and... Shoot, she couldn't remember his name. Was it Michael or Mark? Hello, Sonia, Wanda said, hugging her suddenly. Sonia patted the small woman's back. Hello? Marty, the man said, offering his hand to her as if he'd read her thoughts. Yes, of course, I remember, Sonia said, stepping back and smiling. Sonia played with her ring. Wanda looked frail, her hair light and spotty. She had learned Wanda had been going through a battle with cancer, but didn't know much more. She spun her ring as Wanda spoke. An uncomfortable undercurrent ran through Sonia as she tried not to look at Wanda's head. She didn't know the status of her treatment, but the effects were glaring. We'd love to have you and your husband over for dinner, Wanda said to her. Oh, that's so nice, Sonia said, but Jeff wouldn't want to go. Jeff would need something in it for him to attend the stranger's dinner party. He needed a connection, a tip, a new client, to network, something to make it worth his time. There wasn't much that had been worth his time as far as Sonia was concerned. Jeff never wanted to spend time with her side of the family or her friends, and now his latest stunt proved he didn't even want to spend time with his own family. Let me know a time that works, Wanda said and we can have you over. I will, Sonia's eyes drifted up to Wanda's hair. I look forward to it. Great, Wanda said with a half smile. Her hand touched the back of her neck where her hairline began. Oh God, Wanda had noticed Sonia's looking. Wanda gave another weak smile before taking Marty's arm and walking away. Sonia immediately looked for Pops, who was popping another beef wellington into his mouth. She moved to the peripheral of the party, watching, waiting, as the time ticked by and the year slowly ended. Three, two, one, Happy New Year! The crowd all called out. Everyone turned to one another, kissing and hugging, except for Sonia, who hid in the shadows, wishing for something to change. She had to be the one who changed, because Jeff wouldn't. All his promises had been broken.
She saw Tommy take Biddy into his arms. As she threw her head back laughing, completely thrilled, he pulled Biddy into a kiss, and Sonia's chest tightened at the embrace. After the kiss, Tommy began to whisper something in Biddy's ear. Whatever he had said made Biddy laugh again. A sinking sensation washed over Sonia. That could have been her in his arms. Chapter Two Sonia walked inside the house and listened for Jeff. The house buzzed in silence. She looked down at her phone. No calls from her friends wishing her a happy new year. No messages from Jeff asking her to start the new year with him. No check-ins from her kids to see if she made it home all right. Pops didn't even say goodnight when he left with Biddy and her family. She was completely alone. She walked out of the kitchen and started to shut down the house. She moved into the grand living room that had a wall of windows looking out at the Atlantic Ocean. The room had been designed to wow people, but it felt cold to Sonia. Not like the room where Evelyn and Charlie had had their intimate ceremony. She had never wanted to build such a big house, especially in the part of the island where they'd bought and built. Growing up, She'd come to Cliffside Point on Martha's Vineyard every summer since she was a little girl. Her mother and father had bought the summer home before her father became a judge. The island had mostly Victorian fishermen houses with the gray clapboard and white shutters. Nothing too flashy. Understated, yet classy. Instead, Jeff built the biggest, gaudiest, nouveau riche house on the island. Her feet padded against the floors as she walked down the long hallway toward the master. All the lights were off. The bed was made and untouched. Jeff hadn't come home like he had promised. She dropped onto her bed and looked out at the black sky blending into the endless sea. Her heart raced in her chest, as if waiting for her to decide what to do next. Did his silence fill her with pain or relief? Her thumb rubbed the inside of her palm as she thought about what she should do next. The next step would confirm her suspicions, but she knew it would be opening Pandora's box. Once she found something, she couldn't go back to ignorance. She'd know the truth. She thought of Lila. Her daughter hated her. She just wanted her daughter to be happy, and Joel had made her happy. She hadn't known about Joel's indiscretions. She hadn't heard the gossip. Sonia's friends and their daughters had kept their secrets very well hidden. What would her mother have done when Jeff's affair had come out? Would Linda have encouraged Sonia to leave Jeff? Or would her mother have encouraged her to work it out for the twins' sake? Randy had been too grief-stricken after their mother's death to give her any sound advice. Instead, he had barked orders to leave Jeff, got mad at Sonia when she tried to work things out, then pretended that nothing had happened, even though her whole world had been falling apart. She didn't blame her father. Her mother's death had been devastating for everyone. Besides, Judge Randall Martin hated the man who married his daughter, the shark lawyer who only came when there was blood in the water. Pops hadn't supported the marriage one way or the other. Sonia stood up, looking at the empty bed. She could fall asleep, push everything onto a new day, start the year exactly how she had lived for ten years. Pushing and pushing everything away. Pushing and pushing every feeling down. Pushing her friends away. Pushing her father away. Pushing away anything that made her feel. But she was so sick of pushing. She grabbed her phone and walked out of her room, down the hall and to the stairs with a new determination. She opened the doors to Jeff's office and went straight to his computer. Thirty years of marriage made her know Jeff wouldn't change. He hadn't even changed his passwords. It had been a while since she'd checked their bank and credit card accounts. Maybe a year, maybe longer. She used to check it regularly, each day throughout the day when he first had indiscretions. Before Jeff's affair... She'd never looked at their finances, leaving everything in Jeff's hands. 
when the first story came out publicly about the affair, she had believed Jeff. Why wouldn't she? He had been a loyal husband who gave her a lifestyle she had dreamt about. The accusations had seemed impossible. But when the woman had stood with her lawyer, reading a statement about the gifts, the hotels, the secret hideaways Jeff had paid for, something made Sonia check. That's when she'd seen all the charges. For years, Jeff had been sneaking around, though she couldn't call it sneaking when he did it right under her nose. She typed in the first phone number Jeff had had as a child growing up in Philadelphia. The ten-digit number hadn't been used since he was seven, except as his password to everything, including all their financial statements. Except, this time, the password didn't work. Sonia tried again. Wrong username and or password. Sonia's mouth went dry. She tried again and again until the program locked her out. Her heart thumped in her chest. Why would Jeff change his password? Sonia pulled open the drawers and took out folders of paperwork, searching for anything that would give her answers. Was he having another affair? Had she missed the signs again? She pulled out the files with their bank and credit card information, picked up the phone, and dialed the customer service line. She'd get into those accounts whether Jeff changed the password or not. When a representative answered, Sonia gave the woman all the information. Can you answer a couple of security questions? The representative asked. Yes, I can, Sonia said, and answered all five questions correctly. All right, Mrs. Whitmore, you should receive an email and then you can reset it the woman said. Is there anything else I can help you with today? No, thank you. I should be all set now. Sonia's hands shook as she got into Jeff's email. She looked at the time. He would be waking soon and checking his email wherever he was. She opened the email, copied and pasted the temporary password, and then reset it to Jeff's previous one. The account opened on the screen. Sonia scanned the page reading each line with a new eye. She recognized the regular charges, restaurants, clothing stores, and other everyday purchases. But as she looked closer, she recognized charges to fancy restaurants and jewelry stores. Hotel charges on nights he swore he had to work. Was he with a new woman? Was it Vicky, his office assistant? Or Gloria, the newest lobbyist working for the firm who looked like Ava Mendez? Jeff never saw how his actions affected those around him. He hadn't seen how Sonia fell apart after his affair. He hadn't noticed how the twins lost their free spirit. He didn't care that he ripped the family apart. And he'd seen absolutely nothing wrong with inviting his daughter's ex fiance to their Christmas holiday vacation without consulting anyone. He thought she was being melodramatic. Or did he just not care? Why did she stay? She spent 30 years waiting for him to care. She looked at the charges, so blatant and open. He obviously didn't care. She opened a new tab on the computer and searched for the Airbnb website. Once there, she entered isolated and remote as key words for her search. A log cabin overlooking a lake in the White Mountains popped up at the top. It did look completely isolated and remote. With a click of the mouse, she made the reservation starting right away. Then she picked up her phone and texted Jeff. I want a divorce. Chapter 3 The fairy's earliest departure was later than she wanted, but she wanted a car if she was going to stay in New Hampshire. She rarely took the ferry. Jeff usually had a car service pick her up and she'd use the commuter flights back and forth to the city. As a little girl, she had loved taking the ferry. Randy would drive the station wagon onto the boat, and they'd all eat a lunch her mother would pack for the boat ride to the island. They'd spend the whole summer there, while her father would take the ferry back and forth to the city to work. The island had always been her happy place. It was her refuge as an awkward teenager, and a place to retreat when her mother had died. 
and then again when Jeff's affairs had been broadcasted on local news channels and papers. She put her phone in her purse as she took a seat at the back of the boat. She wanted the roar of the engine to drown out her thoughts. She looked around to see if anyone noticed her. When the ferry left the tiny harbor village, she looked out at the sun reflecting off the water, pinks and oranges and yellows dancing on the water's surface. The sunrise could have been one of the most beautiful scenes. She'd forever remember that moment, because she was sure this was the lowest moment of her life. The ferry pulled into Falmouth Harbor, and Sonia got back into her car. She looked at the weather. If she left Falmouth by nine, she'd easily make it to Harmony Falls before the storm came in, which had been predicted to arrive around three in the afternoon. She'd be in her log cabin slash ski chalet by then. The advertisement boosted a local ski resort less than a mile up the road from the cabin. She would take herself skiing. She loved to ski. When was the last time Jeff had taken her skiing? The drive didn't take as long as Sonia had expected. By mid-afternoon, she pulled onto Main Street of Harmony Falls. Following the winding road that curved between the mountains, and alongside a rolling river rushing over boulders beside the road. Ice formed along the river's edge, dripping into the clear water. The road led down a hill, passing a white steepled church and a red firehouse, and then bent to the right and rounded a town square with a white gazebo that had a Christmas tree in the middle of it. A colonial building with a sign that read, Harmony Falls Village Store, sat directly across the street from the gazebo. Its white farmer's porch had benches lining the walls. The railings were wrapped in lights and garland. Next, she passed the small library and post office, along with a police station and pizza shop. The quaint little village reminded her of a Norman Rockwell painting. She continued through town on Main Street and over a bridge, leading her toward the lake. The road followed along the lake, passing cabins and cottages along the water's edge. She passed big houses built high in the hills, and then small camps that weren't winterized. The road twisted and turned along the lake's shore, through evergreen forests and granite ledges. The surface of the lake was mostly frozen, except right where she pulled in, just past the stream that flowed into the lake. Was that a beaver dam? When she pulled into the cabin's driveway, she leaned over the wheel to get a better look and the exterior took her breath away. Just like the photographs, the log chalet looked like it had been plucked from an Austrian alp and placed on the edge of an expansive lake. The mountains towering in the background almost looked like lavender, the bare trees and pines blending. She turned around and saw nothing but trees all around her. It was everything she had hoped for. She was in the middle of nowhere. There was something about winter in the mountains, overlooking the lake with its granite ledges and its wide expanse that hadn't completely frozen all the way across. She sat in the car, a perfect view of the mountain range across the lake. On the north side of the lake were the peaks of the White Mountains. She didn't know the mountains behind her, but remembered it had something to do with a sweater. Was it Mount Cardigan? Off in the distance, through a small break in the trees, she could see the little village of Harmony Falls right along the lake's edge, including the white gazebo and matching church. She had anticipated the fresh mountain crisp air filling her lungs and expanding her chest, which had been so tight since she'd text Jeff. But as she got out of the car and stood looking out at the view, all she could smell was the damp earth and rot, and all she felt was cold. She turned to the cabin as a snowflake fell on her nose. Then one fell on her eyelash. Soon, before she even realized, snow was falling quickly down and the wind suddenly picked up. She grabbed her phone, hoping she could open her email and find the house code to get inside. When the emails finally loaded, she typed in the code as fast as she could. Her fingers were freezing by the time she hit the enter button. The door unlocked and she stepped inside. A beeping noise from the alarm came out. She looked back at her email, where the owner of the chalet gave the alarm passcode. She typed it in, and the beeping immediately shut off. 
Sonia leaned against the door, her feet and heart numb. Since leaving Jeff, she hadn't cried. She had expected to in the middle of the mountains. Surely, finally alone, she'd break down. Instead, she was angry. And suddenly very hungry. With a flip of the light, the adorable chalet turned into a dirty old hunting cabin. The tall glass window overlooked what she assumed would be the lake. But even though the snow blocked the view, she was certain the years of grime wouldn't let her see out. A layer of dust covered every surface, including the floors. How long had it been since someone had been in to clean? The snow fell at a steady pace. She wished she had stopped at the village store, but didn't want to chance driving now and getting stuck in the snow. Besides, what kind of food would a village store offer? What was she going to do now? She walked into the kitchen and looked in the pantry. A few cans of soup and other random items, like elbow macaroni and an open container of oatmeal. She closed the doors. She wasn't that hungry. But she was cold. Where's the heat? she said, looking for the thermostat. Just as she opened the door to what appeared to be a basement, the doorbell rang. She swung around to see a police officer peering through the window. Her heart immediately dropped. What if something had happened to Pops or the kids or Jeff? She rushed to the door and opened it. Her heart pounded as the officer looked at her. Can I help you? Yes, I have a report that someone may have broken into this residence. May I ask for some ID? A break-in? Sonia leaned back, shocked, but his eyes were still pinned on her. Let me grab my ID. She patted her sides and realized she had left everything in her car. She pointed out the door behind him. It's in my car. He nodded. You here for a stay? I rented the cabin for the week. Right away, she pulled out her phone and opened an email sent from the owner. If she hadn't been worried about being arrested, she might have used an expletive. But instead, she showed the officer the email as her whole body shook. Calm down, miss, the officer said in a kind voice. I'm sure there's been a mistake. But if you could grab that ID, it would help with everything. Right, she said, walking out the door to the car. She stepped through the snow in her shoes. Already a few inches had accumulated on the ground. She leaned into the car to grab her wallet. As soon as she had it in her hand, she passed her ID to the officer, her hands still trembling. Here. He took it, studying the terrible photo that reminded her more of a mugshot than a formal ID. You're from Martha's Vineyard? He asked. Yes. 52 Cliffside Point. She said it without thinking twice. They bought the house 20 years ago when Jeff had made partner. Would she keep it now? Would she stay on the island instead? Ma'am, the officer said. Sonia shook herself out of her running thoughts and endless questions. Yes. Ms. Whitmore, he said. It looks like you have the right date. Let me call in and figure out what's going on. She wanted to come back with her retort, because of course she had everything correct, but the police officer was only doing his job. It wasn't his fault the owner obviously didn't know how to run a business. He walked back to his cruiser, which was still running, the windshield wipers sweeping the falling snow off every few seconds. The afternoon sun had been blocked out. The snow fell so hard, she could hardly make out the lake that was only a hundred feet or so away. The officer had kept her ID and seemed to be referring to it as he talked on his radio with his door open. She could hear a woman's voice on the other end, but couldn't hear exactly what was being said. The conversation lasted for some time. When he hadn't spoken in a while, he turned to her and said, I'm on hold. Her heart began to race even faster. What did that mean? I can leave. I don't need to stay here. He held up his hand to silence her. Copy that, he said back, then put the receiver on its holder. He walked to Sonia and handed her ID back to her. It appears your husband canceled the reservation. 
Chapter 4 Sonia's heart dropped. Jeff did what? From the pit of her stomach, something boiled out. You have got to be kidding me! Her voice raged out before she could control herself. He canceled my reservation? She dropped her head back, squeezing her fists at her sides and growling out, Urgh! Well, you'll want to fix this misunderstanding. The officer didn't move from where he stood. You might want to contact the owner and figure out where the error occurred and where to go next. Excuse me? She huffed. You call... She looked at the email on her phone again. Mr. Don Morse, and explain that Jeff Whitmore was not the person who reserved this rental. That it was, in fact, me, and he had no right to cancel. Sonia wouldn't fix anything. She crossed her arms in defiance. She didn't care if this man arrested her at this point. Jeff could cancel his vows, cancel his obligations to her, but he wasn't going to cancel her reservation. The officer remained calm. Why don't you call your husband and find out why he canceled? She looked at the officer in shock. I'd rather sleep outside and freeze to death than call that man. Okay. The officer's eyebrows lifted in surprise. Sounds like you two aren't on the same page here. You could say that! She was starting to realize her outburst had been directed at a complete stranger who was only doing his job as an officer of the law and had much more important things to do than hear her rant. I'm sorry. I've just had the worst day of my life, and it appears to be getting worse. The man's face softened and he rubbed his salt and pepper beard. How about I call Dawn and clear things up? He obviously hasn't found new renters for tonight. Go back inside and I'll make a few calls. Relief swept through her, which only angered her. No! The only thing you need to clear up is that Dawn had no right to cancel my reservation! Sonia realized she had raised her voice to a yell, and by the look on the officer's face, she may very well end up in jail. I'm sorry, she quickly added. It's just, I'm the one who made the reservation, and I'm the one who's taking the vacation, so I should be the one who communicates whether or not it's canceled. His forehead creased in concern, and she was quite certain he was considering whether she was crazy. I'll let you call Don while I wait in the cruiser. He jabbed his thumb behind him, backing away from her. She pounded the number into the phone and let it ring. It went straight to voicemail. Hello, Don. My name is Sonia Whitmore. I understand you received a call to cancel my reservations, but there has been a misunderstanding. If you could call my number and talk to me, I'd appreciate that. She hit the end button hard on the screen, then looked at the officer who sat in his car. He looked at her like she was crazy. She couldn't blame him. He's not picking up, she yelled out. Then he answered his own phone. He raised a finger and started talking while she walked over to the SUV. Sure, Don, she heard the officer say. I'll tell her. Tell me what, she said through the window. She started knocking. He can talk to me. I'm not an idiot just because I'm a woman. Ma'am? You need to calm down, the officer said, getting out of his vehicle. She blinked away a few snowflakes and looked at his badge, but she didn't have her readers to read his name. I am calm, Officer... Monahan, he said. Officer Monahan, she repeated. But she wasn't calm. Her hands shook, not from the cold, but from anger. How could Jeff have canceled without talking to her first? Look, Ms. Whitmore, Don is just an old-timer who rents out his cabin while living in Florida. The officer turned back to his vehicle. He means no harm. He's just traditional. She huffed at the word traditional. He can't expect me to leave in this storm. Officer Monahan nodded. You're not going anywhere. I don't even have something to eat. There's no heat, she complained. She knew it wasn't the officer's fault, but she couldn't stop herself. It looks like you need to talk to your hu- 
Officer Monahan stopped himself. The man who canceled your reservation. In the meantime, I can help you get set up for at least tonight. She immediately felt stupid. Was this whole interaction being recorded on his police cam, and would it be public record? Crazy wife breaking into rental cabin in New Hampshire, arrested for being belligerent. Her son might be asked to write about it. I'm so sorry, she said, her throat tightening as she stood in the middle of the driveway, in inches of snow, with nowhere to go. I just wanted... She cut off, unsure if she could get the words out without breaking down. The emotions were starting to simmer in her stomach. She was going to get sick. Let me go inside and turn everything on for you, he said. He walked to a statue sitting in the garden next to the front door and lifted it on its side. Underneath, there was a spare key. Here, you'll need this if the power goes out. She hadn't even thought of that. What do I do if it does? Will the heat work? Officer Monahan opened the front door. Don should have a generator, but I'll check to make sure the wood stove's working. Oh, God, her stomach twisted more. She had never had to tend to a wood stove before. The officer walked inside and went through the cabin comfortably, as though he knew the place. He walked right up to the thermostat and started playing with the numbers. Have you been here before? she asked, as he walked into the house and opened the door to the basement. He nodded. Don's my uncle. Her mouth dropped. Oh. As he walked down the stairs, she heard the furnace kick in. She looked around the space. The advertising blurb and reality were two very different things. If she had somewhere else to go, she would have given Don a piece of her mind. The only saving grace for the cabin was the fireplace. Anchoring the room, the two-story stone fireplace had a stack of logs ready to be lit. She couldn't wait to start a fire once the officer left. She had been dreaming of watching something burn since leaving the island. The dark log walls did make the place feel warm and cozy. And with the floor-to-ceiling windows that overlooked the lake, she imagined it would be bright and sunny when the sun was out. But the worn, mismatched furniture, along with the overwhelming number of tacky knickknacks and dead animals, made the place less than desirable. She would leave straight away. Sonia walked to the sliding glass doors and looked out as the snow continued to fall. White crystals accumulated against the glass doors as the wind blew it around. Only the tips of pine beside the cabin could be seen, and even those were quickly being covered in white. The place had been advertised as a gentleman's retreat, a place to stay to fish, hunt, and ski. The perfect place to get away, it said on the website. Sonia needed a getaway, a getaway from reality, a getaway from the blaring truth that her marriage was over, no matter how she spun it. A getaway from her life that could very well fall apart if she returned to reality. You should be all set up, Officer Monahan said as he came up from downstairs. He held up a bottle of champagne. Even had a few things in the refrigerator. She smiled back at the officer. Thanks for helping me. I'll call Don and sort this out after you leave. He nodded. Is there anything else I can help you with tonight? She shook her head, embarrassed by her rant earlier. I'm good, thanks. He gave a nod and a half smile. Call the station if you need any assistance. Will do. Thanks again, she said as the officer left the cabin. She pulled out her phone, about to call Lila and tell her where she was, but she stopped before she hit her number. What was the point? She would just add stress to her daughter's life. Andrew hardly ever called anymore. He had been so upset about the whole Christmas situation. Pops never checked in with her. Jeff hadn't even called in to see what she was doing. She looked out as snow dropped in thick clumps to the ground. A shiver ran through her body. She was as isolated and remote as the dingy cabin. Chapter 5 
Lila stood in her bedroom in her new apartment and looked out at the water as the last of the snow fell. The sun slowly crept over the horizon and white crystals glistened on everything. She looked down at her new kitten asleep on the bed. Not exactly where she thought she'd be a year ago, but exactly what she wanted for her life. Waking up to an adorable kitten and having a dependable, honest man waiting to see her when she got up. She loved knowing Drake was already downstairs in the bakery, waiting for her to come down and have her cup of coffee. Life couldn't get much better. She had a man who'd moved the world for her if he could. She had a new goal for her career. Pops and Biddy seemed happy and were settling down in their own lives. She had a great support group and the closest friends she'd ever had in her life. What else could she ask for? New Year's had brought an urge to not waste time worrying about the future. She wanted to live in the moment. The right now. She wanted to seize the day. Carpe diem. Do you think the storm has officially stopped? She asked Arthur as she got up and walked to the shower. With a quick brush of the teeth and comb of the hair, she grabbed her study materials for the bar exam and headed down to the bakery. I'll be back, Artie, she said. The moment Lila walked through the back door, Drake made his way to her, dropping what he was doing in the office, and kissed her. Good morning, Drake said. Good morning, she said back, her breath still stolen from his kiss. What should we do tonight, he asked. They had plans for a date night, alone. Pops, Biddy, and DJ had plans to watch movies and get takeout. It would be their first official date since he took the job at Books and Bread. Let's stay in and watch scary movies, she said. That's it? he asked. How about I take you out, and you can show me the island? Lila smiled, taking his hand in hers. She shook her head. You can't see much at night. I'd rather spend time together not worrying about a table. Let's just grab something and come back to my place. He stared at her for a moment. She could tell he was trying to figure out the situation, that he could sense something was up, but couldn't put his finger on it. Drake had been that inquisitive from the moment she met him. She could rarely hide her feelings, but he didn't push it. Okay, but I'm going to make dinner for you, he said, then kissed her. I better get back to work. She kissed him one more time. She loved kissing him. He led the way out to the front of the store where Rene Perez stood at the counter. The owner of Books and Bread had offered the job to Drake just before he left for Oklahoma, and Lila felt as though she owed this angel. Good morning, Rene, Lila said as she rounded the corner. Lila, Rene said with a wide smile. I thought you'd take a break from studying today. Lila laughed. Like you taking the day off? Touché, Renee said, placing her hands on her hips, a baby bump just starting to show. What can I get you? Lila ordered her usual, a tall café mocha with a pain en chocolat. It reminded her of being a young girl in Paris and with her father. He'd take their family on fabulous vacations before the affairs always doting on her and her mother with gifts and lavish trips to faraway places she'd only read about in books. The wedding was amazing, Lila said to Renee. All the food and everything was perfect. She thought back through the night before. She had enjoyed herself so much, more than at any other wedding she had attended. She had stood holding Drake's hand at the ceremony. She danced the night away in his arms. And she'd ended the night with a kiss. I had the most fabulous time. Renee wiggled her eyebrows. She leaned over the counter closer to Lila and whispered, I saw you two dancing all night. Lila smiled, feeling her cheeks warm. I think your mom had fun too, Renee said, handing Lila her pain en chocolat. I'm sure she did, Lila said. But she never knew when it came to her mother. Sonia could fake her feelings better than anyone. Renee pointed at her. I saw her yesterday boarding the ferry. This surprised Lila. She went on the ferry? Renee nodded. Really early yesterday morning. She drove her car on it. Her mother hadn't driven on the ferry in years, as far as Lila knew. 
Sonia usually flew private, or at least first class, then made a driving service if she left the island. But Sonia hardly ever left. Her mother suffered from the too-busy complex. Whenever Lila had suggested leaving for anything, Sonia's response usually was that she was too busy. Too busy doing charity work. Too busy planning events for her father. Too busy running around to see her daughter. You sure you saw my mom? Lila couldn't imagine Sonia driving herself on the ferry. I'm pretty sure it was. Renee looked up to the ceiling, trying to remember. She drives a black Mercedes, right? Lila nodded, suddenly curious of what she was doing. When she sat down at her regular table, she thought about texting Sonia, but that would only open the door to criticism, so she decided against it. She put down her phone and began studying. Studying for the uniform bar exam had been no joke, but it would all be worth it. She would help Biddy get her home back and her livelihood. The only catch would be that they'd lose Biddy in the end. She won't want to take care of Pops when she had her life back in Oklahoma again. Then there was Drake. Would he stay on an island when he could work a ranch again? She knew the answer. Sometimes she felt noble, preparing herself to take the exam, helping Biddy fight for what was rightfully hers. But then she wondered if she was setting herself up for heartbreak. Would they all leave if they won? After a few hours, she called it for the morning. With a crick in her neck and a craving for more pain en chocolat, she decided it was time to find a new study spot. I'll see you at six, Drake said when she came to say goodbye. He looked so handsome in his button-up and jeans, wearing a books and bread apron and his cowboy boots. She lifted up on her tippy toes to kiss him. Can't wait, she said. When she turned around, Abigail Schofield stood in front of her. Her jaw dropped at the scene in front of her. Well, I see you've moved on, Abigail said, holding her purse underneath her arm. I see you're still married, Lila pointed to Abigail's ring finger. The six-carat diamond band Abigail had bragged about still hung on her skeleton finger. Lila had always found it to be gaudy and audacious, but so was her ex-best friend. Abigail's mouth dropped in shock. She hadn't been around the new Lila long enough to know she wouldn't be walked over any longer. Abigail straightened her posture. I've been meaning to call. Lila switched on her armor as soon as Abigail said it. She knew this technique among the women she used to socialize with. Cut them down with gossip and rumors behind their back, but be polite and sociable to their face. She wouldn't give Abigail the satisfaction of showing any kind of feeling one way or the other. You've been meaning to call? Lila asked, bouncing Abigail's words back at her. Still, her hands shook. Maybe we could have lunch sometime and talk, Abigail asked. Lila felt a light touch on the small of her back. Instantly, Drake's hand warmed her and relieved her anxiety. He had her back, literally and figuratively. At one time, she might have allowed Abigail to come back into her life, but she was no longer that woman. No, I don't think so, she said in the strongest tone she could muster. Oh, I see. Abigail's face pinched, showing wrinkles she had probably Botoxed. Well, if you change your mind. Lila shook her head. No, I don't think I will. Abigail said nothing. Instead, she narrowed her eyes and left the store. Lila would hear from Sonia for sure now. Why did you talk to Abigail that way? Why couldn't you have let things go? Why would you display your dirty laundry in front of the whole island? You are so sexy when you get mad, Drake whispered in her ear. She let out a nervous laugh, shaking her arms before draping them over Drake's shoulders. Let's go out, she said, changing her mind. She had been trying to avoid situations like that, but for what? She loved the man who stood beside her, 
She loved him and didn't care what people thought or what people said. She was a whole new person, thanks to him. Drake kissed her one last time. I'll pick you up at six. Lila floated back to the apartment. She had never been this happy. As she put her stuff down on the kitchen table, her phone started to ring. Hey, Andrew, she said cheerily. You'd never guess where I ran into at the bakery. Mom's gone, he interrupted. What, she said. I can't get a hold of her. Andrew sounded panicked. Slow down. What's going? Her mom was gone? I'm at the house and she's not here, he said. Lila remembered what Renee had told her. Renee told me she had seen mom getting on the ferry. When, he asked. Yesterday, Lila said. You didn't think that was weird, he said, as though she was keeping a secret from him. I just heard this morning, Lila said defensively. She's probably at the apartment in the city. She's not there. He spoke the words hard, and warning bells went off in her head. Do you think she's all right? No, I don't know, he said. She doesn't just take off. What about dad? What about him? Andrew said. He's in Florida still. He never came back. With Drake being back, Lila hadn't even thought about her parents' drama. Their issues only caused stress and anxiety for her. As an adult, she wanted nothing to do with it any longer. Maybe she's finally standing up for herself, Lila said. It's about time if you ask me. Lila had been a daddy's girl up until the scandal broke. He had been her hero. She looked up to him and only ever wanted to make him proud. Maybe she's in trouble, he said. Lila's heart dropped as her mind immediately went dark. She hadn't ever pictured Sonia Whitmore in trouble. Her mother hardly showed any emotion. Could she be in real trouble? What do you mean? What if she's hurt? What if she got into an accident in the snowstorm? Andrew said, continuing to list every terrible situation that could have happened. It's been a couple days since I've talked to her. How about you? Lila thought back from the wedding to now. It's only been two days. She's not home, Andrew said, and she's not answering her phone, and we don't know where she is. So you haven't talked to Dad? Lila guessed her brother hadn't called. No, Andrew said coldly. They hadn't spoken about the fact Lila's parents hadn't spent Christmas together, the reason too embarrassing for her to bring up. How could a father choose a man who cheated on his daughter over his family? Lila thought about her mother at the wedding. She hadn't told Renee her mother seemed more melancholy than happy. She had assumed Sonia felt out of place. But had Sonia been upset? Lila grabbed her purse and keys. I'm headed over to the house right now. Chapter Six Sean Monahan loved the mornings after a good snowfall. People tended to stay indoors and take it slow, which was good for him, because as the one and only police officer in Harmony Falls, that was much of his job in the winter, helping people out of the snow. Morning, Gail, he said to his faithful assistant of 20 years. Gail had worked for the station for years, even before he had joined the force. She had talked about retiring after the new year, heading down south for the winter with her husband. Sean had promised to start looking for a new assistant, but the thought killed him. You're late, she said. He looked at his watch. He was 30 minutes early to his regular shift. He looked around the empty station, listening to the quiet phones. Maybe it was time for Gail to retire. He walked into his office, and there sat select woman Douglas. Shoot. He was late. Mayor. Sean, Vanessa said, rolling her eyes at his use of her formal title. She flipped her hair behind her shoulder. Dang, his ex-wife still caught his heart. You look terrible, she said, and his heart instantly went sour. Sorry I'm late. He put down the bag of paperwork he had taken home. I wouldn't expect less, she said, with snark. He gritted his teeth. Sean was hardly ever late on purpose. If he'd been late, it was because Mrs. Santos was having a baby on Interstate 93, 
or Mr. Palmer was having a heart attack. Vanessa loved to make it sound like he'd just been some lazy husband who hadn't given time to her. So, Mayor, how can I help you? he asked. Mrs. Francis is complaining that no one from town is clearing the snowpath by her house. Vanessa crossed her arms. I've gone after the last few snowstorms, and she's right. The path isn't being cleared. Can you talk to Billy about his obligation with the town as road agent to clear the community's elderly's walkways? You're on the selectman committee, Sean said, walking to his coffee maker, which had a fresh-brewed mini-pot just for him, courtesy of Gail. Talk to Billy yourself. I did, Vanessa said. He cringed, closing his eyes. And you want me to talk to your brother? Yes, Vanessa snapped, as though this was an average favor someone would ask the police. He stared at his ex-wife. You know this is ridiculous. He's not doing his job for my constituents. Vanessa stood with her chin raised. She knew dang well her little brother shouldn't have been hired by the board of selectmen, but like always, she wanted Sean to clean up her mess. No, he said. He took a sip of coffee. What? Her eyes shot daggers. What do you mean, no? This is your job. Fire your brother, then, he said, turning to his computer and opening his email. This isn't a police matter. You can fire him, and you can bring your grievances to the board meeting. But you will not use the taxpayer's money to do your job. Her jaw dropped. How dare you accuse me of not doing my job? Boss, Gail said from the doorway. What's up, he said, ignoring Vanessa's tantrum. You got a call from a woman in Martha's Vineyard, concerned about her mother, Gail said. Line five. Thanks, Gail, he said, nodding at her. There was no way he was going to let Gail retire. Please talk to Billy. Otherwise, I will have to fire him, Vanessa said, as though her brother had suddenly become his responsibility. You're his best friend, Sean groaned. I'm his only friend. Yes, well, that too, Vanessa said. She began to walk out of his office, but turned around and gave him a piercing look, her gray eyes still making his heart skip a beat. She gave him a half smile and said, You should get some rest. He sighed, wishing she didn't still have that hold on him that when she flashed her eyes, he wouldn't wish she was still in his arms. I can't when I'm doing everything for everyone around here. Her face twisted at his comment. Let me know how the talk goes. He squeezed his hand around his mug, taking in a deep breath and holding it for a few seconds before answering the phone. Good morning, Officer Monaghan speaking, Sean said. Hello, my name is Lila Whitmore. I'm hoping you could do a wellness check on my mother. The woman sounded panicked, which alerted him right away. Absolutely. Let's start with your mother's name and whereabouts, he said. Her name is Sonia Whitmore. She's in her mid-fifties, blonde with blue eyes, and she's been out of contact with her family since New Year's Eve. Sean instantly thought about the pretty woman from last night. Her car has a tracking app that says she's at an address near the lake in town. The woman's voice cracked. Is she about five foot four with blonde hair? He asked. Driving a black Mercedes? Yes. The woman sounded instantly worried. Is she okay? She was fine as of last night, he answered. She's here in Harmony Falls, renting a cabin on the lake. She repeated what he'd said to another person, before talking back into the phone. We've been trying to get in touch with her and haven't been able to get through. I helped her get into her rental last night, he said, thinking about her being upset with Dawn for canceling her reservation. She wasn't happy, but was there cause for alarm? I was there mid-afternoon. She may have lost power because of the storm that came in. Would you like me to go check in? Oh, yes, please. Could you do that? Sure, no problem. He got up from his chair, grabbing the lid to his coffee cup, 
which Gail had placed on his desk, knowing that's exactly where he would look for it. He thought about how Gail had been his longest relationship. I'll head over right now. I'm going to send you over to my assistant, and she'll take down all your information, okay? So stay on the line. I will, she said. Thank you so much, Officer Monahan. No problem. Sean put her on hold and called out to Gail as he walked out of his office. Gail, could you grab this woman's info while I do a wellness check? Sure thing, boss, Gail said from her desk. Anyone in town lose power last night? Most of West Shore Road, she said as she picked up the phone. He nodded, not surprised. Most storms cut off the power out on that side of the lake. I'll be back, he said, putting on his winter police jacket. He grabbed his sunglasses and stepped outside. The sun glared off the freshly fallen snow. Getting into his SUV, he called into the dispatcher. As he reached the cabin, a plow truck pulled out of the driveway after having just finished clearing the snow. He waved at the driver, a local who ran his own plowing company, reminding Sean of the talk he had to have with Billy. His toes curled at Vanessa's request and his unwillingness to do what she said. He got out of the vehicle, keeping his radio on. Just as he went to knock on the door, the woman swung it open. She wore a fancy leather winter coat and shiny leather gloves and fancy boots with fur. And she was holding a shovel. Mrs. Whitmore, he said, hoping not to startle her. But it was too late. She jumped, her hands jerking up, and she dropped the shovel and the blade fell right on top of Sean's foot. Oh, he grunted. His eyes shot open in pain as he picked up the shovel from the ground. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, she said, reaching out and taking the shovel back. Are you okay? I'm fine. He grunted out the words, but he could feel his big toe instantly swelling up. I'm actually here to see if you're okay. A puzzled look washed across her face. I'm fine. I ask because your daughter called the station this morning concerned about you, he said. The woman looked as though she was about to hit the runway in her getup. Are you shoveling in that? She looked down at her coat and boots, then looked back at him. I have to wear something. But that's what you brought to wear out here? He suddenly understood why the daughter had called. Well, I didn't realize I was going to be stuck in the woods. He had so many questions that came to mind with that statement. This lady was a little more unstable than he had originally thought. You realize you're in the White Mountains in northern New Hampshire, right? I know that. She looked annoyed. Why was he always annoying beautiful women? My phone's dead, she said. There's no power in the cabin, and it looks as though I'll be stuck here for days. She threw her hand out behind him, and he turned to a huge mound of snow with a car underneath it. The plow guy literally plowed my car in. He moaned quietly to himself. How many snow plowers would he have to talk to today? He picked up his radio. Gail, call Ms. Whitmore back and let her know her mother's fine. She lost power, but we'll call her as soon as she can. Got it, boss, Gail said. He hooked his radio back into place and stepped away from the door. He held out his phone in exchange for the shovel. How about I clean off your car for you, and you can call your daughter. You might get reception down by the road. Really? She said, her annoyance immediately replaced with a look of relief. That would be wonderful. Thank you. He handed her his personal cell phone, and she took it. Thank you. I appreciate it. He nodded, but kept an eye on her as she inched her way down the driveway in her leather boots. It took about twenty minutes, but he cleared off the snow on her sedan, pounded a couple ibuprofen, and waited in his squad for her to finish her phone call. He wondered why a woman her age would be renting a cabin like Dawn's alone. As soon as she walked back up the driveway, he got out. Did you get in touch with your daughter? he asked. She nodded, handing him the phone. Yes, thank you. She kept her sunglasses on, but they didn't hide the fact that she had been crying and seemed in distress. He put his phone back into his pocket. 
How long are you staying in town? he asked. A few days, she said and sniffled. Maybe. You staying by yourself then? He glanced over at her as she wiped her cheek. Yes, she answered flatly. Just me. How about I take you to breakfast, he said. Excuse me? Her forehead wrinkled. You'll have a hard time driving around here if you're not used to the roads. He gestured his head toward her sedan. I can bring you down to the village store to pick up a few items you might need. And John happens to make the best breakfast in town. She didn't answer at first, but then after a moment of silence, she said, That would be very kind of you. Chapter 7 Sonia wanted to kill Jeff, so maybe it was best she sat in a police cruiser. Lila said he hadn't told them where she was, even though they were concerned. He knew darn well where she was because he had canceled the reservation. But had he thought of his children and their concern? No, just himself, like always. If someone would have told her just days ago where her life would be, she did thought they were crazy. Single, alone, in the middle of nowhere, driving with a police officer. Never. But there she was, sitting in the passenger seat, while this man thought she had lost her marbles, and she was pretty sure she had. Last night, she had finished the bottle of champagne he'd pulled from the fridge and had cried all night long with no phone or power or a working furnace. Luckily, the wood stove provided enough so she didn't freeze. The officer stopped questioning her well-being by the time he reached town. She was done talking anyway, even if he was the law. I recommend the pancakes, he said, getting out. She followed behind him up the porch of the village store and noticed how tall he stood as he bent down to walk inside the store's door. Morning, John, Officer Monaghan nodded at the gray-haired man behind the counter. You lasted a day, the old man said with a smile. You know I can't live without your pancakes, the officer said back. The old man smiled in delight and a hint of pride. He looked to Sonia next. And what can I get you, beautiful? I'll have... She looked for a healthier option on the handwritten menu hanging above the counter. But none of the choices even included fruit or vegetables or whole wheat. The pancakes. That a girl, the man said. He looked as though he were in his seventies, but still fit. You need a little something on those bones. Women always look better with a bit of a curve, if you ask me. I don't think the lady is asking, Officer Monaghan said to the cook. Sonia's face twisted at the comment. Why did all the men in this tiny town seem to think it was the 1950s? She paused before following the officer as he sat down at the counter on one of the swivel chairs. The tiny village store didn't have much in the way of groceries. She saw a few shelves with the essentials, along with fire starters, split wood, and flashlights. All things she should consider buying if she was going to survive staying in a cabin that lost power. She wondered if she should leave as soon as the roads cleared up. What was she proving by running away from her problems? John, can we charge a phone? The officer asked the store owner. Unplug the television first, John said with his back to them, pouring batter onto the griddle. You want to give me your phone? He asked, holding out his hand. She passed her phone and charger to him as he walked behind the counter. He pulled the plug from the television and then pushed the charger into the outlet. Thank you, she said, as anxiety rose. What waited on her phone? Messages from her children? Jeff? Pops? Guilt flooded through her. She shouldn't have left in such a tizzy. She was being so ridiculous. Are you okay? He asked. She looked down at her hands and realized she was squeezing them into fists, this man must think she's crazy. She looked at John, who was talking to a new customer coming into the store. I'm fine. Are you sure you're okay staying by yourself? He asked, serious with a bit of concern dragging in his words. Can't a woman be on her own? She said back at him. He jerked his head back and held up his hand. 
I'm just doing my job and making sure you're okay. She shook her head at herself. Things just kept getting worse. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. He didn't say anything, which made things even more uncomfortable. Would he haul her off to a hospital to get her mental health checked? She had heard of things like that happening. People snap. Was she snapping? I'm just going through some things, she said, hoping that would squash his doubts. The way things were going, she might end up being put in custody for her well-being. But I'll be fine. I'm sorry to hear you're going through a hard time, he said. She nodded, appreciating the fact he sounded sincere. Thank you. I didn't expect to be causing so many problems. Just wanted to get away from reality for a bit. He nodded. I understand that feeling. He sat, looking ahead, tapping his fingers on the counter. Silence uncomfortably sat between them. How long have you been an officer? She asked, trying to make things less awkward. Hitting thirty years this spring. He must be around her age, but looked much younger, with a full head of hair and only a salty beard. Wow. All here in town? She asked. He shook his head. Twenty. Still, that's a long time for an officer to work in one place, she said. Though she figured if he could take her to breakfast, there must not be much crime in the small town. It's been interesting, he said, pulling out his phone and starting to type. She looked around for things she might want to buy, things she'd put on the credit card. Was it still her credit card? Oh, God, would she need to hire an attorney? Did she need to do that right away? Or would Jeff send papers to her? She told Lila nothing on the phone, only that she went away for a small vacation. When would she tell the truth? Risk further ruining the relationship between Jeff and the twins? Was it completely evil to want her children to side with her? Jeff ruined the marriage. He should pay the price for breaking up their family. Had Sonia been that pathetic to stay with Jeff? Had everyone known all along, like they had before? Now she could see all the signs again and realize she had chosen to ignore them. You okay? Officer Monaghan asked. The knot in Sonia's throat started coming back. Any liquor stores around here? That a girl, John said. No need for New Year's baloney. She had once created a vision board a few New Year's ago, a cheesy fad happening at the time, but something she had done in private on her own. She needed direction. Something. She went through dozens of magazines and pulled images from websites of things that made her happy. The board was filled with flowers, gardens, landscapes, mountains, and faraway cities. She had pasted quotes of standing on her own and letting go, and finding her happiness. She studied the board over and over, hoping an answer would magically arrive through her intention, like Deepak Chopra had promised would happen. But she forgot about the board and her intentions, and nothing ever changed. What would she put on that board now? A money sign? A husband? A well-respected attorney who takes her case pro bono? Ugh. She groaned internally, dropping her head into her hands. Are you sure you're okay? Officer Monaghan asked. How many times had he asked at this point? She wasn't going to be okay if he asked her again. You know what? I think I'm going to grab those things and- Here are your pancakes, John said, dropping two very large, very tall stacks of pancakes in front of her and Officer Monaghan. A sugary, sweet maple scent drifted to her nostrils, and she inhaled a deep, long breath. This smells like heaven. Her stomach growled immediately. When was the last time she had eaten anything? She realized it had been the reception. Dig in, John said, sliding over a glass jar of real maple syrup. With one hand, Officer Monaghan lifted another glass jar with what looked like fresh butter inside. Homemade, from John's cows out back. 
she dunked her knife into the smooth, creamy butter and spread it all along the top of her pancakes, then took the syrup jar and drizzled a heavy stream over every inch. With her fork turned to its side, she dug into the fluffy stack, so light and airy it split apart as though she had been using a steak knife. She took her first bite and moaned out before she could stop herself. Her face immediately warmed, and she looked at the officer to see if he had noticed. Told you so, he said, biting into his first forkful. Mmm. She covered her mouth as she chewed. These are amazing. Fresh grain, fresh butter, fresh syrup, John yelled from the other side of the room. Oh, and fresh eggs. John's pancakes are famous around these parts, Officer Monahan said. She already had her second large mouthful and moaned again. Glad you like them, John said, but he didn't appear surprised by her absolute delight. They were good, more than good. They were delicious, like the best cakes she'd ever tasted, paired with the best butter and the best syrup. Not to mention how ravenous she suddenly was, as though she couldn't get the pancakes into her mouth fast enough. And she didn't care who saw her stuff her face. No one from the charity committee or the DAR were lurking behind the shelves waiting to eavesdrop and pass judgment. I've got wild berry jam as well, John said, putting down another glass jar in front of her. Ever try it with honey? I'd love to try some, she said. But then she froze as she looked up at the sign above John. You don't take credit cards? John pointed to the sign. Just cash. She grimaced. Who didn't take credit cards nowadays? Do you have an ATM? He shook his head. Do you take checks? She dug into her purse, hoping that her checkbook was still in her wallet. She remembered taking it out to make more room for tissues and other things for the plane ride. It's on me. Officer Monahan said. No, no, I can't let you pay for my breakfast, she said, shaking her head. Officer Monahan held up his fork. I invited you to breakfast. Let me pay. John shrugged. I have dishes in the back if you'd rather. She didn't want to do either, but she didn't have the checkbook and only four unusable credit cards. Okay, but let me write you a check when we get back to the cabin. No, please. It's not a problem, Officer Monahan said. You staying on the lake? John asked her. She nodded. Yes, over on West Shore Road. Ah, Don's place, John said. Good fishing over there this time of year. The thought of ice fishing had never even crossed her mind. I'm probably going to head home after this. Now where's that? he asked her. And that simple question made her stop cutting her pancakes and look up. She had no idea where her home would be after this trip. Yes, it technically was still on Martha's Vineyard, but would it be once she returned? I'm from Massachusetts, she said, not exactly sure why. She wasn't looking for somewhere new, just somewhere she could escape. Ah, a flatlander. He eyed her suspiciously. We like visitors who don't stick around too long. Don't worry. She couldn't believe his bluntness, but she could tell he wasn't completely serious. I'm not sure I'm cut out for the mountain life. She took another large mouthful of pancake and mumbled out, I might move here for your pancakes if you don't watch out. Well, you're better looking than Don, I suppose he said. By the time she finished breakfast and Officer Monahan paid, he gave her back a charged phone full of messages. As they walked back to his car, she wanted to turn the phone right off and ignore what was waiting, but knew she couldn't. She'd have to call her son and daughter back. What would she say? How could she show strength when she was falling apart? She held the phone in her hand, staring at the messages from her children but nothing from Jeff. If you need anything else, he said, handing her a card once they reached the cabin. Give me a call, and I can help. Thank you. 
She put the card in her back pocket, while he got out before her and opened the passenger door. Her plan, however, was to burn rubber out of town and go back to Martha's Vineyard before the sun went down and glazed all the roads again. He walked her to the door, and she held out her hand. Thank you, Officer Monaghan. He took it with both of his. His hands were rough, yet warm and comforting. He let go of her hand and didn't move from his spot, standing there as though he had something to say. Then, as if he found the nerves to go ahead, he said, Sometimes a change of scenery is exactly what someone needs to see things clearly. Sonia blinked for a moment, digesting his words. It was exactly why she was there. She needed a change of scenery to see things clearly. She needed to leave all the noise and the static and get out of town. She needed to see things for herself, not through Jeff's eyes or Lila's or Andrew's or Randy's. She needed a change now. Thanks. I think you might be right. She gave him a half smile. And with that, he took off back to his police cruiser. She watched as he reversed down the snow-covered drive. As soon as the cruiser was out of sight, she turned and faced the sun, letting its warmth touch her cheeks. She looked out at the partial open water, shimmering under the sun's rays. Out in the middle sat an island covered with tall pines and large boulders of granite ledges. The hard landscape was softened by curves of ice forming against its shore. The wind blew across the lake, as if calling to her. Come, it said. No one can find you here. She picked up her phone and decided to tell the truth. There was no point in delaying the inevitable. She dialed Andrew's number, but when he didn't pick up, she changed her mind. Sorry about the worry, she said in an upbeat tone. She blew out as she collected herself and stared out at the island. I'm fine. I just needed a change of scenery. Chapter 8 The power returned by noon, and Sonia rummaged through the cabin looking to see what kinds of things had been left for renters. More fishing poles than she could count, snowshoes that looked as though they could fit any shoe size, and enough inner tubes and beach toys for the Brady Bunch none of which she knew how to use or wanted to use. She needed hiking boots, warm winter hiking boots. She also needed an actual winter coat, not one that was fashionable. Maybe even a pair of snow pants and long underwear. Wool socks would be nice for skiing. She also wanted a backpack big enough to carry water, a few pieces of kindling, and some food. Her only goal for that day was to figure out how to get to the island. Why? She had no idea, but something about the island kept calling her. All day she kept saying she should go, but ended up staring at the tiny little lighthouse on the island, which sat on the granite ledge. The small light had stayed on all night, even when the rest of Harmony Falls went black. What powered that lighthouse? Or who powered the lighthouse? And why power a lighthouse in the middle of winter? There were so many questions, and none of them focused on Jeff, or her failed marriage, or her kids. Only the lighthouse. And that's all she wanted to think about. She gathered all the things that could be used on her excursion. A pair of binoculars, matches, a lantern that looked old enough to carry whale oil, a set of snowshoes, and a knapsack that had a Swiss army knife and an actual canteen. She didn't find any warm clothing that fit, only a couple of very large snowmobile suits and random knitted gloves and hats. If she was going to get to the island, she would have to prepare, which meant she needed warm clothes. She reset the modem, just like Don's instructions told her, and began her research. The Lake of Harmony Falls had been a playground for the upper crust of New England. Wealthy families would come and stay in big fancy inns along the water, send their children to summer camps, and build huge summer homes along the water's edge. Through a quick search, she found plenty of photographs of the lake, with sunsets, with the mountains in the background, from the top of the mountains looking down at the panoramic views, 
selfies, animals found around the area, but none of the tiny lighthouse across the lake from the cabin. What surprised her more than the tiny lighthouse had been photographs of a purple house on what appeared to be the other side of the island. She opened Google Earth and looked down from the satellite. She could hardly make out the structure, but it did exist, even from space. So she wasn't entirely crazy. What made her crazy was the fact that she emailed Don and asked to extend her stay. He called her right away. You want to stay for the whole month? he asked. For the month, at least, she said. If this had been a few days ago, she'd never think of staying away from her clubs and activities back on Martha's Vineyard. She also had a dinner party planned for some of Jeff's clients. She hoped they liked mistresses serving them instead. She picked up the pair of binoculars and looked out across the water. If she could plan it right, she'd stay through the coldest months in New Hampshire, let the lake freeze over completely, and walk safely across. She was determined to make it across. Her phone buzzed and she looked down expecting Lila, who hadn't texted since the wellness check. Sonia had done research the night before on divorce. Massachusetts was not a 50-50 state, which meant she had no guarantee to Jeff's money that he had earned during their 30 years of marriage, even if he was at fault for ending the marriage. She looked down to see Jeff's name on the screen. She grabbed it, ready to answer, to hear what he had to say, but she stopped herself. What did he have to say to her after two days of absolutely nothing? She stared down at his name saved in her phone. It was only his first name. Would she keep his last name? Would she go back to Martin? She let the call go to voicemail and then checked it immediately. It's me, Jeff, he said, like she'd need clarification. I wanted to tell you that I filed for legal separation. That's the first step, my attorney said. So he had hired an attorney. Whenever she'd heard about her friends getting divorced, she felt so sorry for them. How could they just start over? What would people think of her if she no longer had money? Would her friends stick around? No, she thought. They wouldn't. I know you're upset, but the sooner we can settle on assets, the sooner this can all be over. He sounded annoyed and aggravated, not at all sorry. You can have your lawyer call mine. Her heart pounded at the realization that he wasn't apologizing. Are you serious? She said out loud. She stopped the message, unwilling to hear anything else that came out, and dialed his number. Pacing in front of the windows, she kept her eye on the lighthouse and waited for his phone to ring. But nothing happened. She looked at the phone's screen. She forgot she had no service inside the house. She put on her ridiculous leather boots and walked out on the porch, which wrapped all the way around the main living space. Every square foot had a view of the lake. The phone rang again, and this time she answered. What are you doing going up to New Hampshire, Sonia? Jeff started. You know you scared your daughter. Then you had the police call me for canceling the reservation? I didn't even know you went away. Jeff, she said coldly. Did you explain to the twins you were sneaking around with other women again? He didn't say anything. How could you not call me and just apologize? It didn't need to be that complicated. Just an apology for not following through on his end for breaking the one promise he'd said in front of their family and friends and even God. You just called to tell me to get an attorney. That's all? Her voice rose as she spoke. Come on, Sonia, he said in that same tone he'd give the kids when they hadn't understood why they were being punished. Our marriage hasn't been working for a long time. What? She said, a bit louder than she had intended, but she was outside in the middle of nowhere. She could yell as loud as she wanted to. Our marriage wasn't working? Don't you think you might want to tell your wife that before you start sleeping around? Calm down, Sonia, he said. She swore she saw red. Calm down? She couldn't find the words she wanted to use. You want me to calm down? 
We need to act like adults for our kids' sakes, he said, condescendingly. It's bad enough you ran away to New Hampshire. Sonia wanted to scream. Are you kidding me? Her heart pounded so hard in her chest, she thought she might have a heart attack. She heard something in the background and pulled the phone away from her ear. Her voice echoed back at her, bouncing across the water and through the trees. I'm sorry, all right, Jeff said, irritation in his voice. But get yourself together. This isn't the end of the world. She removed the phone from her ear, trying to push down the sob ramming up her throat. I hope you're happy. She hung up and screamed as loudly and for as long as she possibly could out of the lake, her voice booming out as echoes answered her back. Sonia didn't know how long she screamed, or when she went inside and started to ugly cry, into a pillow that read, It's better at the cabin. But she did know who drove the familiar police cruiser that pulled up the driveway. Oh, God! She got off the couch when she saw Officer Monahan walking up to the front door. He knocked. Mrs. Whitmore, you home? She almost hid but realized her car sat in the middle of the drive, where he had cleared it off that morning. Of course she was home. Coming! She called out, but raced to the mirror, brushing away the snot coming from her nose and wiping away the wet from her cheeks. She patted down the wisps falling from her messy bun and blew out one long, uneven breath as she headed to the front door. Hello, she said as she opened the door, forcing the biggest smile she could. Good afternoon. Officer Monahan looked straight in her eyes. His expression barely changed, which she was grateful for. How can I help you, Officer Monahan? I got a phone call about a hysterical woman. He made a face. I figured I could just check in. I'm fine, she said to the officer, for what seemed like the hundredth time. I was just having some fun making an echo out there on the water. His eyebrows raised as though she was full of it, but he didn't say anything, which she also appreciated. Were you able to get enough supplies for dinner? She nodded. I have enough because there's a pretty decent pub in downtown Bristol, he said. Little place, but big portions. You'd probably get two meals out of one. I'm good, she smiled, but she couldn't hold her emotions in much longer. This officer had interrupted the breaking dam. Her anger would quickly melt into puddles of tears. Don says you're sticking around for a while, the officer asked. Don't tell John, she joked and tried fake laughing, but it suddenly, without warning and to her fear, turned into a sob. At first he froze, but then stepped forward, putting an arm around her waist and taking her elbow into his hand, and guided her to the living room. Why don't we sit? She covered her face with her hands, crying without really understanding why. She didn't care about the divorce. She didn't care about the other women. She just didn't want to be thrown away. She didn't want her existence to boil down to her being wife number one. The thought of being forgotten made her cry even more. Would this new woman take her place? He led her to the living room. The movement was so smooth, as though he glided her to the seat. I'm so sorry, she said, wiping her face with her palms. It's fine, really. He handed over a box of tissues. Where did you find these? She hadn't seen any tissues this whole time. She waited for him to tell her to calm down. But instead, he faced her and asked, Do you need something? A glass of water? A damp towel? She shook her head. No. I'm mortified. Please understand. I'm not crazy. I'm just going through some things at home. A crease formed between his eyebrows. I don't think you're crazy. She gasped in and out, trying to catch her breath. I'm not usually like this. She continued to cry. I'm usually very calm. 
You had mentioned you're going through a divorce, he said softly. It's all right to be upset. She blew her nose hard. I am upset. I'm really upset because he didn't even say sorry. Sorry for wasting 30 years of my life. Sorry that I'm going to be stuck alone in my 50s. Sorry that I'm not going to have a second shot at having a family like him. Sorry that he tossed me away for something newer and better. She expected the officer to look horror-struck, but he sat down across from her. I wish I had some great advice, but all I can say is that yelling at the lake helps a lot. He gave her a half-smile. She laughed, then sniffled. It's neat to hear the echo. We used to hear people having conversations across the lake sometimes in the winter, when the air's real cold and the lake's completely frozen, he said. She looked at the window, thinking about the lighthouse. When does the lake completely freeze over? she asked. He looked up at the ceiling, scrunching his nose. Maybe in a few weeks, sometimes later. It really depends on the winter. Who's in charge of the lighthouse? Mrs. Cooper. The town runs electricity all the way out to that island. Sonia could understand in the summer months, with boats in and out, but in the winter, too? Yes, he said. Mrs. Cooper lives on the island. Has it always been purple? She asked. He nodded. As long as I can remember. Used to have a bridge to get across, but it got damaged. What happened? A storm came through one winter, and the town said it would be too expensive to fix. Sonia's mouth opened in shock. The town wouldn't fix the bridge for her? Sean shook his head. The town didn't have the money. They offered to buy the property, but she told them she wouldn't sell. Is she alone? Sonia couldn't imagine living all alone on an island in the middle of a great big lake in northern New Hampshire. His brows furrowed. She used to have a family, but it's just her now. He leaned his elbows on his knees and looked at her. How about you join me for dinner tonight? It's nice to get your mind off things, and trivia night's a good time. She immediately started shaking her head back and forth. She wasn't going anywhere besides the couch. I don't think so. Well, feel free to change your mind. You have my card. Officer Monaghan stood, placing his hands on his belt. Do you think he's sitting around? She swung around to face him. Excuse me? He shrugged. I don't know your ex-husband, but he sounds like a ding-dong. Don't miss out on a good burger and good beer for a ding-dong. She could not believe it. Was this man seriously asking her out to dinner? I just literally found out my marriage was over yesterday, and you're asking if I want to have dinner? He held out his hands as if that was the last thing he wanted to do, and she was instantly mortified. Well, not with just me, he said, as though she should have known this fact. It's trivia night, so the whole town will be there. Officer Monaghan, she began. You can call me Sean, he said. Officer Monaghan, she said back, ignoring his request. I apologize if this comes across as rude, but all I would like right now is to be left alone. He smiled and gave her a nod. Okay, glad you're not hysterical. She squeezed her eyes shut at the thought of whoever called her meltdown into the police. Thanks for checking in. She walked him to the door, holding her tissue, though she had stopped crying. Her face had dried, but already she could feel her eyes puffing out. She opened the door, and for a second time that day, Officer Monaghan left the cabin. Sonia did end up leaving the couch. She got up and shut off all the lights, lit a fire, and watched the lighthouse. From her angle, she couldn't see a house. From the satellite photos, she couldn't see anything because of the tree's canopy. Who was this Mrs. Cooper? That's when she saw a figure moving in the moonlight, through the woods toward the lighthouse. 
Sonia grabbed the binoculars and ran to the window, looking out. She couldn't find anything at first, scanning what she could see of the island. But then, just like that, the light went out. Chapter 9 Are you sure you don't mind babysitting? Mateo asked Harper. Of course I don't, Harper said, stepping aside so Mateo could shimmy his way into the boat's cabin. Renee's just so tired with the pregnancy. Mateo passed his son George to Harper as she held out her arms. And she's still training Drake with everything in the bakery. Harper made a concerned face. How's all that going? It's going really well, Mateo said. She couldn't believe the good fortune with Drake's arrival. Biddy's son seemed to fit in right away and was a natural in the bakery. He appeared to know the basics of operating a business and got along with everyone. Where's Andrew? Mateo asked. George pointed to the table. Kitty June. Yes, Kitty is scared right now, Harper said to a sad-faced George. Joan, who on her best days hated everyone, especially disliked little fingers that poked at her. He's with Lila. So what's up with the mother? He asked. Who, Sonia? She asked. Is she always that fun-loving? he said sarcastically. She covered her mouth to prevent herself from laughing. She's really... Mateo stopped, as if he was trying to find the right word. She nodded in seriousness. I know what you mean. Is she always like that? Mateo asked. At the wedding, Sonia's expression looked as though she had been smelling dirty gym socks. She can be very thoughtful, Harper said, but all she had known of her boyfriend's mother was that Sonia, who didn't seem pleased her wonderful son was dating just a writer. It's just that... He looked around the boat as if someone might be hiding under the table with Joan. She's really... Mateo was too nice of a guy to say the truth, so Harper would do it for him. Obnoxious? He let out a breath of relief. Yes. Harper passed him a cup of coffee and sat on the three-by-eight-foot floor of Randy's boat she was renting for the off-season and held on to George as he waddled around, holding on to the cabinets, trying to get to Joan. She still couldn't believe her luck, or really the kindness Andrew's grandfather had shown her, by offering to let her stay on his boat until the summer. She knew her rent had been overly cheap. She paid for the heat and electric. At first, she worried that the smell of a cat would ruin the interior, but the scent of mothballs and stale cigars still lingered from Randy, so she was less concerned. But she understood the underlying issue Mateo hadn't brought up. Even though Sonia and Andrew and Lila had lived on the island full time, just like they did, they weren't considered locals like Mateo and Harper. She's really not that bad when she gets to know her, Harper lied. Sonia had cornered Harper at the wedding reception about getting her degree in fine arts and studying the classics. Do you know what she said to me at the reception? Mateo nodded. Yes, that you should go to college to fine-tune your craft. She clearly hasn't read my book, Harper shrugged. She's nothing like Randy, who's the salt of the earth. At least Andrew seems normal, Mateo said and it made Harper smile. Andrew was normal, considering his family. George bent down and held out his hand and said, Kitty June. Mateo shook his head. Leave Miss Joan alone, okay, little man? Harper couldn't help but watch Mateo with his son. With the way he loved that little boy, no one would know it wasn't his son by blood. He was the perfect father, the perfect husband to Renee, and Harper felt nothing but happiness for her dear friend. Even more happy that things between them had settled back to their old friendship, where they hung out and it wasn't weird. She had missed her bestie. My mom's coming, Harper suddenly confessed. She didn't know why she said something. She hadn't even told Andrew yet. Mateo looked up at her. Really? She began to play with a loose thread from a hole in her jeans. She's coming next week. Where is she staying? He asked. Evelyn is putting her up at the wharf, Harper said. 
If Harper had to come up with one pivotal moment in her life, it would be the day Evelyn had stepped into her father's bookstore. In that moment, her life had changed forever. Not just a stepmother, Evelyn was her mentor, her friend, and her mother all in one. She had become one of the most important people in Harper's life, and she continued to support Harper. One example, paying for Harper's mother to stay for a visit. I don't know what to do with her, Harper said. She didn't even know what to say to her. What would she call her? Mom? Tanya? Woman who gave birth to her and then ran off? You owe her nothing, Mateo sternly reminded her. She has to work at being your mother. Mateo had become more vocal about her mother, which had been extremely helpful. So many people, her father included, tiptoed around her feelings, not wanting to either insult her or make her feel bad. Charlie had said he thought her mother's return to her life was positive. Although she was certain he was nervous and worried and anxious and a million other feelings that weren't positive. She appreciated their reluctance, to be completely honest, but they handled her with kid gloves, which made her feel even more different. They didn't want to hurt her feelings, but she wasn't a child anymore. She was a woman who struggled with understanding how a mother would leave her when no other children that she knew had mothers walk away. She looked at baby George. He'd know. No matter how much love Renee and Mateo and the rest of them gave that boy, he'd always wonder what was wrong with him for his father to leave. You could tell her not to come, he shrugged. She held George loosely under his armpits as he explored the other end of the table. She bought the ticket. Does Andrew know? Mateo asked. She shook her head. She didn't really like talking to Andrew about her mother. Most of the time, people didn't know what to say. Besides, things between him and his own mother were strained. She didn't want to drag in her mess, too because that's what Tanya was, and always would be, a complete mess. Maybe I should cancel the whole thing, she said. If you're fine with seeing her, then you should. But if there's any doubt or hesitation, don't do it just because she wants you to. Mateo sounded so reasonable. She missed his level-headedness. You should decide when you're ready, not her. She lost that privilege. She opened her mouth to confess the recurring thought that had been nagging at her since her mother asked to visit, but she stopped herself. What? he asked. She waved the thought away. It's nothing. I'll just see how I feel when she arrives. I can be the one who chooses to see her or not. Mateo made a face. You know you always have us. I know, she said she suddenly felt a bit more vulnerable than she wanted to. After Charlie's heart attack, she had confessed to Mateo her worries about losing more than just Charlie, but Evelyn and her family as well. Would they want Harper around if Charlie were gone? How is Andrew? he asked. Okay, she said quickly and awkwardly. Mateo grabbed George as he tumbled toward him. You're a good dad, she said. The toddler fell into Mateo's arms, giggling. Thanks. He patted George on the bottom. Uh-oh, I think he's got a dirty diaper. You can change him on the deck, she teased. Mateo picked George up and made an overly shocked look. Did you hear how Auntie Harper would put you on the deck? I'm kidding, she said with a smile. You can change the prince on my bed. She winced as Mateo carried her nephew across the aisle to the bedroom. Thanks, Auntie Harper, Mateo said to her. You positive you don't mind watching him? Just as long as you change him before you head out, she said, her eyes watering as the scent filled the space. She opened the few windows she had. When Mateo finished with the diaper, he passed George off to Harper and left. George looked up at her with sleepy eyes. You want to sleep on a real waterbed? He nestled his head onto her shoulder, sticking his thumb into his mouth. That feeling in her stomach that had been happening more came back. She sniffed the back of his head as she walked into her room, inhaling his baby scent. Do you want to lie on my bed? 
she asked, setting him down. He pointed at Joan with his free hand, then plopped onto the pillows. She pulled out his blanket and wrapped it around him as he continued to suck his thumb. With his favorite book in hand, Harper read to George, staring at him once he was sound asleep, the feeling creeping throughout her whole body. She took a picture and sent it to Andrew. Did he want children? Did she? A couple years ago, she would have said no, but as she studied the perfect boy sleeping next to her, she wasn't so sure. As George slept, Harper typed. Like she predicted, the toddler slept better on the boat than at home. The lull of the boat, the sway of its body in the water, rocked George to sleep and allowed her to write for a while. Over the past few months of living there, Harper finished her second novel faster than she had ever written before, and her editor had loved it. Now she was working on a third, with ideas of a new series. She might even dabble in romance. Kitty, a little voice said. She smiled and looked down at her nephew, who had already rolled over and started sliding off the bed. Be nice, she warned the little boy, shutting her computer. She's an old lady. Joan, who was doing herself no favors, lay on the kitchen table licking her paw. Kitty June. George stretched his neck when he said Joan. Dang, he was cute. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. She grabbed hold of his little hands before scooping Joan up by the belly. Joan didn't move, just kept licking her paw like a dangerous criminal sharpening their knife to give a warning. Stop that, Joan. Joan cried out. Should we go see Mommy? Harper asked George. He took off toward the door, completely forgetting about Joan. Harper's baby fever left after spending 20 minutes wrangling him into his coat, boots, hat, and gloves before he decided to poop. You've got to be kidding me, Harper said, as she began to remove everything. By the time they reached Books and Bread, Harper needed a strong cup of tea. Renee's face brightened the second she saw the two of them walk into the bakery. How was he? Renee asked, taking her son into her arms. Great! Harper smiled at George, who squeezed his arms around Renee's neck. The feeling tugged at her heart again. So when Andrew came into the bakery, her heart was on babies and books, and she didn't notice his rotten mood at first. You know the smell that babies have that somehow just goes away as they age? She said, rambling about her afternoon. Not really. He twisted his cup in his hands. You okay? She asked. Lila said my mom is in New Hampshire, and my dad had no idea, he said. Harper didn't know much about Andrew's parents, but they never seemed to be together, so she didn't really see the big deal. Maybe she wants to be alone. Don't you think it's weird she just took off without telling anyone? He asked. Maybe you should talk to her, she suggested, but by the look on Andrew's face, he wasn't so sure. The rest of the afternoon, he didn't speak much, which made Harper worry. Instead of hanging around like usual, Andrew got his things and said he was leaving. But what about dinner? She asked. They hadn't made official plans, but if he was in town, he'd usually stay for dinner. He shook his head. I'm tired. I'll see you tomorrow. After a soft kiss on the lips, Andrew took off. And so it begins, Harper thought to herself. She should have known things were too good to be true. Happiness didn't last. People didn't stick around for Harper. They left. Chapter 10 People need the ice fishing derby, Mr. Patterson argued over a cup of coffee. It gets people out of their homes after being cooped up all winter. Sorry, Mr. Patterson, but there's no derby this year, Sean said taking a sip of his own coffee. The Derby is a tradition, Mr. Patterson wasn't stopping. You just want to place bets against Dave, John said from behind the counter. I do not, Mr. Patterson said indignantly. It's a great event for the town, brings money to the local businesses like yourself. 
Sean wished he hadn't caved into his craving for John's pancakes that morning. He should have just had his steel oats and gone straight to work. John hadn't even poured the batter onto the griddle before the old guys were fighting about the newest, stupidest thing Vanessa had done, which was to cancel the fishing derby. After last year's debacle of Dave driving his four-wheeler into a snowbank because he'd lost, Sean was pretty sure Vanessa would never allow an ice fishing derby again. Can't you talk to Vanessa about it? Mr. Patterson asked him. That's what the selectmen's meetings are for, he reminded Mr. Patterson. You can ask questions there. John finally poured the batter, and a sizzle hissed out from the stovetop. He could already smell the light, fluffy pieces of cake cooking. But she's your wife, Mr. Patterson said. Sean let out a long breath, purposely dragging it out so he had time to recover before snapping at the old man. He tapped his fingers as he waited for the pancakes, completely ignoring Mr. Patterson's gaff and the man himself. Shawnee boy, she'll listen to you. Mr. Patterson had not read the room. If the man wasn't in his 70s, hadn't been best friends with his dad, he might have laid into him, but he controlled himself. His self-control had been the main reason he still had a job in the small town that had gossiped about the public divorce of the town's police chief and the select woman. Let it go, old man. John said, even though John was only a few years younger than Mr. Patterson. Just because some fisherman was being unsportsmanlike doesn't mean it has to end, Mr. Patterson complained. Sean squeezed his fork, waiting for the pancakes, when the bell rang against the store's front door. He turned to see Mrs. Whitmore walking into the village store. He smiled as she looked to the counter and saw him. She appeared startled to see him there, he waved, and after a second, she waved back. Good morning, he said as she slowly made her way to the counter. We missed you at Trivia. Oh, good morning. She gave him a polite smile, then continued past him down an aisle and out of sight. John flipped a pancake, and the sizzle returned his attention back to his hunger. The ice fishing derby has been a tradition in this town for years. Mr. Patterson wouldn't quit. I'll take those pancakes to go, Sean said. He had enough of the fishing derby and Mr. Patterson. Maybe you could remind your wife that it's been around before she was even alive, Mr. Patterson said. Ex-wife. Sean said it so loudly he surprised himself. He looked and saw Mrs. Whitmore peeking at him through the shelves. Well, you could at least... Talk some sense into her, Mr. Patterson said, not giving up. John swept up the pancakes and tossed them into a to-go container. He handed the box to Sean. Let me get a container for the syrup. Sean shook his head. I'm good. He gave a nod to John and walked toward the door. You all have a nice morning. As he backed into the door to push it open, he watched as Mrs. Whitmore walked up to the counter. Can I get another stack of those famous pancakes? She asked John. He gave her a nod. Pancakes coming right up. Sean looked down at his meal and wished he had stayed put. Something about the beautiful stranger intrigued him. Mr. Patterson turned to her. Who are you? Sean pushed the door open again, backing out. Don't answer him, John said. The man's an idiot. I'm Sonia, Sonia Martin, she said. Sean gave a quick glance at her wedding finger. No large, massive rock hanging from it. Intriguing. As he stepped outside, he was blinded by the sun's reflection off the snow. He threw his sunglasses on right away and jumped into his squad car and headed for the station. He didn't even work on Wednesdays. But what else did he have to do in a town with no crime? What are you doing here? Gail asked him. I could ask the same thing, he said to his assistant, who also didn't work on Wednesdays. I'm looking at my replacement, she said, gruffly handing him a resume. He looked at the name. Brianna sounds young, doesn't it? She's young, just like you once were when you started here. Gail tapped the paper with her readers at the woman's birth date. You should call this one, 
She's got experience in Concord. He sighed. All right, but tomorrow, because today is my day off. He walked into his office and noticed his office phone blinking. That meant he had a non-urgent message. Don't even think about hitting that button to press play. He picked up the receiver and hit the pound key to retrieve the messages. He couldn't help himself. Good evening, Officer Monahan, a woman's voice said. She didn't say her name, but she didn't have to. He recognized Sonia's voice right away. I'm not sure if this is something I should call about or not, but the light on the lighthouse went out last night, and it's still out. You had mentioned a woman takes care of it. Sonia sounded worried, but she'd said nothing when she'd seen him at the village store that morning. He decided to do a quick search on the newcomer, and dozens of articles popped up right away. The words scandal, affair, harassment, and more, all in bold text. He squinted at the small images of fancy events with red carpets. In each photo, Sonia wore the same smile as she held on to the same man. There were other images of a younger woman, usually side by side to Mrs. Whitmore's photo. So, that's the husband, he said to himself, zooming in on one of the images. The guy looked like a jerk. Who is she? He looked up from the computer screen, quickly hitting the X on the tab to see Vanessa standing in the doorway. Who? He asked, praying she hadn't seen who he had been researching. The new woman in town, Vanessa said. His ex-wife was so predictable. She's staying at Dawn's, he said. I thought he was done renting out in the winter she said, sitting down. He waved at the chair. Please, feel free to interrupt my day off. Perfect, then I'm not wasting taxpayers' time, she said, settling into the chair. It's my day off, he said, as if that meant something in a small town. How many nights had they been woken up from neighbors needing help for something he could have slept through? People had come to his house on his time off, for raccoons in garages, teenagers cutting through yards, parties being too loud, all things that could be handled by themselves. So, she asked again. I drove by Mrs. Francis's place, and it looks all cleaned up, he said. Vanessa started to laugh. That's because I shoveled her out. Why would you do that? He could not believe Vanessa. Because I'm the select woman, and when someone doesn't do their job, I get blamed for it, whether he's my idiot brother or not. She crossed her legs. She wore his favorite pair of jeans. Have you talked to Billy? He groaned. I'm not talking to him about plowing or shoveling or anything that has to do with you two. He was serious this time. He was done playing middleman for a guy that was always a pain in the rear most of his life even if he was his friend. Please, Sean, she said, giving him the look that made him weak in the knees and which she only gave when she needed him. He took in a deep breath, thinking about what the guys had said. No. Are you kidding me right now? She swung her legs around and stood up, one fist hooked on her hip, her other hand pointing a finger at her chest. I don't ask for favors very often, Sean. You owe me, Sean huffed. How long are you going to play that card? You picked me up at the bar one time after a few too many. I'm done doing favors. Billy is going to be fired, she said, her voice softer. Fine, he shrugged, making a point of looking at her. Maybe he'll learn that in order to get paid, you have to follow through with doing your job. Vanessa sat back in her chair. Please, Sean. He couldn't help but look. Vanessa's gray eyes hooked him. She held his stare for longer than he'd like to admit. And when he came back to reality, he swiped up his keys and gave a wave. I'm going fishing, he said. Fishing, she said, getting up from her chair. You hate ice fishing. He did 
but he needed a way to check in on Mrs. Cooper. Then, begrudgingly, he said, I can swing by Billy's and have a talk with him. Vanessa smiled as soon as he said it. Thank you, Sean. He'll listen to you. But as Vanessa gave her attention to Gail and the two started chatting, Sean grumbled quietly to himself. Billy wouldn't listen to him. If Billy listened, then he wouldn't be in this situation. I'm out, he said, as the ladies giggled about something Rick Garland had done at the last town meeting. They didn't even wave or say goodbye as he left the station, just continued to laugh and ignored him. After picking up his fishing gear and dusting it off, he set out for Billy's place. Luckily, Billy's truck wasn't there, and no one seemed to be home. He left feeling good that he'd tried, but had no plans to put any future effort toward finding him. He headed to Mrs. Cooper's place next. The island where she lived wasn't far out from the shore, unlike some islands on bigger lakes like Winnipesaukee or Squam, where its residents had to travel a mile or more to get there. The 14-acre island was maybe a couple hundred yards out and had been tethered to the mainland by a one-way bridge, which had been destroyed after the huge snowstorm of 02. Usually his job was to keep teenagers from swimming out to the island and jumping off the ledges or performing seances. Travel across the lake in January tended to be tricky. The ice wasn't completely ready to walk across, especially where Harmony Creek flowed into the lake. But Sean had been traveling to Mrs. Cooper's house, bridge or not, for 50 years. Danny Cooper had been his best friend until he died that winter. Mrs. Cooper had been like a second mother to him up until that point. He backed into the parking spot and began digging out the launch for his aluminum motorboat. The lake had ice, but only a thin layer, and with a crowbar he broke through enough to drop the boat in. Mrs. Cooper's house wasn't more than a couple hundred yards from shore, but he'd have to nudge the bow through some of the ice to get to the island. He didn't like to travel on the lake during this time of year, but if Mrs. Cooper's light was out, then he needed to check on things. In a life jacket, he set off to the island, breaking the ice as he reached the shore. The lighthouse didn't have the light on, but it was also day. Did Mrs. Cooper leave the light on all day and night? He couldn't remember, which felt strange. He would have known the answer when Danny was alive. In town, a lot of the snow had melted from the storm, but on the island, it looked as though the snow had just swung through that morning. Pine tree branches drooped low from the snow's weight, glistening every twig and needle in crystals as the sun peeked over the mountains. For the first time in a long time, Sean inhaled a deep, long breath. He had forgotten how much he missed spending time on the remote and hardly touched island. There were only his and Ricky's foot-beaten trails. Were they even still there, or had time grown over them? Sean pulled the boat through the shoulder of ice along the granite edge, but knew in a few months the trek would become more difficult. The island sat at the mouth of Harmony Creek, which flowed into the lake all winter long. The creek never allowed the lake to fully freeze in the area, except for the year when the beaver had built the dam. Other than that, what looked like a solid cover of ice was, in fact, a very weak layer with a rushing current underneath. Too many people throughout the years came to the lake for winter sports and ice fishing, and too many didn't know how dangerous the area could be one of the reasons why Mrs. Cooper had built the lighthouse in the first place. Mrs. Cooper probably never imagined she'd have to use the light from it to find her own son. Mrs. Cooper always kept that light on. Always. Through snow, sleet, and rain, that light was on. He turned back around and looked out across the lake at Don's cabin. He could see Sonia Whitmore standing on the cabin's long deck looking out toward him. He drudged his feet through the snow and up the hill to the house. The cottage sat on the other side of the island, over the hill. He didn't smell smoke or see any coming out of the chimney. Would Mrs. Cooper need the wood stove running with the sun as bright as it was? Mrs. Cooper! He called out from the fence left over from the old driveway when there had been a bridge. It's Sean checking in! Nothing but the wind blowing. Then he heard a dog bark. 
He couldn't tell if it had been an echo or if it had come from Mrs. Cooper's house. He didn't see any dog prints in the snow. He heard the bark again. Cutting through the front yard, he went straight to the front door and knocked hard. Mrs. Cooper, it's me, Sean. I'm here to see if you made out all right with the storm. The dog barked louder, and soon its snout hit the window. He waited and listened for Mary, but it was just the black lab who stood on its hind feet looking at him through the door's window, no longer barking. Mrs. Cooper! He knocked louder, peering through the window. Nothing appeared out of the ordinary as he scanned the property. In fact, he would have sworn he stepped back in time forty years, when all he cared about was trading baseball cards and catching fish. He knocked one more time, the dog now sitting on the floor in front of the door and wagging his tail, but still no Mary. He walked around the house, peeking into the windows he could see through. Just as he reached the back of the house, he saw footsteps and dark stains in the snow. When he got closer, he could see the stains were blood. That's when he heard a muffled cry. Help! Sean opened the door, and lying on the floor was Mrs. Cooper in her pajamas, a winter coat, and boots. Her head lay in a pool of blood, and her leg twisted behind her in an unnatural angle, her eyes wide in fright. I'm getting help right now. He pulled out his phone and made a call. I can't leave, her eyes pleaded with him. I can't leave without Shadow. Chapter 11 Ta-da! Andrew said, removing his hands from Harper's eyes. He held his hands up to a brick building and said, Well, what do you think? Harper blinked up at the traditional brownstone and didn't know what to think. I love the architecture. She hoped that was the answer Andrew had been looking for, but by the look on his face, she wasn't entirely sure it was. It's for sale, he said. Oh, she looked back at it. She wondered how much something like that would cost. How much is it worth? Andrew grabbed her hand. I'd like to buy a place for us. Harper swung her head at him. What? Yeah, you, me, and Joan, he said, swinging her hand. It's a perfect location. You can't find a place like this in the city very easily. She stared at the brick building. It was the type of building she had only seen on television or in movies. Someone like Harper didn't live in fancy brownstones on fancy named streets in cities like Boston. She lived above restaurants and bookstores. I can't afford this, she said. She had a little money from her book, but she needed to hold on to that in case her second book was a flop. I want to do this for us, he said. It's perfect. Right off Commonwealth. Harper could feel Andrew's excitement. His face glowed as he stared at the property on the perfect street. But as Harper looked around, the perfect location made her senses go into overdrive. Instead of hearing the Atlantic waves lulling her into tranquility and a feeling of calm, traffic distracted her and made her jittery every time she heard a honk or a screech, and it all made Harper's anxiety rise. It's two bedrooms, two baths, he said but she could hardly hear what he was saying from the noise inside and outside her head. Why wasn't she happy? This had been a moment she had been dreaming about her whole adult life. How many nights had she stayed awake, worrying someone might not love her? Scared she might not find that someone who'd want to take care of her. Now she had that someone, and she was worried about traffic? You don't look like you like this place. Andrew made a face of disappointment, and her heart dropped. I'm just not used to the city, she looked up at the building. I should see inside. He grabbed her hand and took her up the steps where he pressed a call button. As they walked in, she counted the apartments inside the building. Six. That's five new neighbors. Five new people she'd likely run into if she left her home. Five absolute strangers. He opened the door and let her inside first. The apartment sparkled along every surface. The historical building had been completely modernized into a sleek, clean, minimalist style. The brick was exposed along most of the walls, 
with open shelves above the shiny black granite countertops. The dark wood floors looked new and hard to keep clean. They had talked about moving in together, taking the next step. But this felt sudden. But what is sudden, anyway? So? he asked as she walked silently through the rooms. The place had a similar vibe to the apartment she grew up in, long, with the bedrooms on one end and the kitchen on the other. The space was surprisingly bright, despite not having many windows, but she noticed all the lights had been turned on. She ran her finger along the shiny granite countertops. The apartment must cost a fortune. I thought we were going to look for places together, she said. And locations. Andrew stuffed his hands into his pockets. I brought you here so we could look together. But right in downtown Boston? She heard shouting from outside. Andrew shrugged. I thought we could look. Maybe we should look at places I can afford, she said, noticing the brand names on all the appliances. I'll pay for it, he said. But Harper knew even the Boston Globe didn't pay their writers that kind of money. This money came from somewhere else. She shook her head. No, I don't want to do that. Andrew's eyebrows furrowed. Is it the place? Or is it moving in with me? The question took Harper by surprise. What? But he didn't say it again. Instead, he stared at her. Of course I want to move in with you, she said. But she immediately felt guilty, because the truth was, she wasn't sure. She loved Andrew, but things were moving fast, which was fun and exciting, but it also made her panicky and nervous. I don't want to pressure you into something you don't want. I just thought you needed to find a place, and we've been going back and forth to the island. I know, Harper shook her head. I'm sorry. It's just that I'm not sure if I want to leave the island. Andrew made a face. I can't move the globe to the island. Maybe a place closer to Falmouth, by the ferry, she said. I would miss out on so much if we were this far away. I'll be in traffic all day. Can't you write from the island and go to the city when you need to? So, like it is now? He made a face she couldn't read. Was he mad or sad or both? Or worse, had she disappointed him? Let's forget about it and have dinner, he said, looking away from her. Her heart dropped. Please don't be mad. I'm not, he said, but he didn't make eye contact. Come on, Andrew, she said, trying to get him to look at her. She poked him in the stomach playfully, trying to lighten the mood. He didn't flinch. It's fine. We can look at other places, he said. She nodded. Andrew grabbed the door, then stopped and turned to her. You do want to look at other places, right? Her thumb went to her mouth, a telltale sign she didn't know what to say, and Andrew's face fell the second it reached her teeth. His hand fell from the doorknob. Harper, do you want to move in with me? Yes, I do. But I... She stopped herself as the frown deepened on his face. I just can't imagine leaving the island. I'm sorry. I know you have your dream job, and I'm the one who can pack up and move anywhere. But I've never left the island or my dad, and he's just had his heart attack. Andrew walked to her, but looked timid to come too close. Are you sure that's really it? She stepped back, surprised he questioned her. Of course that's it. Okay he said, but he wasn't convincing at all. I do want to move in together, she said. She did, right? She wanted to live with Andrew, but on the island. Is it because we're not married? he asked. Because we can get married today. I'm ready. She smiled at him. Andrew had proposed the first night she'd kissed him. She didn't say no, but she didn't say yes either. Each time he brought it up, she'd laugh or pretend not to hear him. Truthfully, 
She wasn't sure if she should ever get married. She still hadn't told him that her mother was coming to town. How could she marry him? She knew it would be better for him to live in the city with his work schedule, but she couldn't sacrifice. Was that a sign she was just as selfish as her mother? Tanya couldn't ever sacrifice her happiness for the happiness of someone else. What if we look at beach rentals, he suggested. I bet there will be something that becomes available in Cliffside Point. She knew nothing she could afford would just pop up in the most expensive neighborhood in their tiny seaside village. She studied his face, wondering if he understood how very different they were. How fortunate he had been, never having to worry about rent or where he would live. He got to look at the perfect spot in one of the most expensive cities in the country. Why didn't she tell Andrew her mother was coming? She told Mateo. She told Harper and Evelyn and Charlie and almost Lila, but didn't tell Andrew. He looked longingly at the kitchen and sighed. This place is going to go fast. You should get this place for you, she blurted out before she knew what she was saying. What? he said sharply. She shrugged, unable to stop herself. I mean, you said it was perfect, and it's close to your work, and it's going to go fast. But you don't like it, he said. She played with her fingers, twisting them around one another. I'm never going to be able to afford to live the way you want. He shook his head. So? She let out a long breath. He didn't get it. I can't live off your parents' money. I don't want to be tied to someone I'm not related to. Harper, it's my money, he said. I earn money from my work. She looked around the apartment, which was easily seven figures or more. Andrew, the Boston Globe doesn't pay you that well. I'm a writer too, remember? Evelyn lives in a beach house on Martha's Vineyard, he argued, and she could see he didn't get it. Andrew, she looked at him. I don't want to ever live off anyone, even you. He shifted his posture as if her comet had struck him. Wow, okay. I guess you'd rather live on a boat with your cat than have your boyfriend pay for more than your share of the mortgage. Her heart pumped hard, and her mind screamed at her to stop being ridiculous. She needed to close her mouth and not say another word, but her ego took control. Don't let me prevent you from getting your perfect place, she said, adjusting the strap to her purse. Joan doesn't like the city anyway. He pressed his fingers against the bridge of his nose. Harper, what's going on? She drew back her neck, lifting her chin in defiance. Nothing's wrong. I just don't feel the vibes here. Andrew's eyebrows lifted. You know I love you, right? Tears stung the back of her eyes, and her temper tantrum started to become ridiculous, even to her. I know. She looked away. This wasn't about the apartment. She should just tell him about her worries. Tell him about how his family situation scared her. How his father bothered her. How her own mother couldn't even stick around. He reached out and grabbed her hand, squeezing it with his. She held it, the words on the tip of her tongue. But she held back as he opened the door and walked her out. Chapter 12 When the ambulance and fire truck arrived outside Don's cabin, along with police and a rescue boat, Sonia went outside and headed over to the scene. What if the person who lived there had died? What if they lost power and froze to death, and Sonia sat and watched all night? She only left a message. She should have called 911 right away and took the shot of appearing crazy. She should have told Officer Monaghan when she'd seen him at the village store. But then she felt as though she would be bothering him while off duty. From across the lake... She saw two men rowing an aluminum boat across the open water, while Officer Monaghan held what looked like the woman in his arms, wrapped in a blanket. 
As they reached the shore, the rest of the medics pulled the boat to shore, helping Officer Monaghan out of the boat with the woman, then lifting her out of his arms and onto a portable stretcher. After strapping her down, the medics rushed her to the ambulance, closed the door, and got inside. The lights flashed and the siren blared as the emergency vehicle took off down the street. Officer Monaghan ran to his car and followed behind, his own lights and siren on. Sonia felt sick as she stood there in the cold while the rest of the emergency crew packed up and got the boat out of the water. Is the woman okay? She asked a young-looking police officer. Looks like a pretty bad fall, he said. Her stomach dropped. Oh, no. He went back to the scene, packed up the life vests, and put them into the boat. She felt sick to her stomach all afternoon as she waited by the window, staring out at the lighthouse. It wasn't until the afternoon when she noticed a police cruiser coming down the road. She recognized the vehicle right as he pulled up the driveway. Is she okay? She asked as she met Officer Monahan in the driveway. He nodded. She took a nasty fall, hitting her head and breaking a few bones. She's in critical condition right now. I should have called 911 right away, she said, rubbing her neck. He shook his head. She's lucky you noticed and said something. She didn't feel so sure. If only she had called right away. She looked up at him to apologize again when she noticed how exhausted he appeared, even a little sad. Would you like some coffee? She offered. He held up his hands. No, thank you. I just came by to thank you for calling about Mrs. Cooper. Sonia didn't usually like getting involved. In fact, she lived on the principle of not getting involved in other people's business. Maybe if she got involved more, she would have seen her husband's affairs before they made her look like a fool. Or if she got involved in her daughter's life, she might have stopped her from wasting time with her ex-fiancé. Sonia may not have heard the rumors, but Andrew had warned her about Joel, and she chose to ignore his warnings because she didn't want to get involved. What would things be like now if she had listened? Where is she? Sonia asked. Mrs. Cooper? He looked at her funny. She's in Plymouth. She didn't know where that was in relation to where she was, but the GPS would lead her there. Does she need anyone to contact her family? She asked, but realized how silly that sounded standing with the police. He shook his head. She has no family. Sonia's mouth dropped. She has no family? Would her children come if she had fallen? Drive to New Hampshire to help her? Probably not. Lila's head was in the clouds in love, and Andrew was too busy with his career and his own new relationship. Melodramatic. That's what Jeff had said about her that she was being melodramatic about Joel coming for Christmas. Don't you think you're being a bit melodramatic right now? Jeff had said before leaving for Palm Beach, so condescending she almost left him right then. Joel is a good kid. That's when she knew she didn't love him anymore. How could she? He thought Joel, the man who had cheated on his daughter, was a good kid. Sonia slowed her speech just enough to appear poised and in control, squeezing her hands into fists. If you want to save this family, then you will stay here and apologize to your daughter. Sonia wouldn't stand next to him any longer. Not when he hurt his daughter like that. It was one thing when he didn't take her on as an associate at the firm, but to invite the man who broke his daughter's heart to Christmas? And for what? To lose his daughter and continued to make a mockery of their family? Jeff left that night without apologizing or saying goodbye. She wondered if there was a woman in his bed right now. Sonia shook her thoughts away. I should go and see what I can do to help, Sonia said. We'll take it from here, but thanks, Officer Monahan said. We? Didn't you say she didn't have any family? He cocked his head at her. Did you meet Mrs. Cooper? She shook her head. 
he must be wondering about her situation. First, she's running away from her ex-husband. Now she's wanting to help a recluse who lives on an island she's never met before. He must think she's insane. I used to be a volunteer at a hospital, she said, as if that explained things. I'm good at hospitals. He scowled at the comment. I don't like anything about hospitals. It might be nice for her to have a visitor. Sonia had seen patients deteriorate with no visitors or human interaction. Does she need someone to take care of the lighthouse? Do not go over there to work the lighthouse, he ordered, his voice stern. It took her by surprise, and she felt embarrassed. I just want to help. It's dangerous, he said. It's why there's a lighthouse in the middle of winter. There's open water by the creek, which never allows the ice to get thick enough to freeze. But a lot of people who don't know what they're doing, he paused and looked right at her, get into trouble. Hence, the lighthouse. And Mrs. Cooper's taken care of it? Sonia could think of better people to run such an important safety warning than an elderly woman. She's the one who built it. Sonia thought about her wish to travel across the ice to the lighthouse. She could have very well been one of those stupid people who didn't know what they're doing. Does she live there all year? Does she have pets? He nodded. I'm going back now to get her dog. Alone? She looked horrified. On the lake? Isn't that really dangerous? She reminded him of his own words. I'm going on the boat. He pointed to a boat hitched on the back. I'll go with you, she said. I just need to change my boots. She hadn't had time to get to the store, but she did find another closet where Don had left some semi-decent snow boots. You can't go with me, he said. Stay here. Thanks for the call. I'll keep you updated on Mrs. Cooper's condition. I'm going, she said, not taking no for an answer. I can't just sit by and not help. Yes, it's called vacation and you're supposed to be on it, he said. This is police business. She shook her head. I'm not on a vacation. She opened her mouth to say something, but closed it again. What was this situation even considered? She looked at the officer and said, You're not going alone. No one should go on the water, especially in this cold, alone. She crossed her arms and stared at him. I'll be fine. Then call in someone else to help, but I'm not going to let you go alone. She didn't know why she was being so pushy. She usually didn't care what people did. It'll make me feel better knowing I helped. He squinted his eyes, partly at the sun's rays, but also, she felt, at how crazy she sounded. Like he needed to get a look for himself if she was stable. He lifted his hands into the air. You know, if something happens... Then it's not official police business, she said, shrugging. I'm going on a friendly boat ride to an island. He sighed. Fine, but you have to wear a life vest, he ordered. She nodded. Let me grab some warm clothes. He groaned as she ran back inside the cabin. A nervous and excited energy ran through her veins as she grabbed the set of boots and a scarf. She also grabbed a pair of leather gloves along with a knitted hat. As Sonia ran out of the house, Officer Monaghan had already made his way to the shoreline of the boat launch. He stood in the mound of snow, which made her hesitate. Maybe she should listen to him and stay back. As much as she said she wanted to help, and she did, there was also a tiny bit of adventure she had been seeking. She wanted to see that lighthouse. But what if the boat capsized? She didn't do well in most situations, and hypothermic swimming didn't seem like the kind of thing she'd do well. She'd probably drag both of them under. Is it dangerous? She asked as she climbed through the path he created with his body through the snow. Only if you stand up and jump out, he said, passing over a life vest. Sit in the middle and you'll be fine. She nodded, putting the orange vest around her neck and strapping it on tight. 
He extended his hand to her as she climbed into the boat and helped her move inside. Gripping the sides, she carefully managed to get to the middle seat and sat down, as the boat swayed from side to side. Officer Monaghan expertly made his way to the back of the boat, where a small motor sat. I haven't been on a small boat like this in years, she said, not sure why she was sharing this with him. How long had it been since she had been on a boat like this? Not since she'd been a little girl, when her father would take her fishing with him. Then he became a judge and never took her again. Be careful, he said, starting the engine. He backed out into the water and slowly made his way across to Mrs. Cooper's island. The small island looked much bigger the closer the boat came to shore. On one end, the island stood tall with flat-faced ledges of granite. Pines grew out of the top of the gray rock, and some were growing through crevices and clinging to the sides. On the other end, the island sloped down long and low, as though someone had stretched it out. The lighthouse, which looked small and more like a garden decorative than a full working lighthouse from the cabin, stood over a story high. Mrs. Cooper built the lighthouse? Sonia asked, amazed at the construction. Like most New England rock walls, the stones used for the lighthouse were mismatched shapes and sizes, but the masonry was impeccable, like a puzzle perfectly placed together. As the boat rounded the tiny peninsula where the lighthouse sat, that's when she saw Mrs. Cooper's house. Hidden within the trees, a small two-story with the porch wrapped all along the front of the house. It's purple, Sonia said. Mm-hmm, Officer Monaghan said. Ugly, Sonia thought as she stared at the house, baffled by the choice in color. Who would paint their house purple? Especially such an ugly purple like eggplant. She shook her head as she checked out the lavender trim and teal door. Who was this Mrs. Cooper? Officer Monaghan steered the boat to a large granite boulder. We'll have to climb out here. She could see where they must have had to break the ice to get to shore. It looked as though no one had lived there at all. A dock stood covered in a thick layer of snow, with no signs of anyone coming or going. There was no visible path around or to the house, just shadows against the white snow from the trees. No indentations from any kind of footprint, animal or human. Are there any animals besides her dog, like squirrels and things? She asked, feeling silly thinking about Martha's vineyard, which did have plenty of wildlife. Yeah, small ones. I haven't been on the island in a while, he said, shutting off the motor. He took a rope from behind him and stood slowly before climbing out carefully onto the rock. He walked up to a tree and tied the rope, looping it into a knot Sonia remembered her brother doing as a kid when he'd been a Boy Scout. Have you lived here long? Sonia wondered if this was off limits. Should a civilian be asking these kinds of questions? Or would he think she was flirting? All my life, he said, walking back toward the boat. I left for a bit, went to college out of state, but came back to work here. Would you like me to stay in the boat? She asked. He put his hands on his hips and looked around. It's pretty cold out here, and I'd like to take a look around to make sure everything is okay. Why don't you come and sit in Mrs. Cooper's kitchen? She had secretly wanted to walk to the lighthouse. Should we fix the light in the lighthouse? She asked. He looked behind him, where the light would be if they could see it through the trees. He nodded. I'll take a look at it before we go. He reached out his hand as she stood slowly in the boat. But she didn't take it, instead holding on to the side and climbing over. Only the rock slanted more than she bargained for and threw her balance off. Her feet stumbled to catch a grip, and she flung out her arms to regain balance. Like a superhero coming to the rescue, Officer Monaghan stepped right up to her and took hold of her, his hand on her waist effortlessly pulling her into a balanced position. His large hands were steady and left an energy after he let go, and Sonia breathless. Okay, he asked. Then he pointed to the cabin. We'll go in the side door. Sonia nodded, trying to compose herself. 
Why did she suddenly feel like a teenager back in high school with the cute boy? Sure, no problem. They climbed off the rock and dropped into the snow. A few feet of powdery snow had accumulated in between hemlocks and maples. Sonia's feet became numb as they plowed through it, up the small hill toward the purple house. I bet it was a wonderful place to grow up. He looked at the house and took in a breath. It had been, yes. The answer threw her off. You grew up here? He shook his head. No, but my best friend did. I practically lived here as a kid. He kept walking through the snow, knowing right where to step. Sonia followed behind, sinking in places and tripping on hidden bumps and dips in the ground. When was the last time she had been out walking in the woods? She hardly walked the beach, afraid she'd run into someone. Afraid of what they'd think or say or gossip about her. Afraid she might come off wrong for Jeff. No more Jeff, she thought. She wouldn't have to be afraid of what he thought. Yeah, right. Sonia always worried about what Jeff thought. Whether or not she was a good enough wife, or mother, or party planner, or cook, or housekeeper, or daily activity director, nothing ever seemed good enough for Jeff, especially when it came to the twins. She didn't raise Lila strong enough, ladylike enough, athletic enough, smart enough, independent enough, dependent enough. Nothing made Jeff happy when it came to raising their daughter. Andrew had been the child that could do nothing wrong in Jeff's eyes. Yet any time Andrew went against Jeff's wishes, it had always been because she'd made him too soft or a mama's boy. Maybe she had. Andrew had always loved being by her side, and they enjoyed many of the same things. But her relationship with Andrew had been something Jeff had always been a bit jealous of. Jeff knew inviting Joel would upset Andrew. He knew it would break his son's heart, because that's what Jeff Whitmore did. He shoved his power in others' faces. They reached the side of the house, and the first thing she saw were footprints. Dog footprints, people footprints, lots and lots of different boot-shaped footprints. Then droplets of blood scattered in the white snow. She climbed the steps to the sliding glass door and noticed stone statues and artwork in what must have been a garden underneath. A pink gazebo with purple and lavender spindles sat close to the shore. The view of the lake from this vantage point was incredible. Mountains towered in the distance, with the lake spanning for miles. A white blanket covered most of the lake, but out in the middle, reflections of the sun bounced off the last of the open water. This is amazing, she said, breathless. It's my favorite view, he said, stopping to look out. A bald eagle! She pointed out to the dot in the sky. Floating in the sky above, the majestic eagle soared in the wind. There's a nest over across the lake. He slid open the door. Isn't it locked? She asked as he stepped inside. He shook his head. Nope. She followed behind him. Suddenly, as he turned the doorknob, a huge black mass jumped against the glass and barked. Shadow, it's just me, Officer Monaghan said, shushing the dog as he opened the door. The dog instantly jumped around, backing up, but hyper and happy as if Officer Monaghan was a friend. The dog whined as it pushed itself into Officer Monaghan's legs, wagging its tail, maybe telling the officer what had happened. Let's go outside, he said opening the door and letting the dog out. The dog didn't hesitate and raced out onto the porch and off into the snow. You'll need to remove your shoes, he said, as he removed his own shoes. It felt strange seeing an officer of the law standing in socks and showing her socks in front of him. What had she put on anyway? Footwear on a man told their status more than anything, she thought. It reflected a man's wealth in a way only few things could. The type of footwear, the design, the designer, the wear, the tear. So much could be told about a person. Jeff had impeccable taste, because she had impeccable taste. Her mother had impeccable taste. Yet, when it became about status and wealth, Jeff lost touch with taste. 
big, bold, and bright had become Jeff's taste. Sonia looked down to see Officer Monaghan's brightly colored wool socks. They looked like a pair her mother would have knitted if she were still alive, loud and obnoxious. Do you knit? she asked, teasing. He looked down at his feet. My mother knit. He pointed to the table. Make yourself comfortable. I'll be as quick as I can. He left the kitchen and walked into another room of the house before disappearing around the corner. She went to go sit when she stopped to look at the wall filled with what looked like a child's artwork collection. The name Danny scribbled on the bottom of all of them. A crayon drawing of a family of stick people. A portrait made from charcoal. A landscape of what she guessed to be the lake from pastels. Then a watercolor of the purple house. All with Danny on the bottom. All the pieces had been matted and put into glassed wooden frames. Rounding the corner, Officer Monaghan walked toward the staircase. Is Danny her son? she asked. He wrinkled his eyebrows together and with a quick nod said, Yes. Do you still keep in touch? she asked. He shook his head. He died when we were thirteen. Oh. Her heart dropped, and she tried to calculate the time. The officer looked around her age, early fifties, she guessed. She looked back at the thirty-plus-year-old pieces of artwork completely differently, imagining the poor family and the nightmare they endured. She didn't know what it was like to lose a child, but imagined it being unbearable. Staring at the family drawing, she could see a father figure, a mother figure, a small boy figure, and a dog figure. An only child. Officer Monaghan left the kitchen and went up the back staircase, as Shadow followed Sonia as she checked to see if there was dog food for her. She noticed a bowl of water next to an empty bowl. Let's get some fresh water, she said to the dog, whose eyes melted Sonia's heart. With a fresh bowl of water and a scoop of kibble, Sonia moved to the kitchen table when she heard footsteps coming down the back staircase. Officer Monaghan carried a small bag in one hand and set it onto the table. Would you mind going through her things and find her personal belongings for the hospital? He asked. I don't feel right going in there myself. And since you're a lady, I just figured it'd be less intrusive. He looked nervous asking her, which surprised her. The officer seemed so confident with everything else. Talking to her seemed the least concerning for him. Of course, she said, taking the bag into her hands. How long will she be at the hospital? He shook his head. I don't know. At least a few days. Just grab enough for her to feel comfortable with some of her own things. She understood what he meant and nodded. Show me the way. He led her up the back stairs and down a narrow corridor to the other end of the house. She had to duck, the ceiling hung so low. But then he brought her inside the last room, and her jaw dropped. This is her bedroom? she asked, staring out the wall of windows, looking out at the most spectacular view of the lake. This is incredible. Right, well, I'll go and check out the lighthouse, he said. She held up her hand as he turned to go back down the hall. Officer Monaghan! Sean, he said, facing her. You can call me Sean now that we've talked about women's undergarments. She smiled at his humor. I would love to see the lighthouse. Would you mind if I come along? He wrinkled his brow again. It's just that I've seen it from the cabin, and, well, I'd love to see it up close. Then she could go back home and face the music. Her job would be done here. Besides, what was she waiting around for? Jeff wasn't coming back. She didn't want him to. So why was she running? Okay, I'll wait, he said. I'm going to get shadow stuff together. She smiled. Great, thanks. She made her way to the dresser and opened the top drawer and like she suspected, found socks and underwear. Without much thought, she grabbed what sat on top and placed them into the bag. She pulled out two nightgowns, a pair of long johns, a plain white turtleneck, a sweatshirt, slippers she found underneath the bed, 
and a bathrobe that hung on the back of the bathroom door. She also grabbed a toothbrush, toothpaste, and a hairbrush. When she left the room, she noticed a boy's bedroom across the hall. Posters of Red Sox players that she remembered as a kid hung on the walls. It was like stepping back in time, into her brother's room. Ben hardly visited the island anymore. It had to be five, maybe six years since he'd come. Her big brother would have done anything for her when they were kids. Always the protector, even after he'd married Meredith, he continued to watch over her. Then entered Jeff, and everything changed. No longer did Ben need to protect her. Ben never really cared for Jeff, but it wasn't until the allegations started coming out that he really hated him. Why are you staying with him? Ben had spoken as though he was disgusted by her decision to stay and fight for her marriage. I have children to think about, she'd said. Jeff promised her he'd take everything, including them. He was the attorney. He knew the law. The good old boys protected men like Jeff. You and the kids can come and stay with me and Meredith, he'd said. But the offer was more courtesy than a genuine invitation. Her parents had been as supportive as Randy and Linda could be. As devoted Catholics, her parents' marriage had been more of a partnership than true love. Their marriage had been everything she had wanted. Stability and comfort, knowing you had each other forever. But Jeff had been devoted to nothing but himself. She looked back into the room, thinking about Andrew. Would he devote himself to this new girl, Harper? Or had he inherited Jeff's cavalier attitude when it came to her? He had never kept a girlfriend longer than a few months, never introduced someone as a girlfriend, and never had her come to the house to meet the family. This one had been different right from the start, but so different she wasn't sure which way it would go, horribly bad or beautifully romantic. Opposites attract, they say, and for her and Jeff, it had been good at first. His loud and bold personality had been countered with her calm and reserved nature. The sharp-dressed, quick-talking attorney and his lovely, sophisticated wife, like a Jack and Jackie, a match made for big things. Or at least, that's what Jeff had always said. We're going to be the power couple in this city. You just see, he'd said. Her heart jumped at the thought of what lay ahead for her now. Because for the first time in Sonia's life, she had nothing and no one to protect her. Chapter 13 Harper sat on the boat, waiting for Lila to come, but didn't know what she was going to say. I need to break up with Andrew, she said to Joan. I can't keep him hanging on when I don't want to get married. I mean, I'm the last person who should get married, right, Joan? She paced the three-by-five-foot galleyway in the boat she lived on thanks to Andrew. Homeless, she said. We're going to be homeless again. She sat at the table in the booth seat and held her head in her hands. Things had been going so well. Why hadn't she said yes to the apartment? Why did staying on the island matter so much? Or was she trying to ruin things on purpose, like Jones suggested through her gnarly meows? I think I might pack. She had been speaking to Joan, so when someone said, Pack? Where are you going? She jumped. Dad? She turned around to see Charlie standing on the back deck at the door. She opened it and let him in from her seat. What are you doing here? She asked, letting him step inside before getting up. Can I get you something to drink? He shook his head. I'm good, thanks. Where's Evelyn? She asked, looking at the door. Back home, he said. I got the go-ahead to drive and thought I'd see my favorite daughter. I'm your only daughter, she reminded him. Yes, well, you're special nonetheless. He placed his hands on the table. So what's been going on with you? You should be home on your honeymoon with your wife, she said, still surprised by the unannounced visit. She wanted to write, so I thought I'd give her some alone time he said. He drummed his hands on the table. How are you doing? 
Fine. Something felt off, but she couldn't place it. I'm just thinking about doing some of my own work. She hadn't written since before she left Andrew in the city. He had called and they'd pretended that everything was still the same. But she could feel a shift take place. He didn't stay on the line and talk. Instead, he had to let her go to get things done for work. He'd said all the right things, and she had tried to pretend the other day hadn't happened. But something did happen. And it wasn't good. Her father removed his winter coat and set it in the booth, then slid in. Tanya called. Ah, she thought. It was more than just a visit. And? And she's not coming. Her throat tightened with anger, an annoying habit she'd had since she was a little girl. Oh? Charlie gave her the look, the one that said he knew exactly how she felt. He felt it too. Tanya had broken his heart enough times to understand. But this time it was different somehow. She knew it wasn't fair, but having Evelyn in his life made it different. He wasn't hurt by Tanya for him. He felt sympathy, but he didn't empathize any longer. He was different. He no longer loved Tanya. But she did. It's fine, she said, getting up and walking to the fridge, pretending to look for a Diet Coke, but buying some time to get herself together. It's probably better. It wasn't. It felt much, much worse. I'm really sorry, Harp. He said it sincerely. She could tell he wanted to break their rule, to say something negative. But Charlie was too much of a stand-up guy to drag someone down, even if it was Tanya. She doesn't understand how much it means to you. She called you? She said, shutting the fridge. He nodded. It's funny how so much has changed that I thought maybe she would, too. Harper kept her voice even keel. No alarming octave changes, no wobbly crying voice. She kept it cool so far. Harper needed to change the subject. Do you know of any available apartments? Charlie made a face. I thought you liked the boat. She leaned against the counter. She liked the boat more than anything, but she couldn't stay on Andrew's grandfather's boat forever, especially when Andrew was going to get sick of her at some point. Nobody stuck around. He'd find the kind of woman who'd love to move into a fancy brownstone in Boston. The kind of woman who'd love to get married and have a litter of kids and drive them to soccer. Joan's really unhappy here, she said, pointing to Joan, who lay in the sink. She looks fine to me. Charlie reached over to the sink and scratched Joan's ears. It's really tight, Harper said. That couldn't be denied, as he sat in the living and dining and kitchen. Besides, Mr. Martin will want to go fishing once the spring comes. He shrugged. Well, I'll look. But you know what I'm going to tell you. I know, Harper said, rolling her eyes. The cottage. Harper's stepmother Evelyn lived on Cliffside Point, the neighborhood nestled in the valleys and hills of the Vineyard Sound, and home of the Greyhead Lighthouse. The exclusive area had mostly new, large, modern homes built against the beaches. But Evelyn renovated an old Victorian gambrel and named it Sea View. Charlie pointed his finger in the air. Just until you find a place of your own. Harper hadn't really thought of it that way. Like an extended stay. He nodded. You'll love staying at the cottage. She would, no doubt, but it didn't matter. I'm such a loser. You are not a loser, Charlie said. She flopped into the booth. I'm moving back in with my dad. You're moving back in with your parents, he corrected her, trying to remind her of Evelyn's new role, but it just made her irritated. She loved Evelyn and truly considered her as another mother figure, but she wasn't her real mother. Her real mother didn't have time for her. Her real mother could not care less about being a mother. Her real mother never wanted to be a real mother. Anything else? 
she said, tapping her nails against the table. Charlie slanted his head, looking at her, trying to get past the wall she had so carefully constructed for this exact moment. Are you sure you're okay? he asked. I'm okay, she said, trying for a tone that conveyed she was serious. Charlie cocked his head some more. The creases around his eyes deepened as he tried to decipher if she was telling the truth. Think about the cottage, he said. I'd love to have you that close. She swallowed back the lump. He was still worried about her. So what are you doing? You're on your honeymoon. Get going. She began to shoo him out of the boat, standing him up from the booth and grabbing his jacket. Joan, say goodbye to Grandpa Charlie, she said, slightly nudging him to the boat's exit. I'll call tomorrow. Charlie kissed her on the cheek. And invite Andrew to Sunday dinner. Oh, he's probably busy, she said, surprised Charlie suggested it. When did you start wanting Andrew to join in on things? He shrugged. Evelyn said we would have a lot in common if I just tried. There was a knot in Harper's stomach. Why couldn't she just accept her life? Why was she searching for love from a woman that couldn't be bothered? Why wasn't she thrilled she had a stepmother like Evelyn, who did love her, and a father who wanted her to live close by, and wanted to get to know her boyfriend? Why did she lie about her feelings to the person that loved her the most? I'll tell him about it, she said. Charlie smiled. Great. She gave him a grin that sarcastically said, I'm great. I'll see you tomorrow. Charlie left the boat, waving to Joan, and walked down the dock. Harper stood outside waving, letting the cold numb her. She wished she could numb her heart. She walked back inside the boat and picked up the phone, thinking of what she would say as soon as Tanya picked up. Or what she would say on the voicemail if Tanya didn't pick up, which was most likely the case. Tanya was a coward, after all. Her phone started to ring in her hand. Andrew's name flashed across the screen. She thought about letting it go to voicemail, deal with her mother and the anger rising in her throat first. But she didn't. She picked up. Hello? Hey, he said, easy, as if nothing were wrong. Hey, she said shortly. She looked at the boat's oval window above the sink, staring at her reflection in the glass. You okay? he asked. I'm fine. Uh-oh, he said. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, she clapped back. Okay. I'm just stressed she said. I have stuff on my mind. Well, let me hear it. What's on your mind? He waited as if he really wanted to hear. She sucked in a breath, irritated he'd called her bluff. I need to find a new place to live. What? he said. What's wrong with the boat? Well, it's your grandfather's for one, and I know I'm some kind of charity case for your family. What are you talking about, Harper? He was getting defensive. What charity case? You pay for the boat slip and the electricity and everything else. Look, I think it's nice what you and Lila have done for me, but I should probably start looking for a place of my own. Harper said it so fast, so she wouldn't be able to take it back. Do you not want to look for a place together anymore? I think we're looking for different things in life. She paused for only a moment. She had to do it. There was no other way. I don't know if I want to get married or have children. I can't even imagine myself sharing a room, much less my bank account. She stopped and heard nothing on the other end. Biddy told me your mom's coming, he finally said. What? Heat rose from her chest. You and Biddy were talking about me? How did Biddy even know? She hadn't told anyone besides Evelyn. She probably told Biddy while they were walking. And if she told Biddy, she told Wanda, too. Why didn't you tell me about your mom coming? He said. She let out a huff, like a laugh about to explode out of her chest. 
She was a joke, and now he knew it. Because she's a liar and isn't coming. She spoke in short, hard syllables. Ever. Whoa. What's that? She couldn't hold back now. Like a gate opening up, her anger came out in her words. Whoa? What's that supposed to mean? She was picking a fight now. Harper, he said. Are you sure you're all right? Of course I'm all right, she said. It's not like your family's all sunshine and lollipops. I didn't say that, he said quickly. I mean, with your dad, you of all people should know what a joke the institution of marriage is. Maybe if she could have seen his face on the other end, she would have stopped and thought about what she was saying. But all she saw was red, and the words came out before she even knew she was saying them. Wow, he said. I don't remember you ever being mean to me before. Her breath stopped as her heart sunk. I'm sorry. Harper squeezed the phone in her hand. She had been right all along. She didn't need to ask if she was like her mother or not. All she had to do was look at how she treated the people she loved. I just think we're looking for different things. And that's why I'm looking for a new place for myself. Chapter 14 Come, Shadow! He whistled and Shadow ran to him, straight through the powder, snow flying out behind her hind legs. Mrs. Whitmore didn't complain like he had expected when they walked from the house across the island, through the few feet of snow up the large hill to the other side where the lighthouse stood. Shadow led the way through the woods, as if she knew exactly what they were doing. He had bought a few bulbs and put them into his backpack. Do you know where she fell? Mrs. Whitmore asked as they walked. Out by the lighthouse, he pointed up ahead. She said she slipped and fell on a patch of ice. Shadow sniffed off in another direction as they continued through the trees. Large rocks protruded here and there. A few logs lay on the ground, but everything, including the needles of the pines, had been covered in a layer of sparkling white. Mind helping me in the lighthouse? He asked as they crossed over the peak of the hill. What's this? She asked, stopping at the deliberately placed rocks that had been used as benches at one time. He silently sighed. She was going to think they were nuts in Harmony Falls. It was a classroom. A classroom? She covered her eyes as the sun poked through the tree canopy. The rocks were placed in a circle on the very peak of the hill. Memories of playing pirates flashed through his head. Danny and him wielding sticks as swords and dancing on top of the rocks like Peter Pan. Sort of, he said. What kind of classroom? Art, he said. Mrs. Cooper had given all kinds of classes. Her own art hung in all the local shops and at art fairs. She had been a local celebrity with her landscapes of Harmony Lake. Does she still teach? Not in years, he said, thinking about after Danny had died. She had completely stopped painting and teaching. Sonia stopped with the questions, and they walked the rest of the way in silence. When they reached the lighthouse, he pulled out his spade and began to dig out around the door. Then he opened it. Mrs. Whitmore followed him inside and up to the second floor. It looks so much smaller from shore, she said. He nodded, thinking about the night Danny had died. He'd been at the lighthouse when Danny drowned. He hadn't even woken up when Danny went out to fish early that morning. Otherwise, Sean would have told him it was a bad idea to go out on the ice, that the edges hardly clung onto the rocks and would easily fall under his feet. Eight days it took them to find his body under the ice. Eight days. Sean sat looking out at that water, hoping and praying Danny would magically pop up from underneath and say, See, Shawnee, I told you I'd be fine. But he didn't. He climbed the steps to the top where he pulled out the light bulbs and began to replace them. With a flick of the light switch, the lighthouse was up and working again. Sean looked up from setting the dusk to dawn timer when he noticed Mrs. Whitmore staring at the wall art. This is incredible, she said. He nodded. 
Yes, it's quite something. The walls of the inside of the lighthouse reflected each of the four seasons in oil paint. On the north wall lay winter, a landscape of barren trees, yet so bright, like the current day outside. It was as if the wall wasn't even there, but an open window to the outdoors. On the east stood spring, bright with fluorescent green leaves budding off the trees, pinks, purples, and yellows for the flowers, life coming alive. Summer's dark velvets of greens and grays and blues and browns blended so perfectly she could imagine the mountain. Lastly, the west wall of autumn, so realistic she could practically smell the dried leaves and campfire. She reached her fingertips to the wall but didn't touch. Instead, air tracing her finger along the outline of Mount Washington. What is that? she asked pointing to the summer wall. He looked closely, but he knew what it was. Inspiration point. She looked closer with him. It looks like a church. He let out a long breath. The local church does have Easter sunrise service up there, and there's been a few weddings. And a funeral, he thought. It must overlook everything, she said looking out the window at the exact same landscape. As a kid, he hadn't understood why Mrs. Cooper had spent all that time painting the inside of the lighthouse exactly what she looked at from the windows. But Danny told him she'd miss the seasons. Especially fall, he told him one time. She loves the fall on the island. Should we head back? he asked. She nodded but hesitated. Who's going to look after Mrs. Cooper's dog? Me, he said. What about the lighthouse? He wondered if she was really being concerned or curious. It runs itself. Who's going to watch over her when she comes back? How will she take care of herself with a broken hip while on a remote island she can't get across? Sean hadn't thought that far ahead. We'll figure it out. Our little town usually comes together. That meant Sean would be the one figuring something out. Who else in Harmony Falls would be willing to help with Mrs. Cooper? Certainly not the same people who voted not to fix the bridge. If you need anything, I have a lot of experience finding care for the elderly, she said, looking back at the house. Thank you, Mrs. Whitmore, but we're all set. Sonia, she said. Excuse me? he asked, not sure what she was getting at. You told me to call you Sean, but you keep calling me Mrs. Whitmore, she said. I'd rather not be called that. He nodded, helping her climb into the boat. You're right, sorry. Shadow didn't even hesitate to get on the boat. The dog sat right up front next to Mrs. Whitmore. She gave a small nod and put her arm around Shadow. The dog leaned against her as soon as she did, needy after being alone for Mrs. Cooper for that long. It probably had been years since she'd been left alone. Sean untied the rope and got inside the boat, tossing the rope to the floor. He turned the engine on as soon as he sat down and slowly dragged the boat across the waters. Harmony Creek seemed tame, but in winter, when the water was at its coldest, the currents could take out a boat this size without trouble. Do you need help with the trailer? She asked once they reached the shore. My father taught me how to back a boat trailer better than any boy on my island. You a fisherman? He asked. She shook her head. More like a patient observer. He laughed, but did think about the proposition. It would be better than dragging out his rubber grundens. Thanks, but I got it from here. How do you get to that inspirational point? he shook out of his thoughts. It's up the mountain on Burrow Road, but you'll never get there with your sedan. Could I hike it? She asked. He didn't take her as a hiker or someone who'd want to climb a mountain in the dead of winter, but he also didn't expect her to want to help him with the lighthouse. Yet there she was, sitting on his boat. I'll take you, he said. What? You helped with Mrs. Cooper. 
Shadow hadn't moved from her leg, even as she stood up to get out. I can take you up there. He'd have to get the parking lot cleared, which meant he'd have to finally have that talk with Billy. How about tomorrow morning, he said, stepping off the boat and onto shore before pulling the boat onto the snowbank. Shadow stayed next to Sonia as Sean tied the rope around a tree. What about Shadow? She scratched behind the pup's ear. I could watch her for the day while you're at work. He didn't know Mrs. Whitmore, Sonia, and most women were a mystery to him. But didn't she have something better to do than watch a stranger's dog? Even if Shadow hadn't left her side yet since getting on the boat, wasn't she on vacation? Didn't she have any plans? Or was this an angel who flew in to help him when he would need it? I'm good, he said. As great as Harmony Falls had been growing up, and being the town's police chief, he knew it would be up to him to help Mrs. Cooper. The town would pitch in with casseroles or a prayer chain, maybe a drop by. But Sean would be left to do the heavy lifting. It had been up to him when Danny had died. What if Mrs. Cooper couldn't return home like Sonia had said? His house was big enough, but what if she couldn't walk up the stairs? What if she needed help using the bathroom or taking a shower? Was Sean Monaghan up for that? Some days he thought of his friendship with Danny as the most important relationship of his life. If he hadn't been friends with Danny, the rest of his life would have been completely different. He might have left Harmony Falls when the rest of his friends had gotten married and moved away. Or after his parents had passed away. Or when Vanessa had divorced him. But he had stayed because of his promise to his dead friend. He would take care of Danny's mother. But now all that friendship did was weigh him down with burden. Let me know if you need any help, Sonia said. He nodded, appreciating the offer, but the beautiful stranger would soon be long gone, just like everyone else in his life. I'm good, he said. She nodded, walking through his tire tracks out of the boat launch. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Dress appropriately, he warned. The elevation created a whole different weather pattern. Don't want anyone getting frostbite. She tilted her head. I look forward to it. With a wave, Sonia walked down the path and down to Don's cabin. His eyes stayed on her until she disappeared within the trees. Who was this woman? Chapter 15 Lila sat in books and bread, studying. But her mind was on other things than the bar exam. She picked up the phone and dialed Andrew. What's up? He said, answering the phone. I'm going to fail the bar exam. You're not going to fail, he said right away. But he didn't add his usual speech about working hard and not giving up, or the jab to their father. Instead, he didn't add anything. Everything okay? What else was going on with their family? No, he said. It's not. Andrew stayed silent on the phone. Andrew? she said. Harper broke up with me, he said. What? Lila couldn't believe it. You broke up? She told me she was looking for a place for herself, that she wanted, and I quote, different things. He sounded a bit like Sonia as he spoke. What? she asked. But Lila should have known better. Andrew wasn't in the right state of mind at this point, if he sounded like their mother. What things? I have no bloody idea, he shouted out. Gee, Andrew, I'm the only person on the phone, she said, holding the phone away from her ear. Did you know Harper's mom was coming to town? He asked harshly. She could hear the hurt. No. Well, Biddy told me, and then I asked Harper about it. Lila cringed. She hadn't known Harper all that long, but one thing she knew right away was how insecure she was with relationships, especially with her mom. And how did that go? Lila guessed by the huff on the other end that it hadn't turned out very well. 
Andrew. She's very- She broke up with me, he said. Her heart dropped. She loved her brother with Harper. She loved Harper being with her brother. She daydreamed of Christmases with her and Drake and DJ with her family, which included Andrew and Harper. You need to get my dream sister-in-law back, she said. Tell her you love her. I did, Lila. His voice fell and then went emotionless as he said, She's the one who said she didn't love me. Pain filled her whole chest. I gotta go, Lila, Andrew said quietly. It'll be okay, she said. This is about her mother, not you. He sighed heavily on the other line. I guess my problem isn't about Harper breaking up with me, but the fact that she's using me as a punching bag. And honestly, I'm done being people's punching bags. Lila could feel the pain in his voice, a pain only a twin sister would hear. Harper thought she was dealing with a strong man, but Andrew had been broken down so much over the years by their father that he had lost it. Now he had opened up to Harper, only to be tossed away when things got tough. Oh, Drew, she spoke softly. I'm sorry. I need to go, he said. Lila heard nothing but silence after that. She called Harper right away. Her heart started beating fast, panicky. Harper was just going through something. She knew Harper well enough to know she's probably just scared about commitment, scared to let Andrew in, and scared she'll be let down again. What's up? Harper said as she answered. Harper? Lila was taken back by her laissez-faire attitude, as if nothing major had happened. What's going on? What do you mean? She asked. You broke up with Andrew? Lila's emotions were building in her chest. Harper didn't speak at first, then said, I just realized we don't have the same needs. I don't understand, Lila said. I thought you guys were thinking of finding a place together. I think Andrew thought that, Harper said sharply. Lila's sisterly defenses rose. Andrew hardly ever got things wrong. Look, Harper, I know you've been going through a lot of stuff right now. Lila, this is between me and Andrew. She sounded different, not soft and carefree, but hard and stiff. Don't get involved. You're my friend, who also happens to date my twin brother. I'm already involved. Lila blew out a deep breath, loud enough that Harper would hear on the phone. Harper, come on. Talk to me. Harper stayed silent, something her friend rarely did, and it concerned Lila. I just need time to reevaluate things, Harper said. I should go. No, Harper, don't go, Lila begged. I'll talk to you soon, Harper said, and then hung up. Chapter 16 Evelyn stood in the front room of Seaview, looking for something to keep her busy. Her daughter Renee had named the room the library since bookshelves lined the walls, but she used it mostly as a craft room. When she had her friends Biddy and Wanda living there with her, they would often sit around the table crafting. Whether it be knitting taught by Biddy, or cross-stitching taught by Wanda, or her teaching sewing, Evelyn loved when the small space had been filled with creativity and artistry. But now, the room felt empty. She hadn't knitted, stitched, or sewed for weeks. She pulled open a drawer of the cabinet and looked through her swatches of calico. She had planned on making quilts for Renee and the soon-to-be twins, but hadn't done more than spend six hours in the fabric store with Wanda and Biddy. She had small patterns of pinks and blues and purples and yellows and greens. She couldn't decide what colors to use. They were all so pretty. She looked down at her watch, wondering when Charlie would come home from the bakery. Ever since the heart attack, she couldn't help but be a bit anxious when he went off by himself. He hadn't been himself since telling Harper about her mother not coming to Martha's Vineyard. Evelyn wanted to call Tanya, 
and remind her what the word promise meant. But Charlie thought it best to leave it up to Harper. How could Tanya do that to her daughter? Charlie thought it had been over ten years since they last saw each other. He wasn't sure how many years had gone by without the two of them talking on the phone. How sad it was that Tanya had no idea what a wonderful daughter she had. Evelyn sighed as she leafed through the folded squares. She needed a distraction. Otherwise, her mind would continue to circle from one worry to the next. She had to remind herself she was blessed. She married one of the greatest men, had a wonderful family and extended family of friends, and an amazing stepdaughter. Harper had been the greatest gift she could have received by falling in love. A third daughter who seemed to completely understand her, even better than her own children. How could Tanya do that to her? Ugh! Evelyn slammed the door when she saw Harper's car pull into the drive. Her heart dropped. She didn't even know what to say to her. What could she say? She walked to the front door and waited for Harper to reach the porch, ready to let her in. But Harper stopped at the threshold. Come in, it's cold, Evelyn said after opening the door. But Harper didn't budge at first. As a cold wind blew from the Atlantic, she finally stepped inside. Want something to eat? Evelyn started walking to the kitchen, but Harper didn't follow. Evelyn swung around when she noticed Harper standing at the door. Harper, you want to come in? Did you tell Biddy about my mom not coming? She asked. Harper's eyes flashed in anger, and Evelyn's stomach dropped. Yes, Evelyn said. I told Biddy because she loves you and would like to help. Over the past few months, Biddy and Harper had grown very close, especially after Andrew had come into the picture. Evelyn had told Biddy and Wanda on their walk because she had also needed advice on how to navigate this and be supportive of Harper. I don't appreciate you talking behind my back. Harper spoke low and slow. Evelyn held out her hands. Oh, dear, Harper. I never meant to upset you. I don't need people feeling sorry for me. Harper's words came out harsh. Evelyn hadn't heard Harper speak like that to anyone before. I don't need people meddling either. Evelyn felt that blow right in the stomach. She had been the one who offered to pay for Tanya's flight and hotel. I just wanted to help. Evelyn only wanted to make things as easy and smooth as possible for her and Tanya. Evelyn took in a breath, reminding herself this wasn't about her. I shouldn't have said anything. I'm sorry. I don't even need your help, Harper said, her chin trembling. I don't need anyone's help. Harper. Evelyn used her motherly voice. The tone she used when Renee or Samantha needed a reminder that she loved them. You are an amazing daughter. She purposely left off the step, hoping, praying, Harper wouldn't balk at being called her daughter. She's never going to come. Harper's voice cracked. I don't understand why you pushed the whole thing. Evelyn's mouth dropped at the sting. Harper had swung hard this time. Evelyn may have been a bit pushy, maybe. She had encouraged Harper to see her mother again. She tried to be as accommodating and helpful as she could. Harper, I only wanted you to be happy, Evelyn said, walking up to Harper to take her hand. But Harper stepped back. Well, I'd appreciate everyone to stay out of my business. Harper swung around and left Evelyn speechless in the front hall. She didn't know how long she stood frozen in one spot, at least twenty or so minutes, staring out the window, trying to unpack all her emotions. What Harper said upset Evelyn. She took in deep breaths, trying to hold it together. Charlie would be home any moment. Where was he? What would she say? Should she say something? Would that cause more damage? 
God, she wished she could call Biddy, but now she felt as though she couldn't talk to anyone about what had just happened. She squeezed her arms around her stomach. She was blessed. This had nothing to do with her. She looked at her phone. Where was he? She called Charlie, but it went straight to voicemail. Oh, he never charged his phone. She called Renee next. He left about an hour ago, Renee said on the phone. He left an hour ago? Evelyn's heart began to race with panic. They lived no more than a 15-minute drive away. She hung up with Renee and stormed to the front door, about to get into her car and drive to the bakery, when Charlie's car turned down the road. Where have you been? She asked as soon as he got out of the car, angry he didn't give her any details. He looked confused. I've been at the bakery. Don't you remember how George died? She couldn't believe he would just not check in or call to let her know what his plans were. Renee said you left the bakery over an hour ago. I took a drive. He looked as though she were the one out of line. I like to go for drives. You just had heart surgery. Through my groin, Evelyn. He corrected her, but she was in no mood. Because you had a heart attack, she yelled. Suddenly, like a tsunami washing to shore, she burst into tears. Charlie looked horrified. I'm sorry. I won't go on drives anymore. No, that's not it, she cried, tears streaming down her face. I just wish you had called me. He walked straight to her and wrapped his arms around her. I'm sorry you were that worried. She continued to cry, not really sure what the sobs were about at this point. So many emotions ran through her. She was mad and ashamed at what Harper thought of her by yelling at her like she had. But she hurt for Harper. Deep sadness penetrated through her, thinking about what Harper must be going through. Her daughters had lost their father once and had been broken by his death. Harper lost her mother continuously. She had felt such anger. She still feels anger. I'm sorry, Evelyn said, stepping back from Charlie. I don't want you to stop your drives. I just got worried. I'll make sure to let you know where I am, he said, kissing her again. As they walked into the kitchen, her stomach twisted with what had happened. But she didn't want to get Charlie involved. She needed to figure this out on her own. Her phone rang and Biddy's name popped up on the screen. She held up the phone. I should take this. Charlie nodded, but still had the worry penetrating between his eyebrows. She walked back into her library. Hey, Biddy. She wondered if Harper had stopped there as well. I just talked to Lila, she said. Harper broke up with Andrew. What? Evelyn couldn't believe it. Did she say why? No, Biddy said. Something about moving in together and wanting different things. Evelyn's emotions swelled up again. She took a second to regain herself. She got really upset that I told you about her mom. Oh, shoot. Did you tell her you just wanted to help? Mm-hmm. Evelyn's voice cracked. Hug harder, Biddy said to Evelyn. Just hug her harder. Evelyn knew what she had to do. I will. When Evelyn regained her composure, she walked back to the kitchen where Charlie prepared dinner. I need to go run an errand for my quilts. Do you want me to go with you? He asked wiping breadcrumbs off his fingers. She shook her head. No, I'll be fine. I'm just not sure how long I'll be. He looked down at his thinly sliced chicken breasts. I'll prepare everything, and when you leave for home, let me know. She squeezed his hand. Sorry about getting so upset earlier. He squeezed back. You have every right to be concerned. Evelyn drove straight to the docks to Harper's boat and walked down the wooden walkway to Harper's slip. All the lights were on and music was playing. She climbed onto the back, holding onto the sides as she swayed to the waves and knocked on the glass door to the cabin. 
Harper opened the door, her face wet with moisture. Evelyn stepped inside the boat and hugged Harper with everything she had. Chapter 17 After Sonia returned from Mrs. Cooper's island, she went shopping. Harmony Falls may be in the White Mountains, with little more than a few restaurants and inns, but they also had a ski resort on the edge of town, which had every piece of winter gear she could imagine. At the ski shop, a gentleman who smelled like patchouli found a jacket she could wear in the Arctic, along with snow pants, gloves, a large wool hat with a huge tassel, a thermal neck warmer, and waterproof winter boots. Do you have any of those thingies you put under your boots to grip onto ice? She asked, remembering a documentary about a man who climbed Mount Everest. Yeah, totally, the kid said, walking her over to the wall filled with paraphernalia for being out in the mountains. He pointed to a set of metal attachments. They're called ice claws. She grabbed the one-size-fits-all female claws. I'll be able to hike up the mountain by Harmony Lake? Yeah, totally, he said, but also checking her out. You're going to climb Mount Harmony at this time of year? Totally, she said, almost laughing at her reply. Sonia didn't say totally, or climb mountains, or buy something that was practical rather than for fashion. She then ran into the village store on her way home, wearing her new coat. You have dinner tonight? John, the village store owner, asked as she walked down one of the aisles looking at the choices. Thinking about making something easy, she said. But the truth was, Sonia didn't really know how to cook. Her mother had done all the cooking as Sonia grew up. As a kid, she gained weight easily, and she'd starve herself or try crazy diets and exercise to always look perfect. When she had married Jeff, she'd felt even more pressure to keep a perfect body. So she learned to pick. She hired a chef to prepare meals when the kids and Jeff were around, but when it was just her, and it was almost always just her, she'd pick on things, never really eating a full meal. What's that smell? she asked, as a warm country spread filled the room. Is that fried chicken? And gravy and mashed potatoes, John said, hitting a large pot with a spoon. You cook like this all day? she asked, not seeing any help behind his counter. Dinner is only a few days a week, he said. Now come and join the crowd. She looked at the counter. Only a man and a woman sat together. Sure, that sounds great, she said. He dropped a few pieces of fried chicken onto the plate, along with creamy mashed potatoes and a perfect dollop of gravy. A spoonful of creamed corn and a freshly baked biscuit perched on the side of her plate. He slid the plate in front of an empty stool on the counter and said, Come on, sit. She did what she was told. This looks amazing. She opened the paper napkin and put it on her lap, then looked at the silverware. She didn't know how to eat the chicken without getting completely messy. Sonia didn't do messy. The man reminded her of her father, Randy, a no-nonsense kind of guy. She laughed, thinking of Randy and what he must be thinking with her up in the mountains. He probably would be proud of her for getting on a boat. Would he be proud she left her marriage? proud of her running away from her problems. Her father, the judge, didn't run. He faced every kind of human being on earth face to face in his courtroom. He sat as others stood for him. They all stood for him. Her mother waited on him, her brothers idolized him, and she wanted nothing more than to make him proud. Jeff had made Randy proud at first. Harvard graduate, an up-and-coming attorney in Boston. He'd already had offers at big-name law firms. He moved through the firm's rankings faster than any other attorney in the firm's history. Randy had been proud of his son-in-law, bragging to anyone who would listen. They frequently traveled to the island to visit her parents, and Jeff had fallen in love with Martha's Vineyard. They'd bought their first cottage the summer she'd had the twins. She bitten to the chicken leg. 
The crispy, savory breading melted in her mouth as the juicy meat exploded. Oh, my. John threw a dish towel over his shoulder. You're welcome, he said, and he walked away. She took another bite of chicken, then dipped her fork into the mashed potatoes and picked up the corn with it. As she stuffed her mouth with another helping of potatoes and gravy, Sean Monahan walked in. He stopped as he saw her, then a smile broke across his face. Fancy meeting you here. She smiled, taking her napkin and wiping her mouth. I heard this place has really good fried chicken. He scrunched his face. Did John tell you that? She let out a laugh. As a matter of fact, he did. She took the chicken breast with her hands, something she hadn't done since being a child, and bit into the large piece of meat. Mmm, she moaned. This is so good. John suddenly appeared with another plate and dropped it at the seat next to her. Eat. You're a man of few words, John, Sean said. John slid a beer across the counter. You sell beer? she asked, not having seen it on the menu. This is a BYOB kind of joint, John said. The chief gets one on the house. John walked to the television set and switched the channel. You going to watch a big game? Sean twisted the cap and passed it to her, and she held up her hands to refuse. I'm still on the clock. Here, it's yours. She noticed he had used a knife and fork for the chicken. She placed the breast down and cleaned her fingers with the napkin, then grabbed the beer and took a long, deep sip. It went down smooth, really smooth. Oh, that tastes nice, she said. When was the last time she'd even had a beer? She could rattle off expensive wines and fancy liquors and fabulous cocktails, but when was the last time she had just ordered a beer? She took another sip. I think the last time I had a beer was when I was in college, she said, staring at the bottle. His eyebrows shot up from the information. Huh, <laughs> not much of a beer drinker? She shook her head, taking a gulp this time. The carbonation burned down her throat, but created an instant warmth as it made its way down. Her feet were becoming heavy, and tingles ran up her legs. When did I get so uptight? She asked rhetorically. You know what you do with something that's too tight, he asked, looking at her from the side. She shook her head, dipping her fork back into the mashed potatoes and corn. You loosen it up, he said, cutting his chicken. She let out a laugh at the simple answer, but maybe she did need to loosen up. My husband always did say that about me. She picked up the chicken leg and dug her teeth into its crispy, flaky skin. Sean went back to using his knife and fork. What made you choose Harmony Falls for your stay? She shrugged and chewed, thinking about the night she had booked Don's cabin in the middle of nowhere. I've always loved the mountains, she said. Was it that simple? I wanted to be somewhere I knew no one would recognize me. Are you famous? John asked from the kitchen. Sean smiled. Sorry, we're not that into pop culture out in these parts. She shook her head. No, not famous. Just from a small town. Ah, he nodded. I'm from a very similar town, and my divorce had been all the talk. She flashed a look at him. I'm sorry. Don't be. We were terrible together, he said. He scraped his knife against the plate and almost lost the piece of chicken to the floor. Ugh, I'm trying to be polite. May I? He placed his hands near the chicken. She looked at the handsome officer, then picked up her own thigh with her fingers and bit. He laughed and picked up his leg. It looks like you're ready for tomorrow, he gestured toward her new jacket. I am completely ready. She thought about the items she'd purchased. For the first time in a long time, she had paid attention to the cost. She had added everything up in her head as it rang up. Her lifestyle of carelessly spending was over. 
Would she need to get a job? Would any of Jeff's money come back to her? She had heard one of the associate attorneys joke about what one got from divorcing an attorney. She hadn't heard the punchline, so she had asked him to repeat it. His face had gone red, like a kid who'd been caught in a candy jar, and said, Nothing. What if she got nothing? She knew if she asked, Jeff would probably take her back. He'd probably keep the other woman on the side, too. He no longer hid his affairs. It gets easier, he said. Divorce, I mean. It did for me. People get used to it. You learn to navigate separately. She nodded, and they ate in silence for a moment. How's Mrs. Cooper? She asked, remembering him say he was going to visit her. She's still in critical condition. He looked straight ahead, but he couldn't hide his worry, which made him strangely sexy. I'm sorry to hear that, she said. Thank you. There was a sincerity in his voice, and she looked at him, his eyes a deep green like the evergreens on the mountains. The creases on his face showed a man who had lived through things and still stood strong. She hadn't noticed how attractive the police officer was before. But now as she sat next to him, she could feel herself blushing. How's Shadow? she asked. She was curled up on my bed when I left her this afternoon, he said. She smiled at the thought of the dog lying on the officer's bed. Jeff had never wanted a dog. Even when the twins had begged for one, he never budged. He'd say they weren't willing to put in the effort to train, or they traveled too much, or they didn't have the time to be with the dog. She wondered why Jeff thought a wife and children would be different. He never helped with raising the twins, and he traveled all the time, and he didn't have time to be a parent. Would she be able to come on the hike? She asked, unsure if the snow would be too much for a dog. That's a great idea, he said. It's supposed to be a warmer day tomorrow and sunny. Warmer? She wondered what that meant to him. The temps are going to be a bit above freezing. He pulled out his phone and opened a weather app. 35 for the high. I should have bought a swimsuit, she teased. Sean laughed as he placed his phone back onto the counter. He appeared completely relaxed as they sat there. He didn't check his phone frantically through dinner. He didn't get texts chiming in or phone calls that needed to be answered right then. He didn't rush off and leave. Instead, he began asking her questions. Softball questions at first, like where she'd gone to school and how many children she had. She found out that he had attended a local college and moved back to marry his high school sweetheart. They never had children. The conversation veered around both their marriages and focused on his career in Harmony Falls. I kind of just came back because that's what everyone expected me to do, he said. Everyone expected her to come back. Jeff, the twins, her father. Was that why no one was checking in or calling her? Did everyone just expect Sonia to do the same thing again and again? To just come back? I did everything I was expected to do. Get married, have children, be the perfect wife and mother, she said to him, but realized she was really talking to herself. But I just ended up sitting alone in the middle of nowhere. Not really by yourself. The right side of his mouth lifted into a grin, which made him even more handsome. Her cheeks warmed as she realized he was staring at her, no, not just staring at her. His eyes seemed to penetrate her. She shifted her gaze and had to regain her breath. He wiped his hands with his napkin, then his face, catching a tiny piece of fuzz in his five o'clock shadow. She had a sudden urge to reach over and pick it off, to touch his strong jawline. A desire to brush her fingertips against his lips made her freeze in her spot, praying he didn't know what she was thinking inside her head. What was happening to her? She rose her hand up and waved as John started walking back from the other end of the store. I should get going. I'll see you tomorrow then, 
he asked, unaware of her absurd thoughts. Yes, tomorrow. Can't wait. She threw down a couple twenties and grabbed her new jacket and purse. Make sure this covers the officer's meal. Sean shook his head. That's not necessary. You got my pancakes. She threw down another set of dollars for tip. I can cover some fried chicken. She waved quickly as she left. In the background, she heard John ask what Sean did to make her leave as she walked out the door. But she didn't wait to hear his answer. The guy probably thought she was crazy. She got into the car and turned on the engine, but just sat, shivering as the car warmed up. What was she doing here? She said she'd leave after getting to the island and seeing the lighthouse. She'd done what she'd set out to do, and now she should go back. Everyone expected her to go back. Her breath billowed out, iridescent under the store's light. She peered back into the golden glow of the village store, watching Sean talk to John behind the counter. Maybe she did need to loosen up, do what was unexpected, and what she actually wanted. She put the car into drive and headed back to the cabin. She needed to get ready for the hike tomorrow. Chapter 18 Lila sat with Drake and DJ at the dinner table in her apartment. It's terrible, isn't it? She asked as she looked at DJ. Yes, he sat, spitting out the piece of meat into his napkin. DJ, that's not polite. Drake wasn't fooling anyone as he smiled and kept chewing and chewing and chewing. Did you say this was pulled pork? Just throw it out, she said, exasperated and embarrassed. No matter how hard she tried, she could not figure out the basics of cooking. I follow Grammy Biddy's recipe exactly. You clearly made a mistake somewhere, DJ said, who was now making extra effort to swish his drink around in his mouth. All right, you've made your point, she said to the seven-year-old. It's the thought that counts, Drake said, reaching his hand across the table. We just won't be here with you. Well, DJ began, it would have been better if you hadn't ruined the pulled pork, but- DJ, dude, give it a rest and apologize. Drake gave her a half smile. I apologize for any hurtful truths I may have said, DJ said, then added, it's better to be kind than to be right. Lila rolled her eyes at her grandfather's daily advice in thematic sentences. He's hanging out with Pops too much. Her grandfather had taught DJ to use his smarts through sarcasm. It had clearly been working. Why don't we go grab something at the wharf, she said, grabbing her plate and DJ's. Oh, we could hit the pizza place down the road, Drake said. I want to have dinner at the wharf, DJ said. Grandma Biddy said that the restaurant's back deck is over the water of the harbor. He squeezed his hand into a fist and shook it. I should have been able to bring my echo map. Don't start, Drake said to his son. The fishing device had been DJ's favorite Christmas gift. He took it everywhere he went, along with his notebook, binoculars, and compass. But today, he had it taken away after refusing to clean up his dirty laundry. She smiled, thinking about how DJ had been behaving better since arriving on the island. No longer did he have the temper tantrums like before, but now he tried different strategies to calm down, like squeezing his fist instead of breaking something. Now he apologized when he offended someone, instead of arguing his position. He even listened, for the most part, except when it came to household chores like laundry. I don't know, Drake said. The wharf was pretty pricey. I've got it, Lila said, grabbing his plate and walking it to the sink. Come on, DJ, help me with the dishes and we'll go. Drake looked like he was going to argue, but Lila stopped him. It's fine, I want to take you to the wharf. I'll dry, DJ said walking to the kitchen with empty hands. He opened the cabinet door and grabbed the rubber gloves she kept underneath and put them on, waiting for her to arrive. 
Drake didn't say anything after that. In fact, Lila noticed he didn't really speak at all. Not that it meant much. DJ spoke for the three of them most of the time. DJ talked about how if he had the echo map, he'd know exactly the depth from the last time the maps were updated, which had been less than a year prior, which he believed was still a good indication of where the sea level's depth was at the wharf's deck. The next topic he discussed at length was his obsession. Seals. Many people think keeping them protected is actually ruining the ecosystem on Martha's Vineyard. He continued to rattle off facts about the overpopulation of seals, including the increase of sharks coming to the island's waters. They're eating all the fish as well. Lila nodded and tried to pay attention as best she could, but she couldn't help but notice Drake's silence. And she was positive it wasn't a good thing. When he dropped her off at her apartment, like always, he and DJ walked her to the door, making sure she got in all right. DJ, there's a book I think I might have on my bookshelf about seals. Want to check? She asked, opening her apartment door. DJ didn't even answer, just walked right inside. Shoes, Drake yelled out. Fine. DJ removed his shoes and walked into the living room, on the hunt for the book she didn't have. What's going on? She asked. You've been quiet all night. I just felt like a loser, he said, shrugging. I can't afford places like that. I don't care, she said. Why does it matter if I pay? Well, it doesn't matter if you pay, but... He stopped speaking and Lila's stomach dropped like an anvil. You think that's my dad's money? She asked. Money hadn't come up in their relationship before. Yes, it was a heavy beast roaring in the background. But Lila all but ignored it. What good would it be discussing the one thing Drake complained about the most? Look, I love that you volunteer everywhere, and that you're studying for the bar exam, and that you help with everyone and everything. But you just paid for a meal that was over $100 on a random Tuesday night. He shook his head. I just don't want to eat on your dad's dime. First of all, she slowed herself down. She knew she was getting defensive. I didn't mean to flaunt what I have. She felt so stupid. But it's not my dad's money. He sighed. I want DJ to learn he has to earn that kind of dinner. Oh, Lila said, her forehead wrinkling. She hadn't really thought about DJ. Dinners at the wharf had been a regular occasion for most of her childhood. Tuesday, Saturday, winter or summer, the Whitmores always had a table set up for them at the restaurant. They never waited in line. The staff always remembered their likes and dislikes, and she had never paid attention to how much the bill was. She hadn't even looked tonight, just handed her card over and added a generous tip. I'm sorry, she said. You don't have to be sorry. He brushed his fingers along her jawline. I should be sorry. You invited me and DJ to a great dinner, and I was grumpy. No, you have the right to think that. DJ needs to understand money, she said. Clearly, I haven't learned. His hand fell. Lila, I'm not trying to insult you. If she was being honest, Lila had no concept of what it would be like to support herself. She was only getting defensive because he was right. No, it's fine. But she couldn't help it. His head swayed to the other side. Lila. You have so many amazing qualities that DJ needs to learn, too. She bit her bottom lip. Want to try making homemade pizzas tomorrow? He smiled, stepping over to her and kissing her on the lips. Are you sure there's a book on seals? DJ said, coming around the corner. She laughed at his exhausted face. I think I may have loaned it to someone. She walked into her living room, where she had set up shelves of all her favorite books and collection of artworks. Here, I'll let you borrow one of my favorites. 
she pulled out her copy of The Chronicles of Narnia. The hardcover book had been her saving grace as a kid. She'd escape into the wardrobe with Lucy and the others. Drake and DJ left shortly after that. Lila stared at the law books stacked on her desk. She had so much to study, and less than a month before the exam. She should study. She grabbed her phone and dialed Andrew's number. You've reached Andrew Whitmore. Then a beep. Hey, just checking in, seeing how you're doing, and if you've heard from Mom. Lila stuffed her free hand into her pocket, wishing she had someone to talk to about Drake who'd understand. Call me later. She hung up and tapped her phone against her thigh. She knew she shouldn't get involved. She had been told not to get involved. But she picked up the phone and dialed Harper anyway. Hey, Harper said, sounding surprised. Hey, Lila said back, feeling the shift that had transpired since Andrew and Harper's breakup. What's up? Harper asked. I just thought I'd call and see how you're doing. Lila wanted to go right into how Drake had called out her behavior and how stupid she felt. But suddenly she wasn't sure if she should have this conversation with Harper. I'm okay. Harper didn't add anything more. Have you talked to Andrew? She asked, but immediately regretted it when Harper let out a heavy breath. I don't think he wants to talk to me right now, Harper said. Oh. Lila hadn't known Harper for long, but long enough to know she had been happy with Andrew. Don't you want to try to work it out? Lila could hear how the words sounded as she said them. She sounded like Sonia, but she didn't want them to not try. You guys are so good together. The line stayed silent for a long time, so long that Lila started to feel worse than she had before the call. Harper, she said. I should go, Harper said. Hart, please. I didn't mean to interfere. Lila, you can't always have what you want, Harper said. You and your brother don't get that. Now Lila was the one who was speechless. When had she been dragged into this? A long silence hung between the friends. Then Harper said, I should go. Yeah. Lila said, hoping to get off the phone before she said something else. I should, too. Talk to you later. Lila hung up the phone and threw it onto the couch. Her hands shook, and she slowly inhaled and blew it out. She couldn't get what she wanted. What was that supposed to mean? She grabbed her phone, about to call Biddy, when she thought about her mother. She shouldn't call her mother. She was in a bad mood, and already upset with the way she had handled dinner, Harper's comment and breakup, and how her mother had just skipped town without thinking about anyone else. Impulsively, she dialed her mother's number anyway. Lila? Sonia answered right away. What's going on? Lila couldn't help but be annoyed by her mother's worried reaction. She always responded with a dramatic flair. I'm just checking in, seeing how you're doing. Fine, I'm fine, Sonia said quickly. What's going on with you? Any woman knew fine meant anything other than fine. Plus, her mother rapidly deflected the conversation to Lila. If Lila had been in the right state of mind, she would have recognized this. But instead, she said, Well, if you didn't know, Andrew and Harper broke up. Oh, no, Sonia said sounding genuinely upset. How is he? He's upset, Lila said, annoyed at the question. He loves her. Sometimes that's just not enough, Sonia said. This response from her mother somehow infuriated Lila further. Really? That's all you have to say? Andrew's heart is broken, and all you have to say is sometimes love isn't enough? What do you want me to say, Lila? Sonia said. You obviously have an answer in mind. No, Lila said quickly. I just thought you'd be more sympathetic. Do you want me to say true love will prevail? 
Sonia asked. Or the truth, that people are selfish and only think of themselves. Or I could tell you that this has nothing to do with Andrew but with Harper, and there's nothing he can do to fix it. Wow, Mom. Lila wished she hadn't called her mother. That vacation is really helping. Silence must have been the theme that night, because Sonia stayed quiet. Mom, Lila said, you still there? This isn't a vacation, Lila. Then why are you in New Hampshire? Lila asked. Because I've left your father. Sonia's words came out choppy, like heavy boards dropping to the ground. So forgive me for not having the right words of wisdom for you. What? Lila couldn't believe what she heard. Her mother left their father? When? Lila raced through everything that had transpired in the last few weeks. So much that she hadn't even paid attention to the fact her father hadn't been around. That was par for the course when it came to him. New Year's, Sonia said. Lila thought back to Harper's parents' wedding. Didn't she see Sonia cry at the ceremony? Didn't she have a good time? What made her go home after that and leave her husband? Leave her family? Lila's heart sunk at the thought of her mother faking it all night. Why didn't you tell us? Why did you take off for New Hampshire? Because I needed to figure things out, Sonia said. What about us? Lila asked. Lila heard the other end click. She looked at the screen. Sonia had hung up on her. Chapter 19 Sean opened the door to his truck and let Shadow sit up front with him. You good, girl? Shadow didn't seem to mind the change in scenery, just as long as she was with someone. However, the second he left the room, the dog became anxious, howling and crying. Thank goodness he lived in the middle of the woods, because even Rhonda next door, six acres away, probably heard Shadow's cries when he was at work yesterday. The reason he knew this was because he heard Shadow's howls as he drove up the driveway the night before. The first stop would be to get Billy's rear end in gear. He had an hour to clear out the parking lot with his plow before he kicked his butt. He had visited his former brother-in-law yesterday afternoon, warning him to clear the parking lot of snow. But after a drive by that morning, the parking lot was still snowed in, which meant he'd have to take Sonia the long way up Inspiration Point, and he wasn't sure if she would be able to handle that much of a hike. He didn't even know what he was doing. Yes, he was taking this woman on a hike, but could this be considered a date? Sean didn't usually take people he helped on the job on hikes up mountains, certainly not beautiful ones. She just got divorced, he reminded himself. He kept reminding himself of that fact over and over on the drive to Billy's. Hey, man, Billy said as he answered the door. He looked like he just woke up. You need to clear the parking lot now, Sean said. He felt like a jerk talking to a grown adult, but he couldn't deal with lazy. I'll get to it today, Billy said. No, now. Sean wasn't going to hear any more excuses. If you don't, I'm going to recommend you be terminated. What? Billy's eyes widened in shock. You wouldn't do that to me. You know I need this job for Maureen and the kids. Then earn your pay, Sean said, shaking his head. Billy had been his friend only by default. Billy had been Danny's friend. Most of the time, Sean could stand the kid who had lingered around. Then after Danny died, Sean became Billy's only friend. And they became connected in some strange way through Danny which was how he'd met Billy's sister, Vanessa. And the rest, they say, was history. Just because you're the chief of police doesn't make you my boss. Billy's face reddened in anger. You can't just come to my house and make demands. I've been really busy. Besides, no one even uses that parking lot in the winter. 
Sean remembered one time in high school. Billy had made someone mad, and Vanessa came to Sean begging him to step in. Chris Ackerman wanted to pound Billy's face in for some stupid reason. He couldn't even remember what Billy had done. But he never once just owned up to his part. Instead of apologizing to Chris for whatever he had done to anger him, Billy made excuses. Instead of thanking Sean, he complained. You have an hour, Sean said. Shadow started to howl in his truck. He walked away as Billy shouted obscenities at him. Their meager friendship had deteriorated long ago. Why Vanessa didn't see that was beyond him. Swinging through town, he stopped at the village store, ordered two sandwiches along with a couple bags of chips. He had made homemade hot cocoa and put it into a thermos with two plastic mugs and a blanket. This totally looked like a date. He grabbed the blanket and stuffed it into his bag. He'd only pull it out if necessary. At least he didn't bring candles or something like that. When he pulled up to the cabin, he barely got out of the truck when Sonia stepped out of the cabin. Shoot, she sure was beautiful. Good morning, he said. He gave her a once-over. Sonia wore just a coat, no gloves or hat or snow pants. Do you need more time to get ready? She held out her arms and made a face. I tried getting a hold of you at the station, but I can't go after all. Disappointment swept through him. Ah, that's too bad. He gave her a smile but couldn't hide his disappointment. I was looking forward to getting to the top. Well, so much for a date. I'm headed home, she said, but wanted to thank you for everything. There were so many moments in his life that he wished he could do over. So many times he held something in, but if he had said what he felt, things might have turned out so differently. It's been really nice getting to know you, he said. He was such a chicken. I hope you keep in touch. She didn't say anything at first. Sean did not do well with being vulnerable. He grabbed hold of his wallet just so he could do something with his hands as her silence permeated the cold air and pulled out his card. Just in case you lost the other, he said, handing it over. She held the small card in her hands, and her thumb rubbed the corner. I'm sorry. He waved his hands, playing off his disappointment. That's cool. That's cool? He couldn't believe he'd said that. I came here to run away, and... She sighed heavily, like the world rested on her shoulders. Well, I didn't have to run, because no one was looking for me. Something came over him when he saw the tears floating in her eyes. He couldn't explain why he did it. He'd never done something so intimate with someone he barely knew. But he walked closer and wrapped his arms around her, holding her against him. At first, he could feel her jerk. Surprised, maybe. Shocked, more like it. But then she collapsed in his arms. He didn't hear her cry, but her shuddered breaths gave it away. He held her longer than he imagined, but he wouldn't let go until she let go of him. When her arms loosened and she regained her breath, he stepped back to get a better look at her. She gave him a half smile, gulping in air. I'm so embarrassed, she said, covering her face with her hands. He gently leaned down, trying to see through and catch her eyes. I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I have gone through a divorce. He didn't want to share his woes with a woman who was way out of his league. The last thing he wanted to talk about was Vanessa and what a screw-up he had been. But that's what Sean did. He helped. It's hard to know exactly how to react. I wanted to burn my house to the ground. They don't call it a broken marriage for nothing. He had wanted to burn Vanessa's in his house, all that time and effort he'd put into her dream house just so she could sleep around. Her hands dropped, and she held her arms against her stomach. My family's been broken for some time, she said. I stayed for years, 
looking like an idiot. Tears brimmed along her lids. I meant nothing to any of them. His heart dropped when she said that. When he finally left Vanessa, he had never felt so alone in his life. But it didn't last. None of the hurt and loneliness lasted. Time really did heal wounds. Stay, he said. Stay and hike with me. He leaned closer to her. I promise you won't regret it. John made us his famous chicken panini sandwiches. He jabbed his thumb back at the truck. Besides, do you see that dog waiting to go hiking with you? She laughed, looking at Shadow pawing at the window. She bit her lip, not answering at first, which made him hopeful. Okay, she finally said. I'll go for the hike. All right, he said, clapping his hands together. Let's go. He waited in the truck while she went back inside to change. When she stepped out of the house, she looked like she was going on an Arctic adventure with a furry hooded down coat, snow pants, snow boots, and wool everything else. You look ready now, Sean said, stepping out of the truck and opening the door for her. She laughed and got into the truck. I guess I am. As he reversed, he turned on the radio playing the local and only station. The Celtics have really stepped up their game, a sportscaster said on the radio. She let out a laugh. Don't tell me this is Sports Hub. It's either this or NPR. That's all we get out here. He hoped she'd stick with sports. He wasn't one to listen to the news. He saw enough bad things in the world. He didn't need to hear about them, too. I love listening to sports, she said. You're kidding, he said. A beauty who also loved sports. It makes me feel like a kid for some reason. She smiled, scratching Shadow's neck, who stood her front paws on the console from the back. My father was always watching some sport on television. And if there wasn't a game, the radio was on. Sean nodded. It was the only station my old man listened to. It was also the only one we could get. But he'd agree and argue with the commentators. Sonia laughed. People love their sports. Yes, people love their sports, he said. I love baseball, she said. People always complained about how boring baseball could be when the kids were little. But I loved going to my son's games. What position did your son play, he asked. She smiled, as if the memory brought nothing but happiness. He enjoyed seeing her happy. Pitcher, all the way to college. I used to play throughout college myself, he said. When had he last mentioned that? Really? She perked up in her seat and faced him. What position? Catcher, he said, thinking about lugging his equipment. Oh, she looked sad. I always felt so bad for the catcher. If the pitcher throws bad, and if you can't scramble fast enough to get it, the whole game could be lost. It can really break people's hearts, he said, thinking about the bum knee that blew out his sophomore year. Do you still play? she asked. I'm part of a softball league nowadays, he said. A group of townies. She nodded. That sounds fun. He wondered what fun meant for a woman like Sonia Whitmore. He did some more digging the night before. With another Google search, Sonia Whitmore, the wife of husband Jeff Whitmore, owner and head shareholder of Whitmore, Townsend, and Stern Law Offices. She was married to money. And from what he'd read, her father happened to be a district court judge in Boston. She didn't just marry money, but also came from it. He clenched his teeth when he pulled into the snow-filled parking lot. Billy still hadn't plowed. He parked the truck right in the middle of the entrance. Should we park here? She asked, looking at the unplowed parking lot for the trailhead. It's fine, he said. He reached into the back of the truck for his backpack. Looks like we have the place to ourselves. She looked out of the window up at the mountain and opened the door. This is gorgeous. She jumped out facing the lake. 
I can see the cabin. He jumped out of the truck, letting Shadow out, and walked to stand next to her under the cloudless blue sky. Only the wind could be heard. It's so silent, she said. It's never silent where I live. Birds started singing off in the distance as a gust of wind blew past them, clanking bare tree branches together. Do you see the lighthouse? He pointed to the island. Oh, yes. She held her hand against her forehead, shielding her eyes from the bright sun and snow. This view is breathtaking. He tapped his elbow against her arm. Wait until we get to the top. I'm looking forward to it, she said. He adjusted his backpack and gave a nod. Ready? Yep, she said. And they were off. He took her up the back trail, a winding path that went around the mountain on the south side. It was longer by half a mile, but most of it was on the south side, which meant the sun would keep them warm, and hopefully the trail wouldn't be too icy. Sean led the way at first, but Shadow soon took the lead, and he fell back in step with Sonia, side by side. The whole hike, they had no trouble coming up with conversation. He talked about his family and work. He made a point to talk about Vanessa, but the minute he mentioned their divorce, Sonia changed the subject. When they finally reached the top, he let her go first and watched her reaction as she got to the vista. From where she stood, she could see the whole White Mountain Range. You can see the whole lake, she exclaimed and began pointing out landmarks. There's the cabin and Mrs. Cooper's Island. Oh, and there's the village store. She walked down the short path to the edge of the mountain. He followed behind her, in awe of how her expression changed with each new discovery. Her whole being was completely alive and free of the anxiety she'd held on to earlier. She looked absolutely beautiful. If you go to the other side of the mountain, you can see Boston, he said. But it's too risky with the snow. He had done it one winter with Danny, he had never been more afraid in his life. When the trail became icy on the way back down, he and Danny got stuck. They couldn't go any further without risking falling, but if they didn't get off the mountain, they'd die of hypothermia. Being kids, they hadn't prepared at all for worst-case scenarios. They had candy bars and water, not even an extra set of gloves. Luckily, Sean's father found them, following their footprints once they didn't come home for dinner. Sean had never really prayed to God before, but that night he had thanked him in a long, heartfelt prayer. The next time Sean would pray would be when they were looking for Danny in the lake, bargaining with God to let them find Danny sitting on a log somewhere on the shore, waiting for them. How could such a good swimmer, a boy who lived and breathed that lake, die from drowning? People thought Mrs. Cooper kept the lighthouse lit as a reminder that the undercurrent could swipe even the best swimmer away. But Sean always thought she'd kept the light on for Danny. I saw her going to the lighthouse that night, she said out loud. What? Sean asked. Mrs. Cooper, she said. I happened to be looking at the lighthouse and saw her out that night. I should have called 911. Sean shook his head. Did you see her fall? Sonia shook her head. No, but I had this feeling something was wrong. She's lucky you did call, he reminded her. Shadow would have been all alone in the house. And he was almost certain Mrs. Cooper would have been dead by the time anyone had noticed her absence. She looked around. Is this where they have church services? He nodded, thinking of his mother's wish to have her funeral up there. Now they only do it on Easter Sunday. He walked to the very edge and pointed to a granite peak of another mountain. That's Cardigan, another great hike just around the corner. I'll take you there next. She smiled but shook her head. I'm afraid I'm leaving after this. What were the chances the two of them would meet like they had? Or that they had connected already? 
There was just something about her that made him want her to stay. He knew she had the cabin for at least a month, according to Don, who said she asked if she could extend her stay if necessary. She looked out of the lake. A hawk soared above them. I think it's best I head home. He forced a smile. Well, I hope you come back and visit. Will John allow me to come back? She asked. He's given you a stamp of approval by making his sandwiches. Sean took his arm and cleared the snow off the last bench, the one with the best view, and pulled out the blanket before setting it on top of the wood. He removed his jacket, warm from the hike and the bright sun. Sonia smiled as she sat down. Shadow jumped onto the bench and sat right next to her. She seems to like you, he said. Sonia rubbed Shadow's neck, which made Shadow look as though she were smiling. I like her too. He handed her one of the sandwiches, along with a plate and a spoon, then set down a plastic container filled with Shadow's kibble. The dog immediately jumped off the bench and began to chow down. What's the spoon for? she asked. For John's famous potato leek soup. Sean pulled out two bowls and a thermos filled with the creamy soup. He has a lot of famous foods, Sonia said, as he poured the soup into a thermos cup. That smells so good. She took the sandwich and dipped it into the soup, exactly how Sean would have eaten it. Mmm, that's delicious. They ate and talked. He talked about the academy and his roommates. Sonia told him about her first job as a teacher. I taught kindergarten. It must have been like herding cats, he said, grimacing at the thought. She laughed, and it sounded like a sweet melody to Sean. He needed to convince her to stay. He needed her to stay. You sure you have to leave so soon? He asked one last time. He didn't know what he was doing. He had work, then there was Mrs. Cooper, not to mention Vanessa. I need to go back, I'm afraid. She slanted her head at him. Thank you for bringing me here today. I really needed this. He shook his head. No worries. I just hope everything works out for you. She nodded, and he said nothing, like the chicken that he was. By the time they got back to the truck, he lost all nerve to tell her he'd like to get to know her better. I should get you back then. He wanted to ask her to dinner. The word sat on the tip of his tongue as he opened the passenger door for her. But instead, he said, Don't forget to buckle up. By the time they reached Don's cabin, Sonia sat comfortably in the seat, facing him. They had just finished talking about a murder mystery series they'd both read. I've never met another person who likes D.R. Smith, she said. He hadn't either. Another reason why he should convince her to stay. They had so much in common. But reluctantly, he got out of the truck and opened her door. Have a safe trip. He expected Sonia to go back inside the house, but she stood there next to him. Mind if I say goodbye to Shadow? She'd love that he said, opening the door and letting Shadow out. The dog rushed straight into Sonia's arms and started licking her face. Shadow, tell her how you really feel, he said. Sonia laughed and scratched Shadow's neck. I'm glad to see she's so happy. Well, she has a queen-size bed practically to herself, and a complimentary breakfast from John, Sean said. Oh my, you're a lucky girl. Sonia said to the dog. Shadow sat on the pavement, mouth wide open, tongue hanging out, and in complete happiness with Sonia petting her. When Sonia stood up from Shadow, he had an urge to reach out and pull her hand toward the truck. He should convince her to stick around for another hike and let her troubles go for another day. Give Mrs. Cooper my best when you see her next, Sonia said. I will, he said. And with a wave, Sonia left and walked back inside. Maybe he had read everything wrong, but he thought she really enjoyed today. That there might have been a spark between the two.
Last night at dinner, today on the hike, he had thought they'd had a great time together. Reason 742 of why he should forget about women. He never knew what they were thinking. He got into his truck, shaking his head that at 56 years old, he still had no clue about the opposite sex. And just as he pulled out of the cabin's driveway, Vanessa drove by. She stared him down with her usual angry face. This was for the best. He'd be better off by himself. He turned left, away from town, and took the highway. He'd bring Shadow with him to visit Mrs. Cooper. He didn't know if the hospital would allow a dog, but he'd at least try. With the angry face and the direction in which she was driving, he wanted to avoid going back to the house. The house he and Vanessa dreamt of hearing the little pitter-patter of feet in. The house where he'd found her sleeping with a neighbor. The house he wanted to burn down. The house he had been stuck living in for seven years alone. Sonia may not want to run away anymore. But that was all Sean wanted to do right then. Chapter 20 Sonia didn't listen to music or the news while driving back to Martha's Vineyard. She thought about the lighthouse and its light beaming across the moonlit snow. She thought about Mrs. Cooper and her recuperation. How would she ever be able to live on the island again? She thought about Shadow and how she would love to have a companion by her side. And she thought about Sean. A part of her wished she had stayed. What was she returning to anyway? Andrew clearly had his own life, and he didn't share any of it with her. And now Lila seemed to be getting along just fine with her boyfriend and his son. Even Pop seemed happier with his new family. And Sonia didn't fit into any of their lives. But she couldn't push off what she had run from. Her marriage. When Sonia reached the ferry, she could feel her anxiety growing. Jeff may not have spoken to her since she left, but his feelings would be clear the moment she stepped back into the house. He'd make sure she knew exactly how he felt. She just didn't know how he would show her. Would he cut her off? Tell her to leave the house he'd paid for? Would he continue with his life as if nothing had happened? She parked her car and went up to the main deck and grabbed a seat. A few weeks ago, she would have chartered a private jet when flying from Boston. She had a feeling that lifestyle was completely over. But she didn't mind. She'd never wanted it. The world where everyone judged her, where nothing was ever good enough, and she wasn't ever good enough. Not a good enough wife or mother or daughter or friend. She faced the water and stared out at the endless gray sea, breathing in the humid tang. In all those years she lived on the island, she had become used to the scent of the ocean. But now, returning from the fresh mountain air, she could almost taste the salt in the air. Sonia, a woman said from another row of seats. The woman's face was familiar, but Sonia couldn't place her name. By her sweater knits and store brand shoes, she knew it wasn't someone from Martha Vineyard's high society. Not that it mattered anymore. She didn't care what Jeff or anyone thought. Her days of worrying about who she talked to, who she kissed up to, who she didn't, were over. It's Wanda and Marty. Wanda placed her hand on the man's chest. Oh, yes, of course, Sonia said. She remembered the couple from the wedding. I'm sorry. I was just lost in my own thoughts. Are you returning to the island? Wanda asked. Yes, she said. Are you staying for the week? Unlike what most people thought, Sonia always stayed on the island. She didn't live in Boston with Jeff on the weekdays. She stayed, even when Jeff would stay in the city on the weekends. She stayed permanently on the island ever since Jeff's first extramarital affair. That's when it ended, she thought to herself. That's when my marriage really ended. When she stopped working on her marriage. When she hid on the island instead of just facing their problems. When she began to pretend 
instead of just being real. Pretend she was fine. Pretend she wasn't falling apart. Pretend what Jeff did didn't crush her. That's when her marriage ended. Hun, Mrs. Whitmore lives on the island full time, the woman's husband said. Sonia, please, Sonia corrected, trying to pinpoint how this man had that information. Oh, that's right. You live full time, just like Lila. Wanda gently hit her husband in the arm and got up from her chair. The couple moved to the seats next to her. We just adore Lila. Sonia smiled, but the pronoun we stilted her. This strange man and woman adored her daughter? She's pretty remarkable. Her heart stung as she listened to the woman explain Sunday dinners at Evelyn Rose's house. It's really a great time. You should join. Sonia blinked, unsure how to answer this strange woman's invitation. Not only was she a close talker, but it seemed odd that she'd invite someone to another person's house. I've heard they're always a good time, she said, holding the smile on her face and pushing her emotions back. Being married to Jeff all these years had taught her to put on a face and smile. She needed to change the subject. Were you two enjoying a day off the island? Wanda pulled down her shirt's collar and showed a device on her chest. Sonia immediately recognized from her mother's chemotherapy treatments. I go to Boston every once in a while to get a checkup, and they clean my port. The man took hold of her hand as he stared at Sonia, almost protectively. What would it have been like if she had gotten sick? Would Jeff travel on a ferry with her to receive treatments? Or would he just send her? He certainly wouldn't hold her hand. I'm sorry you're going through such a difficult time, Sonia said. Wanda waved her hand at her. Not difficult. Just another journey in life, that's all. Sonia noticed Wanda squeezed Marty's hand, and he squeezed hers back. The simple gesture made a lump lodge in Sonia's throat. She wanted that. She wanted someone she could rely on, someone who cared if she was okay, someone who would make time for her. Marty, why don't you go and grab us all some coffees? Wanda suggested. I'm fine, Sonia said, but Marty took off without another word. Now we can gab a bit, Wanda said putting her purse in her lap. Tell me what's going on. Sonia couldn't hide her shock. Excuse me? Wanda sighed. You've been staring out that window and haven't heard a word I've said for the past 20 minutes. Something's troubling you. Sonia shook her head. Just tired from traveling. Did this woman think she'd sit with perfect strangers and spill her story? Sonia looked for a way out of this conversation. I know you and your husband are going through something, Wanda said. Would you like to talk about it? Sonia should have known gossip would travel, but this woman could have only heard it from one source, her own family. Had Lila told this group of women, or had her father? Randy loved to hate Jeff. When my first husband, Bill, asked for a divorce, Wanda let out a single huff of a laugh. Sonia's body became heavy in her seat. Lila told these people Sonia had left Jeff. I thought I might die from a broken heart, Wanda smiled. I thought everything in my life was ending, and at first I was right. I had breast cancer. My friends didn't know how to handle my sickness and our divorce, so they stopped inviting me to the couple's events we used to attend, inviting me out for coffee alone instead. They'd avoid talking about Bill, which eventually led to them avoiding me altogether. I had never felt so alone in my life. Just as the word alone left Wanda's mouth, a feeling so raw, so real took hold of her. Sonia grabbed her chest. I hated him! but I wanted him to come back and give me my old life back.
Wanda said, not noticing Sonia's anxiety attack happening right in front of her. She just kept on talking. When I decided to come to the island, I thought if I met someone, I wouldn't be alone. But then I met Evelyn right here on the ferry. As Sonia's heart tried to jump out of her chest, she expected Wanda to tell the story of meeting her new husband, not about meeting a friend. And then we met Biddy, Wanda said, and smiled at the memory. Sonia wished this woman away so she could have her panic attack alone. She pulled out her phone to make up an excuse to leave. And I leaned into them, Wanda laughed. But it sure was hard. She smiled and leaned over, patting Sonia's hand that wasn't clutching her chest. You will get through this, she said. And if you need someone to help you, don't be afraid to reach out and lean in. Sonia jerked back, snatching her hand away. Thank you. That's kind of you to offer. She stood, not bothering with an excuse, and said, I need to go. She left before Wanda said anything else. Her hand still held her chest as she pushed her rapid breaths down, trying to keep it all together. That woman didn't know her. Wanda didn't know what she was going through. Sonia found another seat at the other end of the ferry. She didn't care if she looked like a jerk. Did Wanda really expect her to suddenly open up? Confess her feelings like a teenager? In public? The closer the ferry got to Martha's Vineyard, the more tension and anxiety tightened her body. She closed her eyes, thinking about the lake, the way the wind created footprints in the snow with the drifts, how the bright sun burned her eyes, even with sunglasses, how the crisp, fresh air chilled her lungs. When the ferry docked, she got into her car and went directly back to the house. She half expected the gate not to open when she arrived, but when it did open, her anxiety only increased. She parked the car and sat looking at the house. The front had been designed to wow. Large columns planked the entrance. Huge glass doors revealed the ocean beyond. The estate sprawled out on either side, and the house wrapped around a courtyard. Their architect had designed the build to resemble the fishermen's cottages, with clapboard and stone chimneys but the interior was nothing like the warm, cozy spaces. It was cold and big, and Sonia no longer wanted to stay there. She got out of her car and walked through the front door. The house hummed in silence as she stood in the two-story hall. The wall of windows in the great room revealed the cold gray sea. She walked upstairs with her bag and dropped it onto the master bed. She didn't know if she was going to stay the night or not. When she walked into her closet and turned on the light, she noticed all of Jeff's things had been removed from his own closet. All his suits and tuxedos, all his shirts and pants, and all his shoes that had sat lined together on the shelves were gone. She started opening drawers, one by one, and noticed that all of his things were cleaned out. She walked into the bathroom and opened his drawers. No more toothbrush or shaving cream. He took his shampoo and combs and manicure kit. His collection of watches and jewelry had been removed. Everything that was Jeff's was gone. She rushed downstairs to his office. When she opened the door, she gasped. The room was empty. All the furniture and items inside were gone, including the safe. All her jewelry, her rings and necklaces and earrings had been in that safe. Her hand covered her mouth as she turned in a circle. She took out her phone and dialed his number, but a woman answered. Mrs. Whitmore? Yes. Sonia's heart sped up. Who was this woman answering her husband's phone? Mr. Whitmore would like me to explain your next options, the woman said. Excuse me, but who are you? Sonia felt like she was in a nightmare. Where is my husband? I'm your husband's attorney, Eileen Hoffman. Your husband would like you to know he's allowing you to stay on the premise until you find a new home. What? Sonia couldn't believe this. He's allowing me? This is my home, and I know my rights, which means he needs to return all of my things before I call the police. 
Mrs. Whitmore, the woman said, there's no need to get the police involved. He's already talked to the judge about the fact you chose to move out of the family residence. She couldn't believe it. He knows I didn't move out. She had so many reasons to leave, but this moment had been one of the main reasons why she had stayed. Her shark attorney husband wouldn't stop until he was completely satisfied. Jeff was going to destroy her. Chapter 21 Wanda couldn't stop thinking about Sonia. She had probably come on a little too strong. She usually did, but she knew that woman was going through the thick of it. She remembered that feeling. It felt like she was drowning. Marty didn't seem to notice, but reminded her that if someone didn't want to talk, she couldn't force them to. She seems like a private person, he said, which seemed true. She's hurting, Wanda said, which was also true. She could feel it radiating out of Sonia's bones. Well, you can't help anyone unless they want it, Marty said, as he sat down in his recliner after dinner. Yes, you're right, she said, sitting in her spot on their couch. But she couldn't stop thinking of the woman throughout the night and into the next morning when she and the girls went for their walk. She was so sad. Hmm, Biddy said, shaking her head. Sure is hard to go through it alone. Wanda nodded. Marty thinks I need to leave her be. The women walked along their usual route along the edge of the water, all the way to the lighthouse on Greyhead Cliffs and back. The sun poked out of the clouds for a minute, making Wanda a bit warm, so she loosened her scarf. I've invited her to Sunday dinner, Wanda said, but I doubt she'll come. I've done the same, including Lila, Biddy said, pointing her finger at Wanda. It seems to me she's happy in her own misery. Evelyn nodded. Marty's right. Sometimes people don't want help. The signs sure pointed that way. Sometimes people did wallow in their own misery, and there was no way of helping them out. Maybe Marty and Biddy and Evelyn were all right. Maybe Sonia didn't want help. Well, we should still try to offer it, Wanda said. I would have never stayed here on the island if you two hadn't pushed me. You make it sound like we tortured you to stay, Biddy said, teasing. But Wanda wanted to make her point. No, that's not what I meant. Wanda stopped, one to catch her breath, and two to wrap up her scarf as the sun disappeared behind another cloud. But I wouldn't have gotten through these past two years as well as I had without you both supporting me. Who does Sonia have for support? Biddy put her hands on her hips. Let me talk to Randy. He probably doesn't realize what she's going through. Evelyn nodded. That's a good idea. And maybe I could invite her to a lady's lunch, Wanda said. Maybe if it's focused on something besides her, like how she came at Christmas, she'd be more willing to come. The ladies nodded in agreement. You're good people, Wanda, Biddy said. Wanda could feel warmth, not from the sun. It still hid behind the clouds but from her friends rallying together to help this woman. It can only help, Wanda said, a saying her own mother had said when volunteering or trying to help, and Wanda didn't want to do it. What if we had lunch at the bakery? No pressure kind of thing. Perfect, Evelyn said. Everyone loves a good pastry. When Wanda returned home, she asked her retired postman husband what Sonia's address was. She lives in the biggie on the hill in Cliffside Point, Marty said. The one with the fancy gates. Wanda knew exactly the house he referred to. She had always thought it was a bit tacky compared to the modest summer homes and cottages sprinkled around its compound. When she pulled up to the monstrosity, she could feel her heart beating as she approached the gates and pressed the button. She waited for what felt like a long time. Hello, a female voice said over the intercom. Yes, hello. I'm here to extend an invitation to Mrs. Whitmore, 
Wanda said into the intercom. Silence. She leaned out of the car's window to get closer and pressed the button again. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Wanda, the voice said. It's Sonia. Wanda got back into her seat to drive up. But the gate didn't open like Wanda had expected, and doubts washed through her. I'm having a ladies' lunch date tomorrow at one o'clock at Books and Bread, she said, pressing the button again. I'd love for you to join us. Thank you for the invitation, but I'm afraid I'm busy. Sonia didn't add any more details. Wanda wasn't sure if she was still listening or not, but she would try anyway. We'd love to see you there, so if you change your mind, thanks for stopping by, Sonia said, and the intercom went silent. Wanda waited a few more seconds to see if Sonia would continue talking, but the other end stayed silent, and after a minute, Wanda took the hint and put her car into reverse and left. The next day, Wanda showed up at the bakery with Biddy and Evelyn a half hour early. The three waited to order their lunches as they drank tea, seeing if Sonia would show. She didn't. Oh, well, Wanda said after they finished eating. We tried. Biddy patted Wanda on the hand. Don't feel bad. Sonia's always been a bit too good for everyone, if you ask me. I think she's just hurting, Wanda said. Wanda remembered the day Bill had left. How strange it had felt to be in the house without him. He would never again sit in his chair and watch television with her, or have dinner at the dining room table, or sleep next to her at night. The everyday duties and routines she had to do on her own had become daunting and overwhelming. She probably is, Biddy said. But a lot of people are going through things in life. Cancer, for one. How many times will we all include her only to be blown off? She never said she was going to come, Wanda reminded Biddy. She didn't answer the door for you, Evelyn reminded Wanda. What kind of person doesn't answer the door when a friend stops by? I was outside the gates, Wanda said. Wanda, Biddy shook her head. She's choosing to be closed off at this point. Wanda bit her bottom lip. I just know what she's going through. Evelyn nodded. It was nice you offered, but I think Biddy's right. I think Sonia Whitmore wants to be left alone. Chapter 22 Sonia had skipped the luncheon. Instead, she walked through her house, taking a mental inventory of all their possessions. Room after room, she walked in and stared out the windows, as thoughts perseverated in her head. Then she walked to the next room, and the cycle started over. She tried sleeping, but her mind raced throughout the night, and when the sun finally rose, she imagined the bright white light reflecting the sun off its crystals. She didn't know where to go, but she knew she had to get out of the house. Since she returned from New Hampshire, Document after document of divorce proceedings and temporary orders would arrive at the house each day. Jeff wanted to show her who was boss. She put on her new winter coat and gloves and took off for the beach with no specific destination in mind. She hadn't heard from Lila, which wasn't unusual, but she had a feeling Lila was upset about how she'd told her about the divorce. Yelling at her daughter wasn't her best moment as a mother, but she was tired, tired of being walked all over her entire marriage. And now as she leafed through the documents, in divorce as well. She was tired of being angry and taking it out on others. She was tired of trying to be the person everyone expected her to be. She was so tired. It wasn't until she reached the lighthouse on Greyhead Cliffs that she knew where she was going. The red brick lighthouse stood on the edge of the cliffs, towering over the boulders below. Waves pounded against the shore, spraying water against the rocks. Seagulls flew in the wind, crying out. She walked all the way up the path to the lighthouse, walking around the large structure that was at least ten times bigger than Mrs. Cooper's. 
She reached the door and jiggled the knob, not expecting it to be open. It wasn't. She then leaned against its door, hiding in the crevice of the doorframe, and looked out at the sea. The view of the Atlantic felt complicated compared to the view of Harmony Lake. The ocean water churned and foamed and hissed like a beast, whereas the lake sat quiet and still. The gray sea wouldn't let one forget its presence, where the lake hid all winter long. She had once felt the ocean run through her veins. Now she wanted nothing more than to never hear a wave again. She didn't know how long she stood leaning against the lighthouse looking out. But as she left, she turned around and took a picture of the lighthouse. She stared at its image, then sent it to Sean with a caption, Greyhead Lighthouse. Amazing, he texted right back. She noticed the dots flutter at the bottom, then disappear. She thought of sending another photo of the ocean, but with its dark gray clouds and gray sea, it didn't seem appealing. Besides, whatever she was thinking might come from it would be a mistake. She lived on Martha's Vineyard. He lived in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. She was certain Jeff would drag this divorce out and make her pay for leaving. She couldn't even think of getting involved right now. When she arrived at the house, she saw her father's car waiting at the gate. She could see Biddy in the driver's seat. She moaned, wishing she had kept going and going and... Stepping inside, she hit the gate's opener and waited for Randy in the garage. She met him at the passenger's door before he could open it. Hey, Dad, to what do I owe the pleasure? She glanced at Biddy. Everyone's telling me you're getting a divorce. Her father wasn't one for beating around the bush. Let's talk. Biddy handed him his cane and leaned over the passenger seat as he got out. Just give me a call when you're ready to come home. You can't just barge in here, she said, but he didn't listen. He shuffled across the driveway and into the garage. Biddy left without making eye contact with Sonia, which was just as well, because Sonia wasn't sure if she could be polite through this conversation. Biddy must have heard about her breakdown with Wanda. Of course, she'd tell Randy. Lila told me you left Jeff, Randy said as soon as they were inside. Yes. She crossed her fingers together and placed her hands in front of her. I've decided it's time to separate. She waited for what her conservative Catholic father had to say. What would her mother have thought? Her mother had died just months before Jeff's scandal. It had been the one silver lining in a veil of black. Her mother never had to hear about it. Jeff's affair had hit page six when his mistress, who had been his former assistant, claimed he had sexually harassed her and had her fired because she'd called the affair off. She had said Jeff pined after her, sent her expensive gifts, and took her on luxurious vacations. Sonia had been certain that Jeff had the affair, bought the jewelry and splurged on vacations, but she didn't believe he had fired her because it ended. Jeff was too selfish to care if the woman left him or not. He wouldn't risk harming his business because some woman broke up with him. The courts dismissed the case when the woman's story showed cracks. The kids had been in high school. Lila's whole personality had changed. She'd clung to her boyfriend, Joel. Andrew had lost his hero. All of their hearts had been broken, except Jeff's. Randy never talked about it. He yelled about it. He had yelled at Jeff in front of the household staff. Jeff had then banned Randy from the house. Randy scolded Sonia in front of the kids about her husband's mistakes. He loudly gave his opinion about her husband to anyone willing to listen. Have you hired an attorney? Randy asked, pulling out a chair at the kitchen table. She sat down across from him. No. Hmm. He tapped his finger against the wood surface. He probably has an army of attorneys at his beck and call. Jeff absolutely did. I wish I could hire Lila, Sonia said. She's doing such a good job helping Biddy. 
Sonia may be jealous of how Biddy fit in better with her family than she did, but she wouldn't be grudger of her own happiness. And from what Lila had told her, Biddy had gone through tough times after her husband had passed away. She just wished Lila might be able to give her the same amount of attention. Randy let out a heavy breath, a habit he did when he was disappointed in Sonia. Don't worry, I'll be just fine, she said, getting back up. She needed to stand and grab hold of something with her hands. Let me make a few calls, and I'll find you someone who can help, he said. I'll be fine, but thank you, she said again, a bit stronger this time. You have no idea what you're up against, Randy said. I don't care about any of this, Sonia held out her hands. I want none of his things. You helped build this man, so you're owed something for your time, Randy said. Do you really think the courts and judges who love Jeff are going to side with me? Sonia laughed. I have no chance, none. And honestly, Dad, I don't care. She didn't. Where are you going to live? He asked. She shrugged. I don't know. She had thought about it all night as she'd gone through the house. You can stay with me, he said. She let out a laugh at his suggestion. You have a full house already. She wasn't going back to her father's house. Then I'll give you the house, he said. I can find an apartment. Dad, she snapped. I don't want your help. Isn't that your biggest problem? He folded his hands together. You never accept help when you need it the most. She blinked at Randy, at the deja vu, remembering her own speech to Lila when she had gone through her breakup with her fiancé. You're one to talk. This isn't about me. No. This is about you only offering help when it fits your agenda. Sonia's hands started to shake. Sonia, that's not fair. He said calmly, so unlike Randy. Aren't you going to tell me how awful my husband is, or how bad my choices in life are, or how he ruined our family? No. I'm going to tell you how proud I am that you finally stood up for yourself. Randy looked into her eyes. You put everything you had into that marriage, more than most would have. The acknowledgement made her choke up, the tears springing to her eyes before she could stop them. She wiped a tear away, straightening her shoulders. But, he shook his head. There is no but, Sonia. I just want to help. Yes, well, I'm in a losing fight, I'm afraid. Sonia forced a smile, but there was no way she could hide her fears. He's going to ruin me, just like you said he would. I won't let him, Randy said. She knew her father believed it. Randy had been a force in the law community. But she had seen what Jeff could do when he felt slighted. She knew because he had destroyed his assistant. After she had accused him of harassment in the workplace, he took his gloves off and attacked her credibility, dragging up every little piece of dirt on the woman he could. There was no bar too low for Jeff. He went for blood and used all the advantages he had within the tight law community to destroy her. She went from harassed assistant to a money-hungry sex addict. At the time, Sonia hadn't cared what happened to the woman. That woman had tried to ruin her family. Why should Sonia have cared about her? But one night, as Jeff broke another promise, she had looked her up. The young assistant no longer worked in law, left Boston, and had moved out of the city. Jeff had done exactly what he'd set out to do, which was ruin her. And now he'd ruin Sonia. I want to walk away, she said. Is that what you're teaching your daughter? Randy said. To be a doormat? You offered help. 
but only if I left Jeff like you wanted me to. Sonia grabbed the back of the chair and eyed him down. I love you, Pops, but don't act like this great saint. You offered your way or the highway. That's right. He crossed his arms, leaning back in his chair. I offered you a place to live. I offered to help with the twins. You chose to stay with that man. And for what? My children, she yelled at him. I did everything for them. Do you think he'd let me take his kids? You should have left him years ago, he muttered. Sonia's mouth dropped in shock. After all these years, Sonia thought Randy knew the truth, but pretended not to know how she was emotionally abused. Jeff may never have touched her, but there had always been an invisible hand holding her down, a power dynamic she had lost through the affair. You lost it after Mom, and Jeff knew it. She didn't want to rehash old wounds, but he was the one who had brought it up. Besides, you haven't been in a court for over 20 years. Jeff knows every attorney and every judge and every police officer. I didn't lose it, Randy said, looking away. You could have told me that he was threatening to take the kids. You were so mad you wouldn't listen, she said, shaking her head, remembering it all like it was yesterday. Randy would only talk to her about the kids. Her friends only talked behind her back, pretending to support her, but trying to get the latest gossip. I couldn't have taken on Jeff. She didn't want to discuss it anymore. And I still can't. So I'm just going to hope the justice system will be kind and that it's enough. Sonia, you can't just lie on the ground and let him walk all over you. Randy put his hands on the table. You have to fight for yourself. She laughed at how he hadn't noticed how hard she had been fighting. I've got nothing left. As horrible as things had become, there was a very small part of her that still cared for Jeff, at least on some level. He was the father of her children, the provider of her beautiful life. When things were good, they were great. He had a beautiful side. She was certain no one else knew about besides her. Their family unit had been important to him. But the affair... Her jealousy, his career path, and the rest made the marriage disintegrate. Jeff had changed. Sonia had changed. The twins had changed. I started a friendship with Tommy. She needed to tell the truth. She couldn't hide it any longer. It would eventually come out. What kind of a friendship? Randy's eyes shot open. When the news first broke about Jeff's whole affair, I ran into him at an event, and he caught me crying, Sonia said, still ashamed for falling apart that afternoon in the pantry. He had shared that he had gone through something similar with his wife Paula, she said. We ended up meeting for coffee another time, and he just continued to check in, and it felt nice, really nice, because I was so lonely. You weren't talking to me. She wrung her hands on the railing of the chair. The twins hated me. Jeff avoided me at all costs. The media was hunting me for the perfect portrayal of a scorned wife. Did you two have an affair? Randy asked. She shook her head. Not physically, but maybe emotionally. I depended on him for a time. But Jeff found out. And I promised to end things, and I did. Randy rubbed his hands together. What's this got to do with fighting for what you deserve? When that happened, he threatened to tell the court I had an affair, Sonia said, trying to make him understand. It would have been all over the gossip columns. Tommy's name would have been dragged through this mess. Randy scowled. He threatened you? After what he did to you, why didn't you come to me? Sonia looked away, ashamed. Jeff would crush me. He will crush me. There was no doubt in her mind. If she didn't stay with him, 
he would do whatever he had in his power to make her miserable. He has all the power. She didn't need to point it out. What exactly has Jeff done up to this point? She walked to the counter and handed over the papers Jeff had left for her. Don't pack anything up, Randy said, leafing through the papers. We're going to come up with a plan. Chapter 23 Biddy had watched Randy's reaction at breakfast as Lila told him about Sonia leaving Jeff and how Sonia had run away to a cabin in the woods and had subsequently returned. He stayed quiet for a moment, taking in the information. For all the things that man said about his son-in-law, Biddy expected him to do a little jig. But suddenly he teared up and had a little cry. Pops, are you going to be okay? Lila asked. What's wrong with Pops? DJ asked, confused by the emotion. Drake picked up DJ's plate and his own and said, Let's go eat in the kitchen. I'll let you watch cartoons before school. Okay. DJ didn't even argue. He just grabbed his orange juice. Randy wiped his eyes and composed himself, then looked at Lila. Does she have counsel yet? Lila shrugged. I don't know. The creases on Randy's face deepened. He looked at Biddy across the table. Funny how she could read the 82-year-old's mind. Let me finish cleaning up, Biddy said, standing from her seat. Then I'll drive you to her house. I'll clean up, Drake said from behind her. I don't need to get to the bakery until later. Biddy smiled at her son. Go get all your law books, Randy said to Lila. Get a hold of your brother and meet me back here. Andrew's probably working, Lila said. Besides, Pops, she doesn't want our help. All you can do is offer, Biddy said to Lila. She didn't want to be involved in Randy's family situation, especially since Sonia clearly didn't want her involvement, but she also knew the family's relationship had been strained over the years. And over the past few weeks, Biddy had seen Sonia try. She wasn't perfect by any means, but if there was one thing Biddy could relate to, one woman to another, it was being a mother. We need to be there for her. Lila looked doubtful. She's not going to want our help. I'm going to talk to her. Randy didn't even seem to consider that Sonia may not want his help. Randy may be an old fool most of the time, but he was a natural leader. He took charge of the situation right away. When the bus picked up DJ, Lila left with Drake to go back to her apartment, and Biddy grabbed her keys. She hadn't told Randy about the lunch Wanda had tried to set up, or how Wanda had seen Sonia on the ferry upset. She shouldn't get further involved. When she dropped Randy off at the house, she decided to call Tommy. They'd been hanging out more and more. The day was beautiful. Good morning, he said, picking up on the first ring. Good morning, she said in her sweetest tone. How do you feel about grabbing lunch? I feel pretty good about that, he said. How do you feel about having lunch here? She smiled. That sounds perfect. When she arrived at Tommy's place, he stood waiting for her on his porch. Welcome back, he said, walking down the front stoop to her as she got out of the car. She handed over a box of pastries she had picked up at the bakery. I couldn't help myself. Tommy kissed Biddy on the cheek and led her inside by placing his hand on the small of her back. Even in her goose-feathered down coat, she could feel the electricity from his touch. Biddy walked further into the house and heard the fire crackling from the wood stove. Make yourself comfortable while I finish up lunch, Tommy said, as he closed the door and pointed to the living room. Tommy's house was the typical New England cape. Small, boxy rooms, but it felt cozy and comfortable. Along the wall sat three guitars in their stands, and the other wall had a shelf of books and trinkets. Photographs of Tommy with friends and family, had been placed about the room. She knew his wife had died a few years ago, but she didn't ask about it, 
and Tommy never offered details, which was okay by her. If he wanted to talk about it at some point, she'd be open to listen. She understood. She didn't want to talk about her past much either. A photograph of Tommy standing at the lighthouse with a young woman sat on the shelves. She studied it. His arm wrapped around her shoulder. She beamed into the camera, and he beamed at her. She had been beautiful. Tommy walked into the room with a platter of cheese and crackers. Biddy jumped, moving away from the photograph, feeling strange, as if she were snooping. You know how to get to a lady's heart, she said, grabbing a cracker and a slice of cheddar, once he set it down on the table. He laughed and looked at the photograph she'd been eyeing. That's my late wife, Paula. She is beautiful, Biddy said. The brunette woman smiled wide in the photograph. You're quite handsome yourself. She pointed at the photograph, admiring the younger version of Tommy. It's crazy how I still feel like that boy. He walked to her with a glass of wine and handed it to her. Wine? This early? She asked. It's five o'clock somewhere. He lifted his own glass to hers and looked her in the eyes. Thank you for coming over and having lunch with me. The energy radiating from his eyes stole her breath. She almost said a joke to lighten her nerves, but instead she clicked her glass against his and said, Thank you. Tommy gave her a wink, and Biddy couldn't help but blush. Something about Tommy just did that to her. He made her feel like a kid again. Lunch should be ready in a few minutes, Tommy said as he walked back into the kitchen. She stayed in the living room, exploring and studying Tommy's house. She bent sideways to read the titles of his books. Books about music and art and literature were placed neatly onto the shelves. Biographies, memoirs, and essays sat in one section, with science fiction and historical fiction in another. She moved past the shelves and went back to the photographs. She knew Tommy had never had children, but many of the photographs were of young kids at the beach. Who are these children? she asked. Those are my sister's kids and grandchildren, Tommy said from the kitchen. They come to the island every summer. Did you grow up on the island? she asked. I did, but left to make it big, Tommy said. Came back when I didn't. Did you meet your wife here? Biddy waited for his response. No, he said. She and I met in New York. Biddy looked back at her photograph. She looked too young to be dead. I'm so sorry she's passed, Biddy said. Tommy didn't say anything from the kitchen, which made Biddy question if she shouldn't have said anything at all. Maybe he wasn't ready. The two had known each other long enough, she thought, but men were funny. Richard had never spoken about his feelings with her. Her son Drake didn't speak about feelings. Why did she expect Tommy to be different? He walked out of the kitchen with a bowl in each hand. Let's eat. A creamy, rich aroma floated from the dining room to where she stood. How can I help? She walked to the table and placed her glass down. Just help yourself while I get the rest he said. There on the table sat a chowder so rich and thick that she wondered if it would stay in the bowl if she flipped it upside down. This looks delicious. He came out with two plates of salad. I caught the clams this morning, Tommy said, putting down the plates next to the soup. A vase of flowers and a lit candle had been set up on the table. You did this all for me? Of course he said. How's everyone over at your place? Biddy took her first taste of chowder and moaned in delight. Crazy, as usual. Randy's quite a character, Tommy said, dipping crusty bread into the soup. Biddy had heard the two knew each other from fishing, but she couldn't help but wonder what the connection with Sonia had been. Had they known each other from growing up on the island? Or had they connected since his return? 
It looks like his daughter Sonia is getting divorced, she said, feeling a bit like a gossip, but Tommy's reaction was immediate. So, she finally left him, he said. Then he went back to eating. I've never met the man. She thought it strange, considering she had spent the holidays with his family. I don't think I have more than once or twice, Tommy said. I don't think he was ever around. His tone was obvious to Biddy. She didn't want to rush to judgment, but she was certain something had happened between Sonia and him. How do you know Sonia again? She asked, as if he had told her and she'd forgotten. But he hadn't told her. Just through living on the island, he said. She nodded, pretending not to notice Tommy not really answering the question. At 64, she didn't have time to tiptoe around feelings. She may not have men in her life that share their feelings, but that's not how she wanted her relationships to go any longer. She wanted someone who'd tell her all his secrets, and hers to him. She wanted a man who'd be willing to lay it all out there. Secrets create walls. Things left in the dark will be found. The rest of the lunch had been lovely. Tommy put on a record as they sat and talked about the island, about art and nursing, and then more about the island. He brought out the wine and was about to fill her glass when she placed her hand over its mouth. Thanks, but I'm going to have to get going soon, she said. Oh, Tommy frowned. I thought we were having a nice time. We are, she said, but she wasn't being truthful. And isn't that what she wanted from him? Look, Tommy, I'm really enjoying your company, but I think I'm looking for something a bit more than you're willing to give. Tommy's head jerked back in surprise. What do you mean? I thought we had a good thing going. She sighed. The afternoon had been wonderful. He'd had flowers in a vase, for goodness sakes. Homemade chowder just for her, a chilled wine she knew had been selected for her tastes. She played with her hands, thinking how to say what she felt. I really enjoy our friendship, but I'm looking for something deeper. He took her hands. I am too. She looked in his eyes as he held her hand. She really didn't know this man at all, and it wasn't for lack of trying but his unwillingness to share. I really like you, Biddy, he said. He looked confused. She patted his hand. I really like you too, but I have enough friends. He leaned over and kissed her, taking his hand and cradling her chin in his palm. He kissed her long, passionately, and her toes curled as he pulled away. Wow, she said, catching her breath. That was nice. He smiled, thinking he had fixed things, but it only confirmed her fears. This wasn't supposed to be just lunch. I should go, she said, standing up. Biddy, what's going on? Tommy's forehead creased. I don't understand what's happening. I feel like you're not willing to share your life with me, Biddy said. I'm having you over for lunch in my house. You skate around details of your life that seem significant to me, Biddy said. And that's how acquaintances act, not someone in a relationship. He moved further away from her on the couch, his own posture changing as he sat back. What do you want me to tell you? I don't know. Biddy felt stupid, because she didn't know what she wanted him to tell her. But I feel like I don't even know you, and we've been dating for a while now. You know I love music, and I grew up on this island. You know my wife passed away. Biddy turned and faced him. Yes, but that's all surface. Why did men not talk about feelings? Surface stuff? His back stiffened. He rubbed his hand on the back of the couch. I want to know you. 
she placed her hand onto his chest, hoping that would loosen his posture, but he didn't look at her. She couldn't read if he was upset or not, but the silence made her uncomfortable. I really like you, she said. I just want to get to know all of you. What do you want to know? he asked. What's up with you and Sonia? She looked straight at him. He took in a deep breath and said, Sonia and I have history. She knew it. The Christmas party the night before Drake and DJ had left for Oklahoma, he and Sonia had exchanged a look. I caught Paula having an affair before she got sick. And when I saw the news about Jeff's affair, I felt bad for Sonia, he began. But then she hired the band for a charity gig, and Jeff didn't show up. When I went to get the check, I found her crying in the pantry of her kitchen. Biddy's heart melted at the thought of Tommy finding hard, stiff Sonia in the pantry falling apart. I knew her a little because of Randy, and I knew who she was. He stopped. I didn't want to leave her there crying, so I talked to her, and it turned out she was feeling exactly what I was feeling with my own marriage with Paula. We started our own little support group and would meet for coffee and stuff. Her husband hired a private investigator, and he took photographs, threatening to say we had an affair if she left him. He wiped his hands on his thighs. It got pretty ugly after that. All you did was have coffee, Biddy didn't understand. So what? It wouldn't matter on page six, Tommy said. Then Paula got sick. And that's when Sonia's situation hit home to Biddy. What? He'd be able to publish that in the newspaper? His affair hit the local news for months, Tommy said. Biddy hadn't heard this. His affair? Tommy nodded. Every news station would start the day with his trial. Trial? What did he do? But he couldn't imagine. Apparently, he ended his relationship with his secretary by firing her, Tommy said. Biddy's jaw dropped. And Sonia stayed with him? Now she understood the deep strain between Randy and Sonia. Randy couldn't stand that she'd stayed with that man. Biddy couldn't judge. She'd stayed longer than she should have. But she hadn't had a penny to her name. She'd had to stay in shelters and seek help from friends when she'd left Drake's father. Sonia had multiple houses and a private jet in her family. And she had Randy. I think she stayed with him because of the twins. His shoulders drooped. Partly because of our friendship. We never crossed the line of friendship. But the truth is, I don't really know what was happening. But when she told me about Jeff and the private investigator and his threats, he ran his hand through his hair. I got mad, really mad. Paula had just been diagnosed, and I didn't like that someone had taken my picture with her in a way that made it look like more than what it was. And I said some things I regret. Biddy pictured a man sneaking around in bushes, but it probably was much more obvious and scarier. I would have been upset as well, he shook his head. But I lost it on Sonia, who was just as much a victim as I was in the whole mess. Biddy didn't know what to say. I'm so sorry. I didn't want to say anything because I was still married to Paula. And I didn't want you to think negatively about me or about Paula or Sonia. She reached across the cushion that separated the two of them and wrapped her hand around his. I think you are an amazing guy. He took his other hand and played with hers. I've had it all, and it was ripped out of my hands. So I'm just a little weary. Biddy intertwined her fingers with his. Well, you're in good hands. 
because I'm a sucker for the weary. He twisted his face. Does the thing with Sonia change things? She shook her head, then leaned over, taking her free hand and brushing his beard with the back of it. Would you like to have dinner with me tonight? He leaned in and kissed Biddy. I'd love that. Chapter 24 Harper let the boat sway her back and forth as she went through her things, wondering what she would do if she could do things over. By a boat, she thought to herself. The calming effect that the boat had made her more anxious about leaving it. She loved Linda, just as much as she loved Joan. The boat gave her a sense of peace she never had at her father's place, which had always been her Aunt Martha's place, a place where her aunt lost her mind, a place where she had been forced to start over at a whole new school with a whole new group of friends in a whole new town. She wanted to live on Linda forever, sway into the sunset and be at peace. But living on the boat and not thinking about Andrew was a lost cause, because it was a constant reminder of him. She didn't want to think about him and how close to perfect everything had been and how she lost it, or how much she missed him. He hadn't called or texted. Not that she expected him to. She was the one who broke up with him. She hadn't called or texted. But in the back of her mind, she thought, maybe he'd be the one who understood her breakdown and come back not run away and never return. No, Harper thought, that was only her mother. But not all mothers. Not Evelyn, who had stopped by with a casserole and a pot of tulips to brighten her day. Harper didn't deserve a mother like Evelyn. She didn't even remember Evelyn's birthday. She hardly remembered her dad's. It was Tanya's birthday she never forgot. Valentine's Day. She thought about calling Tanya, but it'd be more to antagonize her mother at this point than anything else, since she knew her mother wouldn't pick up. But a real urge to talk to Tanya kept stirring inside her, a feeling that wouldn't go away, that had been building up since she called Charlie. She wanted to let her have it. Like Lila at the Christmas party last year, say everything you ever wanted and drop the mic. She should call her to get it over with. Why didn't she come out? Why didn't she even call Harper to tell her herself? Did she even want to see her daughter? Did she even love her anymore? Did she love her mother? Yes. That's why her hand clung to the phone, unable to find the courage to just call her mother and give it to her. Deep down, the little girl wanted her mother to love her. Once, when Harper was six, she had stayed home from school sick with Tanya, who stayed on the phone most of the day talking to her friends, complaining about being a mother. I have to take time off because she has the sniffles, Tanya said into the phone to one of her many friends she met up with after work. Harper didn't just have the sniffles, but a wicked ear infection and high temperature. She remembered how much pain she had been in and how badly she wanted her mother to sit with her and hold her. All Tanya did was complain about having to take care of her. All she's doing is sitting around, she continued with the friend. All Harper wanted at that moment was for Charlie to come home. When he did, Tanya immediately got ready to go out, complaining about being Harper's mother. I need to get out. Tanya swiped up the keys and slammed the door behind her. I don't think she loves me. Harper said to Charlie once he walked into the apartment's living room. That's not true, he said, sitting next to her on the couch, tucking the blanket in around her. He put his arm around her just so her body fit in the crook of his arm. She took the day off from work to take care of you. Will you watch me tomorrow? She asked, but it was more of a plea. Please? Charlie wrapped his arm around and pulled her into his chest. Of course I will. Harper couldn't leave the island. She couldn't leave her dad. 
She was the one who needed him. What if she got sick or hurt or dumped? Charlie had always been there for her. Harper needed her dad more than she needed a guy. She grabbed a tissue to dot her eyes and blow her nose when she noticed Lila walking up towards the boat. Lila held a bag in her hands and a tray with two coffees. I'm coming in, Lila said as soon as she stepped onto the boat's deck. Fine, Harper said, opening the sliding door from the booth she sat in. Come in. Hello, Joan, Lila said to Joan, who sat in the cabinet that Harper had started cleaning out. What are you doing? Lila asked. The small space looked as though a bomb had gone off. I'm packing. Miscellaneous items were strewn across the tabletop where she dumped out a drawer. Oh, skip bow, Lila said, picking up the card game. This is always a good one. What's up? Harper didn't want to speed things along unnaturally, but she was curious what Lila wanted. Since the last time they talked, it hadn't gone so well. Lila set the bag on the booth and sat down across from Harper. I'm sorry. Harper shook her head. I'm sorry, too. I shouldn't have butted into your relationship with Andrew. Lila pulled out two chocolate pastries and passed a tall cup across the table. I got chai, Lila said. Harper gave a half smile. Thanks. The two sipped their drinks in silence as the boat swayed back and forth. Harper spun a small eyeglass screwdriver. How is Andrew? Lila shrugged. Miserable. Harper's stomach twisted. She wanted so badly to confess how much she missed him, tell Lila everything she regretted and wished she could do over. But what would that do? Andrew would figure out she was a nutcase soon enough. He misses you, Lila said. He'll get over it, Harper thought. Oh. I thought we could do something together, Lila said, and pulled out a notebook from the bottom of the bag. She pushed it across the table towards Harper. She then pulled out a miniature ship, one of those fancy replicas of one of the tall ships from long ago. It's a toy boat I found in my dad's office, and I thought I'd write down all the things I want to let go and burn them up in the sea, like the Vikings did with the dead. Very symbolic, Harper said, smiling at the idea of burning Lila's father's toy while also following a sailor's tradition. Let's do it, Harper said, getting out of the seat. Joan, we'll be back. Lila reached out and grabbed Harper's hand, pulling her back into the seat. Write down your things first, Lila said, passing over a pen. It's freezing. Do you have a lighter? Harper asked. Lila nodded. Harper thought of the first thing she'd write. She stared at the blue lines of the white, crisp paper. Writing had been Harper's saving grace as a kid. It had been the only way to get her feelings out. How could she explain to Charlie how lonely she felt, even in his arms? She'd write a story. Send her protagonist to give her mother a piece of her mind. She peeked over to Lila, who wrote furiously on the paper. Every once in a while, she'd rip it out of the notebook and fold it up into small, tiny squares and tuck them into the ship, then write furiously again. Tanya. Harper wrote smack in the middle of the page. She was going to let Tanya go. Thanks for coming over, Harper said, folding the paper in half and half again. Would Andrew mind you hanging out with me? You were my friend first, Lila said, but she shook her head. He would always want me to be your friend. Harper made a face as she casted her eyes down. She didn't know what to say. It really had nothing to do with him. A tear slipped down her cheek, faster than her hand could grab it. I'm just so messed up, you know. Lila took Harper's hand and squeezed it. We all love you, Harper. Do you know that? Harper could feel her jaw sting as more tears flooded her eyes. She nodded, but the truth was, 
Harper questioned that love every day of her life. Every day. She was so tired of always wondering when they were going to leave. My dad is all I have, Harper said, her chin wobbly. All I've ever had. Lila's eyes filled with moisture. You have us. Even Andrew. Seriously. You two will always be friends. I ruined that, Harper shook her head. It's too late. Lila squeezed again. You know that's not true. It's never too late to tell someone how you feel. Harper reached across the small walkway and grabbed the tissue box. Both women took one and blew their noses. Lila slid the notebook over to Harper and ripped out another clean page. Come on, let's burn stuff. This time, Harper wrote for a while as Lila talked to Joan. She decided to write a letter to her mother, but it ended up being a letter to Harper, the little girl, apologizing for taking everything out on her. She apologized for blaming herself for all the things her mother did. When she finished, she stuffed the letter inside the toy ship. She expected to feel heavy, negative, angry until the fire burned it, but instead, she felt light, slightly better than before. As she and Lila put their coats on to head to the beach, Lila looked around the boat. You don't have to leave Pop's boat. Not yet, anyways. Harper shrugged. I have to figure things out. Lila nodded. The women walked down the docks as a soft snow dusted the ground. The beach wasn't exactly closed, but it wasn't exactly open either. Snow covered the sandy beach up until the tide. They walked up to the water's edge and looked out at the setting sun. The waves lapped softly up against the shore. Reds and oranges filled the sky and reflected off the water in the ribbons of wet sand. Lila pulled out a lighter and handed it over to Harper. Lila held the heavy toy ship in her hands. How much is that thing? Harper asked, second-guessing this idea. Not enough to keep. Lila held out the ship to the lighter. My parents are getting divorced. What? Harper couldn't believe it. Here she was feeling sorry for herself when Lila and Andrew were going through their own stuff. Are you okay? Lila shrugged. Apparently, my dad doesn't want any of the things in our house, says his assistant. Lila held up the ship, turning it to get a good look. So I stole this from his office. Let's burn it. Harper snapped the igniter, and a golden flame lit up under Harper's letter. Once the flame took hold, Lila set the ship into the water. At first, it swayed back and forth, but soon the waves pulled it out from the shore and the two friends stood side by side, arms wrapped around each other's waist. Lila rested her head on Harper's shoulder as they watched it burn in the sea. Chapter 25 Sonia didn't leave her home. In fact, she made Randy stay and walk through the whole house. They took pictures of the empty spaces where Jeff had cleaned out his belongings, and he went through all the paperwork. He doesn't want to ruin you, Randy said, taking off his glasses after going through the paperwork for over an hour. He's being very reasonable for the most part. He rubbed the bridge of his nose. Sonia knew there was a but involved. And, she asked. Basically, he's asking you to file a no-fault divorce. Which means you don't bring up the adultery, Randy said. If you agree to do it that way, he'll be reasonable. On the other hand, if you claim he's at fault, his gloves will come off. It was a lot to process. She looked at her father, who seemed fatigued from working all day. Do you want to have dinner? Oh, I'll call Biddy, he said. She's probably got something cooking. What if I told you I made Mom's chicken pot pie yesterday? Sonia had cooked four the night before. One for each of the twins, one for Pops and Biddy, and then one for herself. 
She hadn't cooked or baked in a long time. I even made Grandma win his ginger snaps. Randy's eyes opened wide. With the frosting? She nodded. Should we start with them? Randy's eyes suddenly moistened. I haven't had a ginger snap for years. She smiled. I'll make some coffee and turn on the oven. I think there's a Patriots game on. Nothing goes better with a ginger snap than some milk, he said, rubbing his hands together. She set down a cut crystal dish and removed its top. The warm scents of spices and ginger lingered in the air as Randy grabbed his handkerchief and dotted his eyes with the silk cloth. She had forgotten her father's habit of always having one on hand. As a little girl, she had never seen Randy emotional, never once cry. The only times he used it was when he took it out of his pocket and gave it to her mother. The gesture had been the definition of their relationship. He'd carried the handkerchief just in case she needed it. I miss Mom so much, Sonia said, setting down a glass of milk in front of Randy. You hear things get easier, but I miss her just as much as I did when she first passed away. Randy took a cookie, but didn't eat it. Instead, he set it onto the decorative plate and reached out for Sonia's hand. He shook it, hard, squeezing his fingers around hers. That's how I've felt since you've cut yourself off from us. I've cut myself off? Sonia couldn't stop her defensive reaction. His eyes filled with tears, and it made her sit. He blew his nose. I deserved it, the way I treated you when it all broke on the news. I should have stayed by your side, but I... Sonia wanted this to stop wanted her father to put his emotions back in the pocket. It's fine, Dad. Don't worry about it. I've lost ten years. He was crying harder. Dad, don't, she said. He held on to her, sobbing into her chest. She wrapped her arms around him, not knowing what else to do, but remembering how good it felt when Sean had done it for her. She needed his arms to hold her together. I love you, Pops. I will always love you. She did love her father. I love you, he said. Randy patted her back as she held on to him. She held her arms a second longer than she felt he wanted, but she didn't want to drag it out either. I'm sorry for not helping you sooner, he said. Sonia had waited for this moment for so long but now she wanted it to stop and to never hear about it again. She picked up a ginger snap and bit into it. They're not like Mom's, she said, chewing the cookie. Randy took one and judged for himself. They're even better. Chapter 26 After Sonia, the beautiful stranger, left town, things went right back to normal until he got the call. Sean, said Melinda, Mrs. Cooper's nurse. It doesn't look good. I think you might want to prepare whatever family Mrs. Cooper has left. But Sean wasn't certain there was family left. He stopped by the village store to talk to John first. Looks like Mrs. Cooper may not make it through the night, Sean said. John nodded. I bet she's ready to be back with Danny. And Fred. Sean said, his whole being flooded with guilt. He should be rushing to Mrs. Cooper's side. She lost her son, who was his best friend, then her husband, and lived alone on an island for 40 years. What's gonna happen to the dog? John asked. Sean didn't know, honestly. Being the police chief of a small village may seem easy peasy, but he had to do the work of many because of the village's budget. He didn't have time for a dog. I'll probably have to find someone to adopt it, Sean said. Know a nice family who wants a pet? I'll ask around. John's forehead creased as he shook his head. What a shame. Sean nodded, but he couldn't procrastinate any longer. He needed to head to the hospital. 
I should head back to Plymouth. John gave Sean a salute when the bell hanging on the door hit the glass. Sean Monahan, who do you think you are? Sean didn't even need to turn around when he heard the voice. Good evening, Mayor, he said turning to face an angry Vanessa. Her typical face twisted like she smelled a fart. You have no authority to fire town workers. She pointed her finger at him. A groan came out of John, and he walked to the back of the kitchen, leaving them alone in the store. I can when you send me to do your business, Sean said. He didn't have time for this. Whatever, Vanessa, hire him back. Do whatever you want. I don't care anymore. He went to walk by her, but she crossed her arms against her chest, blocking his way to the door. It's not unusual for a town selectman to ask the chief of police to help with matters, Vanessa said. Sean hung his head, shaking it at the situation. I'm done doing your dirty work. Her mouth dropped. I didn't realize you were so miserable helping me out. There she goes, he thought to himself. The typical way she deflected the situation. Make it his fault. Good night, Vanessa, he said. He turned around and walked the other way. Where are you going? She asked him. Out the back door, he said, and kept walking straight to the back room, past the storage closet, and John hiding, and out the back door. But when he walked around the store to his cruiser, Vanessa stood at the driver's door. John just told me about Mrs. Cooper, she said, her tone completely different, her face sympathetic and caring. Let me go to the hospital with you. Sean thought about the offer as he looked at his ex-wife, waiting for the way his feelings always returned when the sweet Vanessa showed up. It would be nice to have someone there with him, with her. Vanessa had known Bonnie as long as he had, maybe even longer. Sure, he said, shrugging, completely unsure if he could be in the same vehicle for more than 30 minutes with her. But I don't want to talk about Billy for the rest of my life with you. She made a face. A bit dramatic, don't you think? He gave her a hard look. Not a word. She held up her hands. Fine, I won't speak about Billy. He opened his door and let Vanessa get in on her own. He turned on the cruiser, letting it run for a bit. Both of their breaths glowed in the village store light. Then he pulled in reverse and drove toward Route 3. So how did Bonnie fall? Vanessa asked after a long, peaceful silence. I'm not exactly sure, he said. And she broke her hip? Vanessa asked. Poor Mrs. Cooper. He nodded. She broke some ribs, her arm. Someone called about her, so I did a wellness check. He didn't use Sonia's name on purpose. He didn't want to start another fight. Maybe we should talk about wellness checks at the next town council meeting, Vanessa said. Maybe that could be something we do for our elderly citizens. Because I have so much time to check in on everyone, Sean said, grumbling out the words. Did she not realize... All her new and fresh ideas for the community meant he had to do it? I didn't say it would have to be part of your job. Vanessa adjusted her position and faced the window. He squeezed the wheel, anger rising. He slowed down at the next street, turning on his blinker and began to pull in. What are you doing? she asked. I'm bringing you back to your car, he said, turning the vehicle around. I think Bonnie deserves some peace in her final hours. I can't fight. She held up her hands again. Fine, I promise I'll be nice. He let out a loud sigh. Seriously, she said urgently, placing her hand on his arm. He looked down at her touch, and she removed her hand. Just a few weeks ago, a touch like that might have triggered old feelings in him. Vanessa had a way to put a spell on him. But tonight, he felt nothing. Vanessa turned to him. I'm sorry. I promise I won't fight with you for the rest of the night. He didn't move the truck. 
instead letting the blinker continue to click in the direction of the village store, the light reflecting off the trees. With a heavy sigh, he turned toward the hospital, and they drove in silence the rest of the ride. She's on morphine, Nurse Belinda said as she met him and Vanessa outside the hospital room. At this point, we're trying to make her comfortable. The doctor will be here in a minute. The nurse hurried down the hall, leaving Sean and Vanessa standing outside the door. He didn't move inside. As a police officer, he had faced death more times than he had expected. Mostly car accidents on the highway. Some had been wellness checks. But the worst moments he had experienced were right before the person died. He'd held on to a young male's hand after an accident, waiting for an ambulance. The teenager had been so scared to die, and Sean knew from the severity of his injuries that he wasn't going to make it. He sat on the ground next to him, holding his hands, chanting, You're going to be just fine. The ambulance is coming any minute. Hold on. Don't let go. Keep your eyes open. You're going to be just fine. But the young man's eyes had shot open, and he'd struggled for his last breath. Sean had performed CPR as soon as he'd stopped breathing, continuing until the ambulance arrived. He didn't know if he'd ever get over that night. Then two months later, he sat holding his father's hand as he'd taken his last breath. He looked into the room, hearing the machines running and beeping, the oxygen's rhythmic sound pumping air into Bonnie's chest. She looked so different. Not the self-sufficient woman he knew, but a mere shell of her. He didn't need to be there. Mrs. Cooper wouldn't even know he was there. Who was expecting Sean Monahan to be this woman's final caregiver anyway? Vanessa placed her hand on his back. Danny is probably so glad you came. The backs of his eyes burned as soon as she said it. Danny wouldn't want his mother to die by herself. He would have wanted her to have someone there for her. As much as he hated Vanessa sometimes, he loved her just as much. She knew he needed a gentle reminder of why he came. I'll be right out here, she said, pointing to the set of chairs down the hall. He gave her a nod, waiting for her to leave, and stepped into the room. He stood in front of Bonnie's bed and stuffed his hands into his pockets, examining the room. Then he sat down in the chair next to her. I'm here, Mrs. Cooper, he said. With a deep breath, he reached out for her hand that rested beside her on the bed. Don't worry about Shadow. I'll take real good care of her. He leaned on the bed and decided to do the one thing he knew Bonnie would love, tell her stories about Danny and him as kids. Do you remember the time Danny decided to build his own treehouse? Sean asked. He gave her a moment and continued telling the story. He went from one story to the next, laughing at the shenanigans they had pulled throughout their friendship. Bonnie Cooper took her last breath at the end of one of Sean's stories that night. He held her hand the whole time, wishing her well once she left. Say hi to Danny for me, he whispered into her ear. When the nurses and doctors arrived, he left the room and went to find Vanessa, who was slumped over a magazine, half asleep, using her coat as a blanket. Hey, he said. She looked up and knew right away. I'm so sorry. She stood, and for the first time in years, she put her arms around Sean, and the two embraced each other. When they separated, he stepped back, wiping some of the moisture from his eyes. He suddenly felt the weight of his exhaustion hit him like a ton of bricks. You ready? He asked her. She nodded. Officer Monahan a doctor said, stopping them from leaving the waiting area. Sean turned to face the doctor. You wouldn't happen to know any next of kin, he asked. The body will be brought to the morgue and needs to be claimed within a few days. Otherwise, the state will take over the body and estate. Sean nodded, understanding the situation. 
I'll make sure to help the authorities. The doctor said, I'm sorry for your loss. Sean and Vanessa left after that and drove home in silence. When he pulled into the parking lot of the village store, Vanessa didn't get out right away. Thank you for coming with me tonight, he said. Of course, she said back, her voice quiet, soft like the old Vanessa. What you did for Mrs. Cooper was really kind. He nodded, hoping she'd leave so he could get home and break down there. Yeah, well, someone needed to be there for her, he said, tapping the wheel with his thumbs. She leaned over the console, and before he knew what was happening, Vanessa was kissing him. He pulled away. Vanessa, what are you doing? He gently held her back, and she froze, her mouth ajar. Oh, my God, I thought that maybe tonight you were a, um, I mean, I don't know. I just thought something was happening. She flung her body to her side of the truck as they both stared out the windshield. I'm so sorry. She covered her face with her hands. I just thought... He didn't know what to say. Things had been so bad between them for so long. Everything after the divorce, all the fights, her underhanded remarks, and now she was kissing him? I think it's best you leave, he said. Sean, I should get going. He pulled the gear shift into reverse, giving her a hint to get out of the truck. She opened the door, looking back at him. You're a good man, Sean, and I'm sorry if I made you think otherwise. You deserve someone who treats you as well as you treat others. She closed the door, eyes still on him, but he didn't look back. He wasn't sure if he was mad or relieved or sad. He waited as she got into her car, making sure she could start her vehicle. As soon as he heard the engine, he swung in reverse and peeled out of there. When he got home, Shadow waited at the door for him. Hey, Shadow. The dog's whole body wiggled in delight to see him. He knelt on the floor and let Shadow jump up on his shoulders, hugging him. The dog started to happily whine, rubbing her face against his. I missed you too, girl, he said, choking up at her affection. How could he get rid of Shadow? Not after telling Mrs. Cooper he'd take care of her. He had promised. He rubbed the dog's neck as she leaned her whole body into him. Let's go outside, he said, standing up, wiping away the loose tears that had escaped. He opened the door and Shadow ran out. He stepped out into the dark, exhaling long and hard. The moonlight illuminated the snow and glowed in the night. The last few hours spun over and over in his head. He pulled out his phone and started to text her, but stopped and called her instead. What did he have to lose at this point? Today had only guaranteed what he'd already known. Life was short. He listened to the first ring, and then she picked up. Sean, Sonia said on the other line. Hello, Sonia, he said, a bit more somber than he had wanted to. It was never easy breaking the news of a death, no matter how distant the relationship. How are you? she asked. I'm okay, he said. He noticed the time. It was past nine, a bit late for a social call. He should get to it. Listen, I wanted to let you know Mrs. Cooper passed away tonight. Oh, Sean, I'm so sorry. She sounded genuinely concerned, which made him a bit choked up. How are you? He sat on the couch, letting Shadow curl up with him. It was hard, but I got to sit with her. She blew into the phone. That must have been difficult. Mm-hmm, he said, petting Shadow's soft head, which rested in his lap. I've got to figure out what to do with Shadow now. Did Mrs. Cooper have a will? She asked. No, not that I've located, he said but he'd only skimmed through her stuff in the office. 
He'd have to call around town to see if anyone knew if she had a lawyer, then go digging in her house. You might be able to find a receipt of some kind from an attorney, Sonia said. That's a good idea. Will you have to take Shadow to a shelter? He shook his head immediately. Oh, no, I'd never be able to do that. It's just that with my hours, I'm afraid Shadow will be alone most of the day. You can't have a police dog? she asked. He looked down at Shadow. She was a good dog. Maybe it would keep Gale around a little longer. He'd do fine with the dog, he supposed. But he had a feeling Shadow would be happier with someone else. I was wondering if you might want to have her. The two had a connection. He'd seen pure love in Sonia's eyes when she'd asked to say goodbye to Shadow. I would love to have her. Sonia laughed into the phone. Are you sure? Mrs. Cooper would love her to be with someone who already loves her so much. He smiled, imagining Sonia celebrating in her home. I can even bring her to you. He cringed as Sonia stayed silent. Come as my guest and stay on the island, she said. I have a lovely guest room. I'll even take you to the lighthouse if you're lucky. He sucked in a deep breath. If he wanted a change in life, he would have to take a leap. Otherwise, it would be the same old argument, the same old problems, and he would die alone. That sounds great. Chapter 27 Lila sat in Drake's office and listened. Randy said she's making a clean break and wants nothing from him, just wants to split amicably, he said, pausing for her to speak, but she didn't. Lila had nothing to say. She's free to do whatever she wants. She shrugged as he made a face like he didn't believe her. Seriously. You aren't upset? Drake said, looking more and more in disbelief. Why would I be? She asked, pretending this wasn't big news. That it didn't bother her that he knew more about her parents' divorce than she did. The daughter. But that's how Whitmore's behaved. She would find out about her father's infidelities through the press and learn about her parents' divorce through her boyfriend. I love how everyone knows everything but me. Drake groaned. Come on, Lila. She's obviously going through a lot right now. Lila could feel her defenses rising, along with it her protective walls. She didn't want to get into it with Drake. He didn't understand. Can we talk about something else? She asked. He made a face. I think you should talk to your mom. She laughed, slightly on the hysterical side. Look, Drake, you don't understand how we do things as Whitmores. She played her statement off as a joke, but his face turned serious. No, he said, but I do know what it's like when you have children to think about. She almost snapped out a retort, but calmed herself just in time. She wasn't upset with Drake. She was upset with her mother. She leaves town without saying a word, and when I do ask about it, she flies off the handle. She wasn't going to give Sonia Whitmore a pass for her bad behavior all the time. When was the time for Sonia to apologize? It's not that I'm upset about the divorce. My mother should have left him years ago. I'm upset that she and I don't have a relationship. Drake's face dropped. Maybe she's scared. Scared of what? Drake leaned forward in his chair. I don't know. Scared of being judged, scared of being alone, scared her children won't understand, scared of losing everything. She doesn't tell me anything, so how am I supposed to understand? Lila, she's your mother, Drake said. She's not your best friend. Some mother and daughters have that kind of relationship. Lila thought of Evelyn and her daughters, Renee and Samantha, about Harper and Charlie's super close relationship. It seemed as though everyone had a wonderful relationship with their parent. Even Drake. Look at Renee and Evelyn. Just as Lila said her name, Renee came into the kitchen. Did you say my name? Lila shook her head. 
I was just talking about your relationship with your mom and how normal it is. Drake rolled his eyes at her dramatics. Renee shook her head, placing her hand on her pregnant belly. We weren't always as close. In fact, we had a very rocky relationship until I had George. This surprised Lila. Really? Renee nodded as she rubbed the baby bump. When my dad died, we all fell apart in our own weird ways, and it strained our relationship for a really long time. Renee told Lila how her divorce and baby George had brought her and her mother back together. She smiled and nodded, but didn't want to point out the obvious and glaring differences. One being, death was not divorce. Renee's father had died loving her mother, loving being their father. Lila's father only loved himself. Renee and Evelyn's relationship may have been strained, but they'd had a relationship to begin with. Sonia and Lila had a common family. There was no relationship. You should reach out and talk to her, Renee said. She's probably hoping you will. Lila doubted that. Maybe I will. Drake set his hand on her knee. She's probably in a really hard place in her life right now. Lila hadn't thought about it that way, and guilt crept in as Renee and Drake talked about how difficult divorce can be. Thirty years is a long time, Renee said. Your mom's life is going to completely change. That can't be easy. Lila kept a smile on her face as she sat there, listening to Drake and Renee, and by the time she left the bakery, she decided to bite the bullet and listen to Drake. She would stop by the house. She texted as she walked up the stairs to her apartment. Thought I'd stop in to say hello. Will you be home? Lila wondered if her text would sound snarky, but the phone rang right away. I was just about to call you, Sonia said. What about, Lila said, playing with her zipper, getting her defenses ready. I'm getting a dog, she said. I wanted to know if you'd like to come over for dinner tonight with Drake and DJ to meet her. Lila almost dropped the phone. Her mother hadn't yet invited her boyfriend and son to the house, nor had she ever considered a furry creature. I'll have to check with Drake, but I think we can, she said, not sure how she felt about this sudden invitation. What kind of dog did you get? A chocolate lab she said. I've always wanted a dog. You have? Lila couldn't imagine Sonia taking care of a dog. I always pictured you as more of a cat person. Maybe I'll get a cat too, Sonia said. Mom, Lila said. Who was this woman? Are you okay? The question was genuine. Was her mother okay? Yes, I think I'm going to be okay, Sonia said. So I'm thinking you could come any time after six. Sure, that sounds great. Oh, and one more thing, Sonia said. I'll be having a guest as well. Who, Lila said. His name is Sean, and he's bringing me the dog, she said. When Sonia dropped that last piece of information... Lila almost went in for more. A guest staying for dinner? A guest who was bringing her a dog? Who was this man named Sean? But she agreed to text Sonia after she talked to Drake. She turned right back around, went out her back door and down to the bakery. You just can't stay away from me, Drake joked, walking up to her and going in for a kiss. My mom called me and invited us for dinner to meet her new dog, she said, still in disbelief. He jerked his head back in surprise. That's great. She's having a man there, Lila said. Do you think she had an affair, and that's why she's leaving my dad? Drake took her hands and put them behind her, pulling her into him. He kissed her again. Let's not assume the worst of your mom. Let's go in open-minded. Lila nodded, but
but she couldn't help but wonder why all of a sudden her mother wanted to have her over. Lila couldn't think of a time her mother had just invited her to dinner. It was always a formal affair, always with an agenda, never just getting together for the sake of being together. DJ is going to love going to that house, Drake said, having only seen the house from afar. We better go over some perimeters with him before we get there. Lila leaned into Drake, letting him hold her against him. Maybe Drake was right, and she needed to go into this with an open mind. Hopefully, DJ is going to love meeting this dog. Chapter 28 Sonia ran around the house, getting things ready for Sean's visit. Without a staff, she wasn't sure if she could be the hostess she had been when clients or special guests arrived at the house, but she realized she didn't want to be the old Sonia. Instead, she wanted to be the free Sonia, the one who'd hike a mountain or cross a frozen lake to fix a lighthouse. She called Andrew, and like always, she left a message. I'm getting a dog, she exclaimed joyfully into the phone. Come to the island and meet her. I'm inviting Lila and Drake over as well. Then she drove to the store and picked up the items on her list. She drove to the fish market and stepped inside the small building. During the summer, the line went out the door and down the length of the sidewalk. But today, she was the only customer. What can I get you? The man behind the counter asked. His voice was rough, like a heavy smoker. What do you recommend for someone new to the island? Her choice would be an appetizer with steamers and move on to a fresh bowl of lobster bisque, followed by a seafood lasagna. But she waited to hear what the man had to recommend. I go to Cod, he said in his thick island accent. Make a creamy garlic butter and a baked potato and let the fish speak for itself. I'll take enough for seven, she said, counting the people in her head. She'd never made a dinner for seven in her life without help, even when she first got married and didn't have the fancy personal chefs and housekeepers. She always had her mother. After she paid, she turned around and bumped into a man standing behind her. Oops, I'm so sorry. She looked up to find Tommy. Sonia. Tommy. She stood frozen in front of the glass case, holding the fish. I heard about Jeff, he said, hooking his thumbs into his pockets. She cringed thinking of the fishmonger eavesdropping behind her, waiting to take Tommy's order. How far would the news travel? She would have heard from the women in her various charity groups if others knew. She didn't know what to say, but she knew the truth might help. She shouldn't worry about the man who didn't know her, but the man who used to know her better than anyone. Yes, well, I'm sorry you were dragged into things. She waited for the jolt of pain to hit her the realization she'd passed up a really great thing when she'd had it. I've been meaning to apologize myself, he said. Oh, she said, looking away, uncomfortable by the acknowledgement. She didn't want to rehash their last encounter. It had been so ugly. Please don't apologize. You had every right to be angry. With him, Tommy said. But not with you. I'm sorry. She looked at Tommy and saw his apology hang in his eyes. He meant what he'd said. Waiting for the pain to come back, Sonia felt her chest loosen suddenly. Her shoulders lightened as she felt recognized in that situation for the first time. She had never wanted to hurt him. I'm having a dinner tonight with a friend from out of town, she said. I was going to invite my dad and Biddy and the kids. You should come too. It wasn't much, but the best olive branch she could extend. She had tried to apologize by hiring the band to play at functions, knowing his partner booked the events. But all that did was blow up in her face. I'll think about it, he said. She looked at the fish, thinking she'd need more if he decided to come. You'll need more if he does, the man behind the counter said. He held up another fillet of cod. Sonia tilted her head at Tommy, who smiled back at her. 
All right, I'd love to come. Great. One more filet, Sonia said to the man. Andrew called her as she pulled into the driveway. I'm not going to be able to come. Andrew! She couldn't hold back her relief he had finally called. Oh, that's too bad. I should have given you more of a heads up. Yes, well, maybe next weekend I could come, he said. When did you decide to get a dog? It's a long story, but her owner passed away, and she needed someone, and I fell in love with her right away. Sonia thought of the dog, and her belly did a somersault with excitement. She felt like a kid waking up on Christmas morning. Have you talked to Dad? he asked. No, she said. What happened between you two? he said. What made you finally leave him? She had been prepared for questions, but not judgment. So you're not going to tell us anything, he said, anger hissing through his teeth. It was time, she said truthfully. She didn't really know what to say. But I don't want this to affect your relationship with your father. He loves you two so much. I'd hate for things to be strange or different for you three. I think this is the best for you. Andrew's voice was quiet. I'm so sorry to hear about you and Harper. Sonia meant it. She had liked the young author with her journalist son. Seeing the two together made her think he had found the one. Such a shame it ended. Yeah, me too, he said. A honk blared out. I should go. Okay, but I'd really like you to come meet Shadow, she said. I think it's great you're getting a dog, he said. I always wished we could have had one as kids. Me too, she said, pushing down her emotions. You should see all the stuff I bought online, he laughed. I can only imagine. I miss you. She wished she could go back to the days he had wanted nothing more than to spend time with her. I miss you too, he said, and she could hear traffic in the background. I'll try coming home as soon as I can. Maybe try talking to Harper again? She sputtered out the words before he hung up. Don't be afraid to tell her how you feel. Love you, Mom, he said. And don't be afraid to ask Lila for advice. Pops already gave me a number to a good attorney, she said, who already set up an at-home appointment. He's coming next week. Make sure Lila's there, Andrew said. I don't want to involve you two, she said. Lila didn't need to be part of this whole fiasco between her mother and father. I don't want you two to feel as though you have to pick sides. I love Dad, but I also know he will do what it takes to protect himself, Andrew said. And you should too. Andrew, another time, she said. All right, Mom, another time, he said. You call me if you need anything. She almost pointed out how she had called, but held back. She didn't need to start a fight. He was showing he wanted to be there for her now. Who cares if he hadn't answered his phone in the past? By lunchtime, to her surprise, Lila's car pulled into the driveway, and her daughter pulled out the biggest, fluffiest dog bed Sonia had ever seen. Lila, Sonia said, covering her mouth with her hand. That's so thoughtful. Where did you find that? There's a cute store in Oak Bluffs. Lila put the bed down on the kitchen floor. I heard you talk to Andrew. Sonia nodded. I did. They hadn't hugged or kissed, which was normal, but after watching Biddy and her son always hugging and kissing on the cheek whenever they got together, she wondered if it were a cultural East Coast versus Southern thing, or if the Whitmores were as cold as the Atlantic waters. When had she stopped hugging Lila when they saw each other? Were they ever huggers? I'm so pleased you came over, Sonia said, looking at the clock. Sean would arrive in a few hours, plenty of time to clean and finish up, but not if Lila hung around and wanted to talk. I thought we could talk about things, Lila said, before dinner. The old Sonia wouldn't have had the time. 
She had a facade to create before someone came to judge her. She had to impress. Everything needed to be perfect. And she still hadn't done her makeup. But that Sonia had been left somewhere on Inspiration Point, and she didn't want her to return. I'll make some tea, and we can sit by the fireplace in the kitchen, Sonia said, ushering her daughter down the hall through the dining room. Who's this friend bringing the dog? Lila asked as soon as she sat at the table. Sonia grabbed the kettle and placed it under the faucet. He's the police officer you called when I went to the cabin in New Hampshire. Lila's face twisted as she processed this information. A friend of his passed away, and there was no one to take care of the dog, she said. So I offered to take it. And he's driving all the way from the White Mountains of New Hampshire to Martha's Vineyard to deliver a dog for you. He and I became friends, she said. Did you have an affair with him? Lila asked. Sonia's mouth dropped. You really think I'd have an affair? I don't know, she said, shrugging her shoulders. Why did you go to New Hampshire? To get away from this house, from your father, from this town. Sonia sat down next to Lila. She put her hands on the table. I just needed to get away. Have you talked to Dad? Lila asked. For the first time in a long time, Sonia noticed a vulnerability in Lila. She had handled everything with her breakup with Joel so incredibly strong. She had forgotten about the little shy Lila. No. Sonia could tell Andrew had spoken with Jeff. He had told Randy about their conversation. But Jeff hadn't talked to Lila? His name is Sean Monahan, she said. He's never been to the island and is a huge fisherman. Sonia used her hands to talk, suddenly feeling nervous telling her daughter about a boy. He's an outdoorsy guy. I think Pops would love him. But is there something between you two? Lila asked. Sonia had no idea what Sean thought about the relationship, if anything. She knew he'd have kissed her that night by the cabin's door if he wasn't such a gentleman. And she almost kissed him on top of the peak at Inspiration Point. I really like him, she said. Lila's mouth dropped open. You do? Sonia's cheeks heated. She held up her hands at Lila. Just as friends. I think you deserve a nice friend, Lila said. Sonia wished she was a hugger, because she wanted to hug her daughter so bad. Then, as if Lila had read her mind, she leaned over in her chair and put her arms around Sonia. Thank you for standing by me with the whole Joel thing, Lila said. I know that's not the only reason this is all happening, but I appreciate it all the same. Sonia hugged Lila harder, pressing her whole being into her daughter. She didn't want to let go. The tea kettle began to scream out, and she pulled out of their embrace, but not without stopping to look her daughter in the eyes. I'm very proud of you, Sonia said to Lila. Someday, she might tell Lila she had inspired her to make a change for her future, to believe she deserved more. But another time, maybe. Lila let out a long breath. Thanks, Mom. When she saw Sean's truck pull up to the open gate, she called Biddy and Randy over to meet Shadow. She might as well get used to you guys, she said over the phone to Biddy. She wrung her hands as Sean pulled up. She looked out the door's window as he came up the drive. With her new boots and winter coat, she met him and Shadow outside. The sun still felt warm, and little puddles from melting snow formed at the cracks in the stone pavers. She waved as he got out of the truck. He had shaved his beard and wore a nice button-up. He put his jacket on as he stepped out of the vehicle, swinging his arms up, showing off his muscular forearms. Officer Monahan cleaned up really nice. That's when her attention diverted to the big brown dog running right at her. Shadow! Sonia knelt, 
and let the dog jump all over her, licking her face and hitting her with her tail. You look beautiful. She laughed as the dog continued to rub and push her way into Sonia's lap. Gee, Shadow, I gave you my bed last night, Sean teased. Sonia stood and thought about those hugs, the ones others did so easily when friends or family came around. With a little inner push, she walked right up to him and gave him a hug. Welcome to Martha's Vineyard, she said, embracing him. So glad you made it. Wow, your place is amazing. He looked up at the large gray clapboard colonial that was built big for big's sake. I hope you don't mind, but I've invited my family to meet Shadow, she said, waiting to see if he'd have a reaction. She wasn't sure what he might expect. And I've made dinner for everyone. My father, the fisherman, will be here, and my daughter and her boyfriend and his son. She was beginning to ramble, but suddenly realized she had invited a lot of people. I hope you don't mind a room full of strangers. That sounds great, he said, watching Shadow run around the yard. She wondered why she had decided of all times to do this big dinner. It sounded like a great idea at the time, but now, as she walked Sean into the house full of her crazy family, she second-guessed herself. Can I help bring anything from the truck? she asked. He looked at his truck and shook his head. Nope, just this. He handed over a multicolored leash with a name tag on it and placed it into her hand. She's officially yours. Sonia looked at Shadow running along in the snow, having the time of her life. Come on, Shadow! The dog ran toward the house and inside, just as Sonia opened the door. The exuberant dog stopped in the front hall where Pops, Lila, Drake, DJ, and Biddy all stood waiting for the dog. Sonia held out her hand at Sean and said, Everyone, this is Sean. Sean, this is everyone. Hi, Sean, the group said. But all their eyes were on the chocolate lab running through the room. And this is Shadow. Sonia petted Shadow's head. This is quite the reception. Sean said. Shadow ran up to DJ first, sniffing his shoes, then his pants. Oh, Shadow, you sure are a sweet thing, aren't you? Drake said, leaning down and letting the dog sniff his hand. See, DJ, I'm letting her smell my scent. DJ held out his hand timidly, letting Shadow smell. Her nose is really wet, DJ said, moving behind his dad but still extending his hand. I'm not sure if I appreciate dogs. Lila got right down on the floor and let Shadow lick her hand. She's a sweetheart, Mom. Biddy was next, rubbing Shadow on the rear end. Oh, someone likes a tushy rubbing. Randy waited his turn and sat down in a chair to pet her. Shadow sat between his legs on the floor, looking up into his eyes as he scratched her neck. I think she's in love. Sonia said. I sure am, Randy said, looking right back into her big caramel eyes. Sonia laughed at the sight. Sean, this is Randy Martin, my father. Most people call me Pops, Randy said, holding out his hand to Sean. Heard you're up in Harmony Falls? Sean nodded. Yes, right on the lake there. Beautiful area, Randy said. Used to fish up there as a kid. I meet a lot of people who spend time on the lake, Sean said. How long have you worked as the chief of police? Randy and Sean got into a conversation that lasted at least 15 minutes, bouncing from one topic to the next. Drake joined in, and the three men stood in the kitchen with beers in hand. Sonia and the ladies played with Shadow. The dog didn't seem to notice it was in an entirely new home with new people. She's so happy, Lila said, as Shadow stood next to her, wagging her tail as she held a toy, her whole body wiggling with it. She won't stop wagging her tail, DJ said, sitting on a couch on the other side of the room, reading a book he saw from the coffee table. Sonia smiled at the young boy. She could see why Lila had become so fond of him. 
He reminded her of Andrew and his funny little quirks he'd had as a kid. Have you seen our library? She asked him, getting up from where she sat next to Biddy. You have a library? DJ stood from his chair and set the book onto the coffee table. Sonia walked the young boy into the library and watched his reaction as he looked around. Three of the four walls in the room were filled with books. Wow! DJ held his head back to see the gallery of the two-story room. Do you use a spiral staircase to get up? She nodded. The room had been Jeff's idea. He had loved to showcase his wealth one way or another, but this room had been built to be showy and nothing else. Jeff probably never even read a single book from the collection. You can take any book you like, Sonia said to him. DJ's eyes widened in joy. Really? She nodded. And come back any time for more. DJ set off to the spiral staircase. Can I start upstairs? Sonia grimaced, thinking about a boy his age hanging along the gallery's railing. Here, Lila said, coming into the room. I'll go up with you. As she and Biddy walked back to the living room where the men were talking, Biddy whispered in her ear. You're officially his hero, or he'd call you his heroine. He's a smart little man, isn't he? Sonia said to her. She suddenly stopped walking in the hallway. I'm sorry I missed lunch with you girls the other day. Biddy linked her arm into Sonia's and squeezed. I'm just tickled pink. You've included all of us tonight. She patted Biddy's arm, a warmth growing inside her chest a feeling of comfort and calm. Want to help me in the kitchen? She asked Biddy. Sure do, Biddy said. The men now sat at the kitchen table, talking about fishing in the winter months. You'd have to be a fool to fish recreationally this time of year, Pop said to Sean. That's the beauty of a lake, Sean said back. It's the calmest time of the year. Sonia poured glasses of wine for Biddy and Lila, but had a beer for herself. Since when have you been drinking beer? Lila asked her when she and DJ returned. Sonia looked at the local brew, took another sip, and shrugged. Since now, I guess. Lila smiled and sat at the counter with DJ as she shared the book he chose from the library. But she continued to sneak glances at her mother in total disbelief. Exploring the Titanic, DJ immediately began reading. Dinner ended up being perfect, and to Sonia's delight, easy. Everyone fell into conversation and laughter. Randy shared stories of the island, and Biddy would throw in a story here and there. Sean talked about being the chief of a four-person staff. It's a small town, but everyone needs to put in the hours to make it work, Sean explained who seemed at ease among Sonia's family. She looked around the table, wishing Andrew would have made it. How full she felt seeing the table in her kitchen filled with people. Had that table ever been filled with people? Had she ever just had friends over? Or her father? She couldn't remember. Not since her mother had died. Thanks for inviting us over, Biddy said, as everyone got their coats and hats and gloves on to leave. Yes, we'll have to do it again soon, Sonia said. She held on to the doorknob to anchor herself. She felt so light and happy that she swore she could float away. Yes, I'd like that, Biddy said. Before any of them left, Sonia made a conscious effort to give a hug to each one of them and a fist bump for DJ. Tell me how the expedition goes she said to DJ. He gave her a serious nod as he continued to read the book while standing. I will. Thanks for dinner. He walked out the door first, and then the rest of them followed, leaving Sean and her alone. When the door shut, the sound echoed throughout the front hall. Sonia checked the time, which was later than she had thought. He stared at her as he stood there. I hope you didn't mind my family, she said, but she could tell he had a nice time. 
They're great, he said. I thought maybe tomorrow I could take you around the island, she said, suddenly feeling nervous as he kept his eyes on her. That sounds great, he said. What about the lighthouse? She smiled at the suggestion. That sounds like a plan. They walked down the hall that led to the kitchen. How about you wash and I'll dry, Sean said, picking up a few of the leftover dishes on the table. She turned on the faucet and started filling the sink with soapy water. That sounds great. Then she turned on some music, and the two stood side by side, washing and drying. At first, they talked about the night and the dinner and how smart DJ was. Then Sean asked, How has it been being back? Jeff took all of his belongings. She scraped the bottom of a pan. So far, he's being reasonable, but he wants me to file a no-fault divorce. She handed the dish to Sean to dry. Was he at fault? He asked, wiping the dish with a towel. She grabbed a plate and dunked it into the suds. Yes. She rubbed the sponge against the glass surface, then pulled it out of the water and rinsed it off before passing it to Sean. But... She looked out the window, but the black night and interior lights caused it to mirror her own reflection. She stared at herself, thinking of the past few years of standing in that exact spot, looking out and wishing for a different life, but feeling guilty and ashamed. She dipped her hands into the soapy water. We haven't been happy for a long, long time. Sean leaned against the counter and faced her. It sure is hard to let the hurt go. She nodded, feeling relieved that he understood. Randy wanted her to fight. Andrew wanted her to get what she deserved. Lila didn't want her to back down. All Sonia wanted was peace. I'm going to find a new place, she said, washing out a wine glass. Something smaller and more me, but with a yard for shadow. Sonia couldn't remember the last time she'd stayed up past midnight. But there they were, talking into the night about anything and everything. Have you ever skied on cannon? He asked. She shook her head. You'd have to be insane to go down a hill like that at my age. A long yawn escaped, and Sonia felt a wave of exhaustion hit her. Let me take Shadow out, he said, getting up from the couch. She covered her mouth with another yawn. Okay. Sean headed to the back door and grabbed his coat. Come on, Shadow, outside. Shadow's ears perked, and she sat up in the dog bed. Come on, Shadow, Sonia repeated. Outside. The dog jumped up and trotted to Sean, who opened the door. They stepped out into Sonia's backyard. She watched out the window at the two walking around her rose garden, down the path to the yard. She couldn't believe Sean came all this way to bring Shadow. Shadow started to play in the snow, rolling around as Sean tried to stop her. Sonia laughed as Shadow moved as soon as Sean got close, then rolled in a different place. Her phone began to ring on the counter. Jeff's name flashed across the screen. She swiped it and shut her phone off. Her heart pounded like she'd just avoided a serious accident. What was he doing calling now? She stared at her phone, his name still lit up, and threw it onto the counter. When Shadow did her business and they returned inside, Sonia said goodnight in the front hall. She'd stay downstairs until he was in his room. I had a wonderful time tonight, Sean said. Shadow sat next to her feet. I did too. She clasped her hands together in front of her and gave him a nod. Good night, Sonia, he said, taking hold of the railing. Good night, Sean. She watched as he climbed the stairs, waiting where she stood until his door clicked shut. She walked around the bottom floor, turning off lights, checking the doors. Shadow followed at her heels. When finally everything was shut down, she headed up to her room and got ready for bed. But she knew she wasn't going to sleep. Her mind kept spinning around Jeff's call and her night with Sean. 
A mixture of fear and excitement filled her body. She couldn't wait for what was next to come, but she was scared to find out what that might be. Chapter 29 Sean had no idea what he was doing on Martha's vineyard, in Sonia's home. But when he looked out the window of the bedroom, he didn't mind so much. The view looked like he had stepped into a magazine or a movie. The whole house sat at the edge of the shore, with a patch of grass, green even in winter, and a sandy beach that extended along the edge of the large acreage. He stood at the window for at least a half hour, staring out, when he saw Sonia walking shadow outside. She wore the same winter coat and boots she had the day of the hike. He stepped back, away, to keep out of sight, but kept an eye on her. She looked happy, even in the early morning, laughing as Shadow ran around in the snow. Shadow would jump in the snowbanks and pop out. Sonia threw a ball, and Shadow chased right after it toward the water. Shadow ran to the foamy edge, grabbing the ball in her mouth and sniffing the water. The island dog knew better than to swim in the cold water. She trotted back to Sonia, dropped the ball on the beach, and waited for her to throw it again. Sean met them downstairs after his shower, and Sonia looked different. Her hazel eyes glowed in the sunlight. She practically danced around the room, and he swore Shadow was in sync with every step she took. Good morning, he said. She beamed as he entered the room. Good morning. I saw you two outside, he said. Shadow is in heaven here. He stopped and thought about Mrs. Cooper, how much she loved that dog. You're Mrs. Cooper's guardian angel. It's funny. I feel like she's mine now, Sonia said. She placed her hands on the counter. Let me get you a coffee. I take it black, he said. He rubbed the back of his neck. Did you not sleep well? She asked, looking at his movement. He shook his head. Oh no, I slept great. He just didn't know the plan. Sonia had mentioned taking a walk to the lighthouse. But how long was she expecting him to stay? I thought we'd leave after breakfast for the lighthouse, she said, practically reading his thoughts. Then we can walk through the village and have lunch at this wonderful bakery in town. He thought back to the night before. I really enjoyed meeting everyone last night. She smiled. Yes, it was nice. It seems as though you have a great support system, he said, sounding more like a cop than a guy who was falling for her. She looked at him. I don't think I would have had dinner without you coming. Then her eyes drifted off for a second, and when they returned, she breathed in heavily. I feel like I had an awakening at inspiration point. She started to laugh and waved her hand. I sound totally crazy. No, you don't, he said quickly. I feel like you have changed since our first meeting. Maybe it's you. She said it with a smile on her face, but she held his stare, making his heart pump inside his chest. He looked away and felt like a fool. What was he doing here? He gave her shadow. Now it was time to go. There's a nice restaurant on the harbor where we could have dinner tonight. She continued talking about the restaurant and its prime location as she pushed out a plate of pastries in front of him. It'll be night, so you won't be able to see much. He picked up a strawberry danish, wondering if he should just go home, make things easier on himself and drop this fantasy. Just tell her you need to get back to work he said in his head. But instead, he told her, That sounds great. From Sonia's backyard, the three of them walked to Greyhead's lighthouse, a red brick lighthouse that stood against the mighty Atlantic Ocean. What a sight! He said over the waves as they pounded against the clay cliffs. The water foamed and churned underneath its structure. Wait until we get to the other side! She yelled out, holding her hair from blowing in her face. Shadow led the way around a peninsula of land with an iron railing along the edges. The vista looked out at the snowy, rolling valley and a long, sandy-white beach the shape of a horseshoe. He could see the harbor and the village, 
and the island's shore for miles. The gray sky suddenly opened, and sunlight radiated from the clouds, brightening the whole island at once. They stood, staring out like they had at Inspiration Point, side by side, in a comfortable quiet. He inhaled the briny scent of sea, closed his eyes, and let the sun's rays warm his face. This is amazing, she nodded, looking out. This island holds so much of who I am. It's the definition of bittersweet for me. Most of the time I want off the island because of all the memories. But then I smell the sea and remember my dad fishing when I was a kid. Or see this view and think of the first time my mother and I hiked up here. Or when I played on that beach with my babies. I have so much of who I am connected to this place that I'm not sure if I could leave, even if I wanted to. He thought about Harmony Falls and how chained he felt to the town and the people. I get that. Would he be able to have a dinner filled with friends and family in Harmony Falls? Not now, with Shadow gone. He had an ex-wife, an assistant that was retiring, maybe John if he wasn't working, and Billy if he didn't fire him. Why did he stay? He had passed retirement age from the police force. He could find another job, one with a lot less stress. Do you plan on staying on Martha's Vineyard after the divorce? He asked. Depends, she said. Everyone knows me here, which is a good thing, but also a bad thing. He thought about what he had seen on Google. He had read some of the salacious tabloid news about Mr. Whitmore. When my ex-wife left, everyone talked about it with everyone else but me. She laughed. I didn't even know he was having an affair until a news reporter called to confirm the story. John was the one who told me of the other guy, he confessed. He'd felt like a complete idiot. Vanessa had paraded the guy around without a care in the world, least of all her husband. She had done it on purpose, he knew now the last-ditch effort of trying to make him leave her. I realize now that I didn't want to see that side of her, because it showed an ugly side of me. He could feel his shoulders lift on that one. He glanced at her, wondering how he could feel so comfortable with who he was when he was with her. Or maybe he was a fool. You do look much happier, he said, not caring any more. Fool or not, he had one more day with the woman of his dreams. What did he have to lose at this point? I feel lighter, if that makes any sense. She shook her head, laughing at herself. I spent years trying whatever I could to get something back in the relationship I had with Jeff. But like everything else, it had changed, and there was no getting it back. Mrs. Cooper's death sort of reminded me how I need to live life now. Like, right now. He stared hard at her, hoping he wasn't the only one who felt this attraction between the two of them. Then he reached out and took her hand in his, holding it as they stood along the gray head cliffs, watching the waves pound against the shore, with shadow sitting between them. Chapter 30 after their walk, she took him to Books and Bread and they had lunch. At first, her instincts were to get out of there. What if people saw her with him? What would they say? She looked happy. That's what they would say. Sean was right. She was happy. Especially when he held her hand all the way to lunch. The gesture had been so simple, yet suddenly the whole visit changed. She couldn't help but look at his broad shoulders and strong hands. Every time she looked into his intoxicating green eyes, her knees wobbled. She felt like she had when she'd first fallen in love, giddy and gushing over a boy way out of her league. As they stood in line, he stood right behind her, putting his hand on the small of her back as they moved up in line. He pulled out a credit card after they ordered. You're my guest, she said. How about this be more like a date, he asked. Her mouth fell open. Sure, a date. Her eyes flickered about the room. 
a young man who took their order didn't look as though he cared one way or another, that this man had asked her on a date. But the women, she noticed, were staring at her. Who are they? he asked, putting his wallet back into his pocket. Sonia looked away, but she could see her former closest friends, Melissa and Stacy, staring at them. I did charity work with them, she said. She pointed to an empty table. She wasn't going to let these women make her ashamed for living her life. Not anymore. They'd talked about her for staying with Jeff. They'd talked about his affair like it was a soap opera. They'd talked about her daughter and her engagement ending. They'd talked about her daughter being cheated on. Let's sit over at that table by the fireplace. She pointed to a small round table just for two. He grabbed their sandwiches and brought them to the table. They talked for the rest of the afternoon, and Sonia laughed more than she had in years. Renee came by their table to say hello. Drake came out to thank her again for dinner. And as they finished their sandwiches, Wanda came in with Marty. Hello, Sonia, Wanda waved at her, scooting through the small bakery to her table. How are you? Wanda looked directly at Sean. Hi, I'm Sean he said, standing up and reaching out his hand. I'm a friend of Sonia's. Wanda grinned widely. I'm Wanda. She clasped her hands together. Do you live here on the island? No, Sean said, shaking his head. I'm from a little town in New Hampshire. Oh, Wanda winked at him. Sonia covered her mouth with her napkin to hold back a laugh. I'm Marty her husband said next to her. Oh, yes, sorry, dear. She clapped her hands together and giggled. Well, isn't this wonderful? The old Sonia wouldn't like this display of excitement, especially in front of all the patrons and books and bread. But when Sean looked over at her with a wide grin, she forgot all about the old Sonia. You two should come over and meet my new dog, Shadow, she said. Sean brought her from New Hampshire for me. A rescue dog? Wanda pulled the chair from another table that was empty and put it between them. We just got a rescue too. She pulled out her phone, opening to her photos. I'll order, Marty said, pointing to the counter. What kind of dog is it? Wanda asked, leaning on the table, forgetting that she hadn't been invited to sit but something about the fact that she had felt excited enough to stop and talk made Sonia realize how kind Wanda and the rest of the women had been to her. I'm so sorry I missed lunch the other day, Sonia said. Why don't we set up a time this week to have lunch here? That sounds fantastic, Wanda said, then looked to Sean. How long are you staying? Sean sat up, as if he hadn't thought of the answer to this question. Oh, well, I'll need to leave at the latest in two days, he said, but he gave a smile to Sonia. Maybe when I come back to visit, we could all have dinner. Wanda's face lit up. Oh, that sounds fabulous. Sonia bit her bottom lip, smiling at his remark. When he comes back to visit? That was a sign, right? He was into her? the hunky police officer who looked more like Hugh Jackman than a normal guy? The rest of the day, she had mixed emotions. One moment, she wanted to hold Sean's hand and play with Shadow, a whole new little pop-up family. The other, she felt as if she were betraying the kids. Lila had been the easy one. Andrew was her wild card. When she and Jeff first started having marital troubles, he had taken it the hardest. He had never forgiven Jeff and never seemed to look at Sonia with the same admiration. Something broke inside Andrew's heart when things came out. When his friends teased him on the football field or at school, they were relentless. Lila found a boyfriend, and Andrew dove into school. Sonia had heard of some marriages becoming closer when infidelity happened. Some couples had to hit the very low in order to reach the highs. But after a while, she had become resentful and angry. The person who she was on New Year's Day was someone she never wanted to be again, jealous, bitter, and angry. She had loved Jeff. 
But love had to be both ways. And that was the problem. Jeff no longer cared. He cared about his lifestyle, what others thought, and what he wanted. It didn't matter that he had alienated his daughter, or made his son despise him, or made his wife hate him. He didn't seem to care at all. After they returned from lunch, they sat in the kitchen with a cup of coffee, watching the sun set off in the distance. Do you still want to go to dinner? She asked. He faced her, looking into her eyes like he had been doing all night. There was no mistaking that look. She knew he wanted more than just to hold her hand. She could have the fairy tale right now. Live for now, she screamed inside her head. But she let go of his hand. I'm having a really nice time. Me too, he said, making that sideways grin of his. But I'm not divorced from my husband. She suddenly felt panicked. I don't know how long that's going to take, but I'm not ready for more than just a friendship right now. What was she doing? And my son still hasn't met you, she rambled. And you live really far away, and, well, I'm not sure if Don will ever rent to me again. She couldn't look at him. Had she led him on? Should she have told him to stay in New Hampshire? Was she one of those crazy women men talk about at bars? Sonia, I'm more than happy to be your friend. He reached out his hand. Besides, I'm very patient. He squeezed her hand in his. And I have a killer soaking tub in the bathroom attached to my guest room. She smiled. You have a guest room? A little in-law suite, actually, he said. It used to be my parents' place. She tilted her head. It's right on the mouth of Harmony Creek, he said. She remembered seeing a small cape across the way next to Don's cabin. That's your place? She smiled, thinking about the little boys, with the mouth of a river keeping them apart. Right there along Harmony Lake, he said. Were you the one who called in about the hysterical woman? Her mouth widened in a smile. He shook his head. No, but I did hear you yelling about Don. Really? She asked. He laughed. I'm just kidding. So, are you still up for a friendship dinner? She held his hand, hoping he was super patient. He nodded. Let me clean up, and I'll meet you back downstairs. For dinner, Sonia wore her burgundy dress she'd bought in a little boutique in London, the cut a simple A-line, the fabric a rich silk, tailored to fit perfectly. Her shoes were more expensive than she'd like to admit. With most of her jewelry gone, she wore only a locket Lila had given her for Mother's Day. Inside were tiny school pictures of the twins. She loved it, but had put it away and forgotten about it until she'd gone through her things the other night with Pops. You look beautiful, he said at the bottom of the stairs as she came down. He hooked out his arm, inviting hers. She slipped it through, and they walked out to his truck. Sean pulled up to the restaurant's entrance and opened the door for Sonia, then parked the truck as she went inside. The weeknight evening didn't have a lot of diners, which she had hoped for. When Sean arrived, the host came out from the back. Mrs. Whitmore, he said, putting his hands together. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. It's no problem, she said. Will your husband be joining you? He asked, not reading the situation. She shook her head. Not tonight, no. He looked confused. A table for two, please, she asked. The host didn't change his expression as he grabbed two menus and walked them to a table in the corner. Enjoy, he said, putting the menus down, but examining Sean before leaving the table. Sonia played with the silverware, unsure if the interaction was strange for Sean as well. It's a very small island, and not a lot of restaurants are open in the winter. It's fine, Sonia, Sean said, adjusting his dinner jacket and looking around the dining room. This place is really nice. Sonia looked up at the crystal chandeliers that hung from the three-story ceilings. 
The glam of the room didn't compare to the glam of the ocean the room overlooked. I had the twins' christening lunch here, and my mother's reception after the funeral. She cringed. Why had she mentioned her mother's funeral? It's just a special place. My parents used to bring me here as a little girl, and I always felt so special. I like coming here. Sean smiled. I like it here, too. Like every other time, conversation with Sean was easy. He told her about joining the police force. I did a four-year stint in Concord. She told him about Yale and how proud Randy had been when she'd graduated magna cum laude. When they finished dessert, the waiter came to the table with a receipt for Sean, who had somehow already paid the bill without her noticing. Sean, I can't let you pay, please. Sonia didn't know how much a police officer made in the middle of the boondocks, but she was sure it wasn't enough to blow this kind of money on a weeknight. Sonia, I'm happy to take my friend to dinner. He took the pen and signed the check. When they returned home, Sonia was exhausted. But the idea of the night ending, of Sean going back to New Hampshire, made her want to stay up all night. What if we made a fire and had a glass of wine with Shadow? She asked as they pulled up to the house. There's a Celtics game on tonight. I think that sounds pretty much perfect, he said, jumping out of the truck and going around the front to open her door. He wrapped his arm around her shoulder as they walked up to the house, holding her closer than a friend might. But she didn't mind being that close to him. She wished she could be closer. When she opened the front door, she looked for Shadow to come running. But that's when she saw Jeff sitting in the front hall petting her. Her breath swept out of her lungs as she stared at her husband sitting there. What are you doing here? Her words came out cold. This is a bit awkward, Jeff said, standing up and walking towards Sonia and Sean. He pressed the lapel of his suit with his hand and then extended it out to Sean. Jeff's hand seemed to be swallowed up by Sean's. I'm Sonia's husband, Jeff. Most men who interacted with Jeff would back off at this moment, but Sean didn't appear at all intimidated. I'm her friend, Sean. Friend, Jeff said, crossing his arms. Yes, we spoke on the phone, Sean said, nodding his head at Jeff. Sonia had forgotten Sean had talked to Jeff the day she'd arrived in Harmony Falls. This is Officer Sean Monahan from Harmony Falls she said to Jeff. Jeff's brow wrinkled in confusion. The connection didn't click. I was hoping we could talk, Jeff said to Sonia. Alone. She almost told Jeff she was going to sign the papers and she wasn't going to tell the courts about his affair. She didn't want to drag her family through the mud again. All she wanted was to get out of the marriage. Sean looked at Sonia. Are you comfortable with that? She nodded and gave Sean a smile. I'll be fine. Sean hooked his thumb toward the kitchen. I'll take Shadow out. Sean glanced toward Jeff as he walked into the kitchen toward the back door. The man who seemed to hold so much power looked so small standing before her in his gray suit. Dark bags hung under his eyes. He looked as though he hadn't slept in months. He looked older but that was what guilt could do to a man. What do you want, Jeff? She asked. A few weeks ago, she'd be frightened, demanding respect in the house he'd built with his money. But not tonight. Tonight. She didn't even care if she had his respect or not anymore, because she had enough respect for herself to accept nothing less. I want to try to work things out, he said. She jolted at the suggestion. You want to work things out? I want us to get therapy, work through our issues, he said. Her mouth gaped open. You can't be serious. He looked surprised. Why not? Where were you these last ten years? His face hardened. You're really going to go there? She walked to the office and grabbed all the paperwork she'd gone over with Randy. I've already signed the paperwork. 
I just want to get this over with. I loved you, Jeff said, but his voice sounded weak. People who love each other show it, she said, looking at the wall instead of him. He looked down at the papers in his hand. So that's it? Yes. Thirty years in an envelope. She clasped her hands tightly together so she wouldn't strangle him. He wanted to work things out? He loved her? Have you talked to the twins? He asked. She nodded. Yes. He probably wanted her to tell him what they thought about the divorce. She had been his primary way of communication with their children for most of their whole lives. His low tenor voice echoed in the room. You think that guy with the dog is going to make you happy? In the past, she might have backed down once he started to get mean. But she wasn't going to back down this time. Not anymore. I hope you find happiness. I didn't think you... He stopped and stared at her in disbelief. That I'd leave, she said, finishing his sentence. He paused, at a loss for words, and brushed off his suit. I'll have my lawyer call you. Jeff left the room, the sound of his departing footsteps familiar, like an old song echoing throughout the hall. When she went to find Sean, he sat at the kitchen table petting Shadow. There you are, she said, going to grab a bottle of wine. How about we start that fire? Sean rubbed the wood surface with his hand and got up. I think I'm going to turn in tonight. But you leave tomorrow, she said. I thought we could stay up tonight. He shrugged. I think it's best I go to bed. He gave her a nod, and with that, left the kitchen and walked toward the stairs. Sonia watched as he went up, wishing she had enough guts to run after him, turn him around, and kiss him. But she just sat in the light of the kitchen with shadow at her feet, listening to the waves crash onto shore. Chapter 31 Harper filled another black garbage bag with her things. She dumped random notebooks of notes she'd never bothered to go back and read into a box she had picked up at the grocery store. She moved to the second and last drawer in the boat. When she opened it, a photograph of her and Andrew at her dad and Evelyn's wedding sat on top. She had stuffed it inside the drawer after they'd broken up. With her finger, she wiped the dust off the glass. They'd had so much fun that night. She remembered laughing so hard and thinking she was the luckiest person in the whole world. She sat on the booth seat next to Joan, swaying side to side. I blew it, Joan. Like everything else in her life, retrospectively, she was an idiot for freaking out. She could have solved a lot of things by just talking to Andrew. She should have told him about her feelings about moving in, her fears from her mother leaving her as a kid. She should have told him about her mother's visit to the island, so she could have been mad about that, not ruin her relationship. But, like all things Harper, she just complained about it and did nothing but second-guess everything in her life. I really messed things up, she said to Joan. Her cat ignored her, licking her paw. I mean, he was perfect. He even liked you, Joan. That's saying something. Joan grabbed her stomach with her clean paw as she lay on top of the table. Harper put the photograph in the box and began to empty the drawer while sitting on the bench. She pulled out the whole drawer once she removed everything and dumped out the random pennies, broken rubber band, and crumbs into the garbage. As she tried to put the drawer back onto its track, she heard a knock on the glass. There, standing out in the cold, was Sonia Whitmore. Oh, Jesus, Harper thought to herself as she put the drawer down on top of the table. She stepped over her bag and closer to the door and pulled it open. Hello, Sonia she said in the most cheerful of voices. What brings you to Linda? Sonia's face twisted in confusion by her use of the boat's name. Excuse me? You're here on the boat, Harper said, starting to panic. It's the boat's name, Linda. 
Oh, Sonia smiled, putting her hand on her chest. I completely forgot Pops named this after my mom. Harper's face dropped, forgetting about the name and the person who it was named after. I'm sorry. For what? Sonia said, as if Harper was an idiot. Um, for... God, this woman made her feel uncomfortable. Did you say why you're here? Sonia lifted her eyebrows. Do you mind if I come in? Harper did mind. She had a five-by-three walking space that was full of liquor boxes and garbage bags of clothes. Sure, come in, she said, gesturing her hand toward the one free space, the bed. Or, she supposed, Sonia could sit on the toilet. Can I get you some tea or coffee? Harper hoped she'd say yes to the tea. She had no coffee. No, I'm not staying. Sonia looked around the space before moving toward the bed. I'm here to talk to you. Harper suddenly wished she had cleared another spot so she could sit. Oh? I was sorry to hear about you and Andrew, Sonia said, wiping off the comforter before sitting down. Harper hadn't had many relationships, and having a talk with an ex-boyfriend's mother about her breakup would be a first, and the strangest and most awkward experience of her life. Yes. Harper didn't move, trying to ignore Sonia's distaste of her space. I know it's not my business, but... Sonia began. It's not, Harper wished she could say, but she held back. What would that do? Instead, Harper played with her bracelet on her wrist as Sonia looked at her, holding her purse in the lap, then pulling out a small wrapped box. I think this is yours. Sonia handed over the gift, and Harper was surprised by the weight of it. The small gift was heavy. She opened the small card attached, and sure enough, Harper was written in Andrew's writing. I found it cleaning around the house, Sonia said. But it's not mine. It's Andrew's, Harper said, passing the gift back to Sonia. Sonia didn't take it. She stood up and wiped the back of her pants, then slid her body through the mess and to the door. Andrew doesn't want it, she said. But I felt maybe since it was for you that it should go to you. Sonia made a half smile as Harper held the gift in her hands. I don't feel comfortable taking this, Harper said. Sonia shrugged. It has your name on it. You will have to decide what to do with it. She stuck the box out at Sonia one more time. I can't take this. Well, I suppose you can just throw it out, Sonia said, looking down at the large garbage bag of Harper's clothes. Then, out of nowhere, Sonia leaned over the bag and gave Harper a hug. I wish nothing but good things for you. Harper braced herself against the bony figure. Never in her life would she have imagined hugging Sonia Whitmore, or that the woman would be the one to go in for the hug. The hard and awkward embrace ended just as fast as it had begun. Sonia gave a hard nod to Harper. I hope we continue to see you around. Lila really loves your friendship. Harper nodded. Of course. Sonia left immediately after that, leaving Harper standing in the middle of her life's mess, holding the most beautifully wrapped box in her hands. As weird as the encounter with Sonia had been, it brought Harper's guilt flooding back. She had to fix things. Harper grabbed her coat and went to exactly where she knew she'd find Lila, sitting in books and bread, studying for the bar. Harper held out the gift as she sat down and placed it on the table. Hey! Lila jumped, looking up from her law books and notes. Harper? That's my former name. Now it's worst girlfriend who's a jerk, she said, and then bit her thumbnail. Lila blew out and closed her book with her notebook stuck inside the pages. You're not a jerk. Harper placed the gift in front of Lila. What is this? Lila asked. Then she read the note card. Your mom stopped at the boat and gave it to me, Harper said. She said she found it in the house. My mom gave this to you? Lila looked astonished. 
She picked it up and then placed it in front of Harper. What are you going to do with it? I think I need to talk to Andrew, Harper said. She picked at the corner of the table instead of looking at Lila. I'm headed to Boston right now. Lila's eyes widened. Are you going to get back together? Harper shook her head. I don't even know if he wants to talk to me. Lila sat up and clapped her hands together. Please tell me you're going to at least try. Harper didn't know what she was doing. But she couldn't open the gift, not until Andrew gave it to her. I need to return the gift. Then Harper grimaced. Your mom hugged me. Really? Lila raised her eyebrows. I think the divorce has strangely made her more human. Harper nodded. She wondered how Andrew had taken the news. My dad called me and apologized about the whole Joel thing, Lila said. Good. Harper hadn't met Mr. Whitmore, but had no love for the man. You deserve more than just an apology. He's never called and apologized before, she said. He usually goes for my mother or his secretary. Harper could tell this phone call had pleased Lila, and she was there to support her friend, not give her opinion. That's great, Lila. Lila smiled. So, what can I do to help you? Harper picked up the gift. Just be ready for my call when he rejects me. Lila made a face and held up her phone. For sure. Harper didn't take much with her on the ferry ride, expecting the worst case scenario, which was Andrew telling her to get lost. When she arrived in the city, it was dark out, and she regretted her urgency to leave the island instead of being practical and leaving in the morning. She most likely would be stuck without a ride back on the ferry until tomorrow, which meant she'd need a place to stay, a place she couldn't afford. Would she be able to find a hotel? When her Uber reached his apartment, she stood outside, wondering if she should just turn around and go home. Looking up, she saw that his lights were on. She took in a deep breath and went to the call box. Hello? he said over the intercom. Andrew, it's Harper. She froze, unable to get out the rest of her words. But she didn't have to. The door buzzed and unlocked, and she grabbed the handle and swung it open. She climbed the stairs to the third floor apartment and saw him standing on the landing. Hi, she said, out of breath. What are you doing here? Andrew asked. He looked disheveled as if she'd just woken him. His usually combed hair was messy, and he wore sweats and a tattered long sleeve shirt, rather than his usual preppy polo and khakis. She passed the gift to him. I think this is yours. Where did you get this? He asked, taking the gift into his hands. Your mom, Harper said. I told her to get rid of it. He shook his head and stared at the gift. I'm so sorry, Andrew, she said, wishing she could take so much back. You don't have to be sorry, he said. You want different things than I do. It's just not the right timing. Her heart dropped. She had secretly wanted Andrew to rush to her when he saw her, take her in his arms, pledge his undying love for her. I should go, she said, turning around. You came all the way to the city to give me this? Just to turn around and go back? I wanted to apologize, she said. He passed back the gift. I bought this for you, so it's not mine. I'm afraid your trip was a waste. As he held out the gift to give it back, Harper saw all the pain and hurt and distrust in his eyes. I have no excuse for my behavior, she said. But these past couple weeks have been awful without you. And I realized how much you mean to me, and how much I love you. And I know I'm super crazy, and you probably should steer clear from someone like me, but I love you. She stopped as the lump in her throat grew. And I can't take that gift unless you're giving it to me like you had meant to. Not because you don't want it. He looked down at the gift in front of him. Then he looked up at her. He extended the wrapped box out to her. 
Harper, I got this for you. She didn't move. Open it, he said, his eyes softer. I want you to have it. She pulled the corner out, ripped off the tape, and removed the paper. She took off the lid to the white box, and her free hand went to her mouth. A storm glass! She had told him one night while they talked on the phone how she had wanted one. She picked up the teardrop glass in her hand and held it up to the light to see inside. What's the prediction? he asked. She looked at the water, clear, with very few crystals floating around. It looks like it's clear. She looked through the clear glass, then glanced to Andrew. Thank you. He looked up at the glass, then to her. And before Harper knew what was happening, he swept her into his arms and kissed her. Chapter 32 When Sean left Martha's Vineyard, he thought it was the best thing to do under the circumstances. He didn't need to get in the middle of a couple who still had a lot to work out. He also couldn't disagree with the husband either. Sean wasn't going to make a woman like Sonia Whitmore happy. He doubted she'd be blown away by his officer's pension and lived in-house. As he drove to work, he noticed the parking lot to Inspiration Point had been plowed. He didn't even do the whole thing. He grumbled out as he passed the crummy job. Billy had barely made enough room for more than two cars. He found a country music station and wallowed in his own misery as he listened to a song about a guy falling for the wrong girl. Dirty slush covered the roads, and the sky was covered in gray clouds. And so was his mood by the time he reached the station. Where the heck did you go? Gail asked from her desk when he walked in the next day. Martha's Vineyard. Why bother lying at this point? And you came back? She shook her head. What for? Because you'd miss me. He walked into his office and slammed the door. It turned out no one missed him, not even Vanessa. Nobody needed me? He asked Gail after he checked all his messages. Nope, Gail said, watering her plants. The hospital did call, though. They found a next of kin for Mrs. Cooper's body. Really? That surprised him. Who? A niece or something. Gail handed him a set of notes. She'll need the keys and things. She doesn't want Shadow, does she? He asked. I don't even think she knows Shadow exists. Gail patted him on the back. Did you have a nice time on the island? He nodded but didn't elaborate. He'd had the most amazing time. But what did it matter? It was nice, yes. The first thing he did was call the hospital, who forwarded the information of Mrs. Cooper's niece, a woman named Sophia Wilson. She's my father's sister, the woman said over the phone. I only met her a few times. Where are you located? He asked, taking down her information. I live in New York, she said. I'm not sure if I'll be able to come up and deal with the house for a while. I can go over and shut down the place, he offered. It's not real safe to travel across the water in the winter anyway. Is it really a purple house on an island? She asked. He remembered Sonia's reaction to seeing the eggplant home and smiled. Yes, it's really purple and on an island. Thank you, Officer Monahan, she said. After a quick bite to eat at the village store, he decided he'd boat over to Mrs. Cooper's Island and headed to his house. He looked up at Don's cabin, wondering if Sonia would ever come back. I doubt it, he muttered to himself. He dropped his boat into the water and soon was on the island, where he shut off the water and unplugged all the electrical cords. He wandered through the house, loosening memories he had long forgotten. When he reached Danny's room, everything looked the same as it had 40 years ago. Sean swore he could hear Danny rummaging through his trunk, looking for his favorite baseball mitt. He stood on the threshold, not going in, but a warm wave went through him almost like a push, and he stepped inside. He walked by Danny's dresser, 
looking at the ticket stubs and baseball cards, a random pack of gum from the 80s. Moving to his desk, Sean noticed the math assignment. You never did it, he said out loud, remembering the lame excuse Danny had given their teacher. Mr. Shapiro didn't lose it. He shook his head at his friend. You were really bad at math, he said, laughing at the length his friend had gone to not do his homework. He looked at the other things on the desk. A picture of their baseball team sat in a frame. He picked it up, smiling as he saw his dad, the coach, then his 12-year-old self standing beside him, with Danny on the other side. He removed the back of the frame and took the photograph out. He looked at the kid standing in between the two most important men in his life. He had been so confident and ready to take on the world. He stuffed the photograph into his jacket's inside pocket and put the frame back onto the desk, empty. When he finished shutting down the house, he wrote Mrs. Cooper's niece a note, welcoming her to Harmony Falls and explaining why he took the photograph and left her his card. In the meantime, he'd maintain the lighthouse. And after a few weeks, things returned right back to normal. He drove by Don's cabin without even thinking about Sonia. Sometimes. He wondered if she ever thought of him. Had she gone through with the divorce, or had she and her husband figured things out? Was she happy? When he pulled into town, he groaned the second he saw Vanessa's car in the parking lot of the station. And no one is claiming the donation? Sean heard Gail say when he walked into the station. Morning, he said to the two women standing over what looked like a check. Vanessa handed him it. It's from an anonymous donor. He looked down at the slip of paper, a written donation of an amount he'd never seen in real life. He whipped his head to Vanessa. What's this for? A bridge to Mrs. Cooper's island. Vanessa said. Sean looked at Gail. I gotta go. Gail gave him a nod. Take your time. He didn't even hear what Vanessa said as he left. He just hopped into his truck and pulled out of the station, heading to the highway. He needed to catch the ferry. Chapter 33 Sonia started walking Shadow along the beach each morning and met up with the girls for a walk. Evelyn brought her dog, Stan, who wasn't as hyper as Shadow, but the two dogs seemed to enjoy each other as much as the women. The past few weeks had been a whirlwind in many ways, yet Sonia's life had started to come into focus. She put the house on the market, and it sold within 24 hours, all furnishings included. Jeff sent his assistants to gather any belongings he had left. She had her belongings sent from Florida and the Boston apartment, to a group that gave donated items to a woman's recovery center. She found a rental for the time being while she decided what to do next. But she wasn't in a rush. The house happened to be near Evelyn's on Cliffside Point, right on Sugar Beach. It had two bedrooms and a kitchen with French doors that opened to a perfect backyard for shadow. Andrew and Drake had helped move the things she decided to keep. Lila and all the women helped unpack. That night, Sonia ordered dinner for the group, and they spread out throughout the house, finding a spot to eat and have conversation. Sonia looked around, thinking about how much had changed in her life, but also how happy she was right then. Her children and their significant others sat laughing together around her coffee table in the living room. Her new walking friends sat around her kitchen table and counter, telling each other stories of past moving experiences. Her father laughed with them. She should be happy. She should be glad this moment was happening. And she was. But something was missing. She hadn't heard from her attorney about her donation. Either Sean really didn't know who would have donated it, or, like she suspected, he wasn't interested which was fine, she told herself, all day as she moved into her new place. She was starting a whole new chapter in her life. The last thing she needed to do right then was worry about a man. She should be grateful. 
Her relationship with her family had gotten stronger since she'd returned from Harmony Falls. She felt more fulfilled and thankful, like tonight. She would have never had a night like this before she ran away to the lake. She owed Sean for that. Wanda and Marty were the first to leave, followed by Randy and Biddy. Drake brought Lila, who had more studying to do, and they left with DJ. When Evelyn and Charlie said goodbye, Sonia hugged Evelyn as she left and felt comfortable doing so. Thanks for all your help today. My pleasure, Evelyn said, rubbing her back before letting go. Are you coming Sunday? Sonia nodded. Yes, I'll be there. Great. Evelyn signaled to Charlie, who talked with Andrew about a book he had read. Charlie, you ready? Charlie patted Andrew on the back and kissed Harper on the cheek. Thanks for dinner, he said to Sonia, taking Evelyn's arm in his. She smiled as she waved goodbye to her friends. When she closed the door, Harper and Andrew stood in their coats. Harper handed Sonia a wrapped gift. The brown paper covered what felt like a book. It's for you, Harper said. You don't have to open it now, but I thought with the big move, you could use it. Sonia thought back to when she first met this young woman. Sonia'd had such a different and terrible opinion of her. I'm so glad you came tonight, Harper. And with that, she reached out and embraced her son's girlfriend. When they separated, she asked, Do you mind if I do open it now? Oh, no, not at all, Harper said, who seemed a little nervous still with Sonia. Sonia unwrapped the gift and pulled out the leather journal from inside. It's beautiful. Harper stood up on her tippy toes, opening the cover to the first page. Inside, a poem had been written in cursive. In the end, she became more than what she expected. She became the journey. And like all journeys, she did not end. She just simply changed directions and kept going. The poet's name, R. M. Drake, had been written in beautiful calligraphy at the bottom. This is beautiful, Sonia held the book against her heart. Thank you. Andrew gave her a hug and promised to call when he got back to the city, though he was staying with Harper on the boat for the weekend. When they left, she let Shadow out the back door and looked up to the sky. The moon glowed on the water as the tide came in. The stars seemed brighter that night, or maybe it was her mood. When Sonia came back into the house, she sat on the couch and started writing in her journal. Housewarming dinner with friends. She didn't know how long she sat there, but she wrote pages full of musings and goals for the next few weeks, months, year, and a five-year goal. Every once in a while, she'd stop writing, looking around her new surroundings and take it all in. She had a whole new life ahead of her. It was late when her phone started to ring. Sean's name flashed across the screen. Sean, she answered. Sonia, he said. Where are you? What, she said. I'm at home. What do you mean? I've been at your house all day, but no one's there. Sonia jumped up from the couch, setting the journal on the coffee table. I moved. She raced to the coat closet and grabbed her winter coat. Let me come and get you. I can just drive there, if you don't mind, he said. It's not too late, is it? She looked at the time. It was past her usual bedtime, but she didn't care. I'm at the other end of Cliffside Point. She sent him the address pin and waited by the door. Shadow slept on the couch. She stepped outside as soon as she saw him pull into the driveway. He got out right away. What are you doing back? She asked, stepping down the front steps. He held out his hands. I just couldn't stop thinking about you. Her heart fluttered, but reality made it stop. But you didn't call or text. He hadn't called or texted her since leaving the island. When he'd left that morning after Jeff's surprise visit, he'd hardly said goodbye. I'm sorry, he said. He pulled something out of his coat pocket and handed it to her. 
a photograph of a baseball team all in the same uniform. The picture quality showed its age. She looked for the familiar face. Is that you? she asked, pointing to the small boy standing next to a tall man with a huge grin on his face. Yup. He leaned over the photo and pointed to the man. That's my dad, and that's... He pointed to a boy standing next to him, with red curly hair and big freckles. That's Danny Cooper. She didn't know why tears sprang to her eyes as she saw Mrs. Cooper's son. But something came over her, and she had to quickly wipe away her tears. He's so handsome, she said, passing back the photograph. He nodded, looking at the picture. That kid standing there? He pointed to himself. I feel like that kid when I'm with you. Like I can take on the world. He looked straight into her eyes. And I haven't felt that way in a really long time. She smiled and looked from the photo to Sean. I feel like I can take on anything with you. I'm thinking of retiring, he said, stepping closer to her. Getting a part-time job, maybe live on an island. Oh? She wondered if he had bought Mrs. Cooper's house. Would she be willing to leave this island now? I heard Don does pretty well renting out his place on the lake, Sean said. Sonia's heart skipped. Did he mean Martha's Vineyard? I know a really great island. He stepped even closer. I heard summer is a great time for deep sea fishing. When he got close enough, Sonia swept her arms around him and kissed him, long and passionately, melting her whole body into his. He wrapped his arms around her back, holding her against him as he kissed her. She laughed as she thought back to her journal lying on the couch. She'd met her first goal. What's so funny? he asked, smiling down at her. I'm just happy you came. She kissed him again, thinking of the number one goal she put in her journal. Choose happiness. Chapter 34 Sonia had encouraged Sean not to rent out the house on the lake. Instead, they had enjoyed going up on the weekends or during a good spell with the weather. But she had convinced Sean there wasn't enough room for everyone to stay at his house and that they needed to rent Don's cabin for the next two weeks. I wish we could rent out Mrs. Cooper's place, Sonia said, thinking of the purple house. Bonnie's niece still hasn't shown up, Sean said. According to John and the new chief, Evan Jacobson. He's coming to the barbecue, right? She asked. John? Sean nodded. He's looking forward to meeting Randy. And Evan, she reminded him, smirking at his instant reaction. Seriously? Do we have to include the new chief? He shook his head. All everyone does is brag about the new awesome chief. Sonia couldn't help but laugh at her fiancé's reaction. You're jealous. Of course I am, he whined. Gail agreed to stay on for another year. He's lovely, Sonia said. She patted him on the chest with her hand. Make sure when you blow up the floats that you check to see if we have enough life vests. She shooed him off to finish with the last minute chores as she finished picking up before everyone arrived. Andrew and Harper had left from Boston over an hour ago. Randy and Lila left the island at noon, which meant they would arrive any minute. Drake and DJ would arrive tomorrow after DJ's science camp. Sonia couldn't wait for everyone to be together. She had fluttered about the house, organizing everything, getting all the food ready for the afternoon. People would be coming in hungry. She had beach toys ready for DJ, including some for the adults. She bought paddle boards and two kayaks. She even rented jet skis for the big kids for two days while they were all here. For a week, the family would stay at the lake. When the family left to go back home, the couples of Cliffside Point would arrive that evening. Biddy and Tommy, Evelyn and Charlie, and Wanda and Marty would all stay at the lake. Two couples would stay at Dawn's and another couple at their place. She had dinners and day adventures planned for the whole time. Sean and her had even decided to buy a used pontoon boat, 
so they could take evening boat rides with everyone. When she saw Lila's car turning around the bend from the bedroom window, she called out to Sean. They're here! Sonia leaned out the window and pointed to the car coming up to the house. Sean smiled and headed for the front yard to meet them. Sonia watched as Lila and Randy pulled in. Lila rolled down her window and waved as she parked. Sean went right up to her and gave her a big hug once she got out, as if they had known each other their whole lives. Sean greeted Randy with the same amount of gusto. The two men patted each other and walked toward the backyard. She saw her father point to the boats tied up on the dock. Sonia's heart expanded, the way it did these days, when she stopped and noticed all the blessings she had in her life. As she went downstairs to meet Lila and her dad, her phone buzzed with a new text message. Marcy, a fellow charity committee chair and DAR member, had messaged Sonia. It popped up on the screen. Heard about the divorce. I couldn't believe it. Call if you need anything. XOXO. Sonia stopped on the steps and stared at the message. She had signed the divorce papers six months ago. Not a word for six months. A record for the tiny island. She opened her screen and deleted the message without replying. She didn't need anything. She had everything she'd ever need right here. She skipped down the rest of the steps and ran out of the house to greet her family. Welcome to Harmony Lake. This has been Lakeside Lighthouse, Romantic Women's Fiction, Cliffside Point, Book Six. Written by Ellen Joy, narrated by Jennifer March. Copyright 2022 by Ellen Joy, author. Production copyright by Ellen Joy, author.